You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 266, Part 2, entitled Esoteric Lessons, 1910 to 1912, by Rudolf Steiner. These are notes written from memory by the participants and, and also meditation verses by Rudolf Steiner, translated by James Hines. Meditation verses used repeatedly in the Esoteric Lessons from 1910 to 1912. These are the verses. Verses directed to the spirit of the day. It has been reported that most lessons began with the invocation of the spirit of the day, yet this is not always recorded in the notes. Meditations for understanding the time nature of the hierarchies. Friday evening for Saturday. Saturn. Great all-encompassing spirit, you who filled infinite space when nothing of my bodily members was yet present, you were. I lift up my soul to you. I was in you. I was a part of your power. You sent forth your powers, and in the first beginnings of the earth my body's original form was mirrored. I myself was in the forces you sent out. You were. The archetype of myself gazed at you. It gazed on me myself. I who was a part of you, you were. Saturday evening for Sunday, Sun. Great all-encompassing spirit, from your life many archetypes came forth. Long ago, when my life forces were not yet present. You were. I lift up my soul to you. I was in you. I was a part of your forces. You united yourself with the earth's very beginning, with the life sun, and gave me the power of life. I myself was in your radiant forces of life. You were. My power of life radiated in your powers of life into space. My body began its becoming within time. You were. Sunday evening for Monday, Moon. Great all-encompassing spirit, in your forms of life shone forth sensation, when my sensation was not yet present. You were. I lift up my soul to you. I was in you. I was a part of your sensations. You united yourself with the earth's beginning, and in my body began the shining forth of my own sensation. In your feelings I felt myself. You were. My feelings felt your being in themselves. My soul began to be within itself because You were in me. You were.
Monday evening for Tuesday, Mars. Great all-encompassing spirit, knowledge lived in your sensations when knowledge was not yet given to me. You were. I lift up my soul to you. I drew into my body In my sensations I lived unto myself. You were in the life sun. In my sensation your being lived as my being. The life of my soul was outside your life. You were. My soul felt its own being within itself. Longing arose in it, longing for you out of whom it came. You were. Tuesday evening for Wednesday, Mercury. Great all-encompassing spirit, in the knowledge of your being is knowledge of the world, which is to come to me. You are. I will unite my soul with you. May the guide who appointed me, the guide who knows, enlighten my path. Feeling your guide, I tread my path of life. Your guide is in the life sun. He lived in my longing. I will take up his being into mine. You are. May my strength take up the strength of my appointed guide into itself. Blissfulness enters me the blissfulness in which the soul finds the spirit. You are. Wednesday evening for Thursday, Jupiter. Great all-encompassing spirit, in your light, life streams to the earth. My life is in your life. You are. My soul works in your soul. I go my way with your appointed guide. I live with him. His being is the forming image of my own being. You are. The being of the guide in my soul finds you, all-encompassing spirit. Bliss is mine from your being's breath. You are. Thursday evening for Friday. Great all-encompassing spirit. In your life I live with the life of the earth. In you I am. You are. I am in you. The guide has brought me to you. I live in you. Your spirit is the forming image of my own being. You are. Spirit has found the all-encompassing spirit. Blissfulness of God moves on to creation of new worlds. You are. I am. You are. Every day after the preceding meditations, 
these words, quote, every day after the preceding meditations, close quote, which were lacking in the original, were given by Murray Steiner for the first printing of Titel Aus den Inhalten der Esoterischen Schule, Volume 3, Dornach 1951. Great all-encompassing spirit, may my eye lift itself from below to above. May it discern you in the all-encompassing. May the spirit of my being be illuminated with the light of your messengers. May the soul of my being be enkindled by the fiery flames of your servers. The will of my eye take hold of the power of your creating word. You are. May your light stream into my spirit. May your life warm my soul. May your being permeate my willing so that I achieve understanding for the shining of your light, for the warmth-filled love of your life, for the creative word of your being. You are... Meditation Quote, In the spirit lay the germ of my body, close quote. The meditative verse with which the esoteric lessons were concluded from a certain point in time onward. In the spirit lay the seed of my body. And the spirit has incorporated into my body the eyes of sense. That through them I may see the light of bodies. And the spirit has imprinted into my body thinking and sensation and feeling and will, that through them I may perceive bodies and act upon them. In the spirit lay the seed of my body. In my body lies the seed of the spirit, and I will incorporate into my spirit suprasensory eyes that, through them, I may behold the light of spirits. And I will imprint into my spirit wisdom and strength and love, so that the spirits may work through me, and I become the self-conscious instrument of their deeds. In my body lies the seed of the spirit, In pure rays of light shines the divinity of the world. In the pure love of all beings raise the godliness of my soul. I rest in the divinity of the world. I will find myself in the divinity of the world. Esoteric lesson given in Kassel on February 6, 1910. Record A is from the collection of Elisabeth Freda. Record B notes from Wilhelm Überschleiden. Record A, Sun, Earth, Meditation Study. Many who enter an esoteric training are very disappointed and say that they had imagined the exercises to be much more energetic and the effects of the exercises to be much more drastic. Those who say this to themselves should consider as soon as possible that they are caught in a great error, and they should make the greatest efforts to correct this error as soon as possible. It is not the exercises that are not energetic enough, but rather the human being. It is not the exercises that are ineffective, but the human being who is not making them effective. By living an esoteric life, the student should become an entirely different person. He or she must add something new to the old. 
In earlier times, people were faced with the choice, esoteric training or death. People had to subject themselves to exercises and trials that, if they were mature enough, led them on the esoteric path. Or they perished in these trials. Physical death occurred. Students said to themselves, If I cannot pass this test, then I am not yet mature enough for an esoteric life. So continued life in a physical body has no value for me. It is better for me to go through physical death in order to prepare myself in Devakan for a new incarnation that can then lead to an esoteric life. Close quote. Trials of this sort are no longer possible today. Our entire constitution is no longer so organized. However, students should arrive at the point where they are indifferent to all physical events. The human being must become an entirely different person. Those who today already want to assert that they have overcome the physical after doing exercises for a short period are succumbing easily to a base illusion. Truly, students must work to overcome themselves. Truthfulness is the first virtue that must be acquired by those who wish to enter upon the esoteric path, truthfulness in the extreme, over and against themselves. Another essential word for those striving esoterically is patience. Consider the sun. Imagine the spirit of the sun, how the spirit causes the sun to rise and set day after day, and has done this already for millions of years and will continue doing this for unimaginably long periods of time to come, to lead the earth to its destiny. We should place ourselves in this patience, and then we will not think that an exercise is ineffective when it has not had an effect after three, four, or five years. The Lord's Prayer This wonderful rendering of the sevenfold lawfulness of the world is a meditation of great significance that any student can undertake daily. I know one of those whom we call the Masters of Wisdom and Harmony of Feelings who says, quote, I take the Lord's Prayer as a meditation only once a month. The rest of the time I attempt to make myself mature and worthy enough to be allowed to immerse myself in even just one of the sentences of this wonderful meditation. Close quote. Thus we must spiritually place ourselves in relation to a meditation. That we want to make ourselves worthy enough to be allowed to use it. Theosophy is not only a theoretical study, but also a living praxis. We must feel the parables in nature. There is something spiritual behind everything physical. If we properly undertake our meditations, if we advance on the esoteric path, then we will soon reach the point where we feel something in us that corresponds to what we see in nature, sprouting and growing in spring and summer, and the melancholy of dying away in autumn. We will experience it in waking in the morning and in falling asleep in the evening. As we fall asleep in the evening, so too the plants in the autumn transition into what is night for them. Only the seeds remain. The capacities that were attained during the life of the summer are contained in them. These capacities awaken again in the spring to new activity, just as our strength and capacities from the previous evening awaken again in the morning. Again and again we must fall asleep and then awaken. Must use our abilities during the day and gather new forces during the night. Behind the physical plants there are lofty spiritual beings who must advance to new activity again and again in the spring. And then in the autumn they are submerged in the night of the plants 
when only the seed of the plant remains. But these beings are so advanced that they need to complete this alternation only once within a year, while the human being must go through this alternation of falling asleep and waking every twenty-four hours. It is simply no longer necessary so often for those lofty beings. Feeling oneself unified with the universal spirit, with the spiritual, must not remain only a mere saying. We must truly feel, experience within ourselves, what lies hidden in the sequence of spring, summer, autumn, what lies hidden in nature's springing to life and dying away. Spiritual life flows into us during meditation. In order to be able to give a proper reception to this spiritual life, we must prepare ourselves in a suitable way. We do this through study. Just as the sun, which sends out its rays and power, would find only an empty space if the earth were not prepared and arranged to receive and use its power, so too our meditations would not find soil to be fruitful. Our meditations would find an empty space if we did not prepare ourselves through study, if we did not make ourselves receptive for the spiritual life that flows into us through meditation. Thus we can see macrocosm and microcosm. Students should give themselves to their meditations with total fervor, with complete devotion and concentration. They should completely and entirely suppress their thoughts of the everyday and open themselves only to lofty spiritual forces. The meditator should think of every meditation as a sacrifice, as sacrificial incense that rises up to the gods. In this way we contribute to progress and harmony, although lower, egotistical, selfish thoughts provide the ground for catastrophes. There is no human way to prevent these catastrophes, such as we have recently had and such as are still to come, from becoming increasingly terrible. One can do whatever one wants. They will still occur. In all that we do, in all our thoughts, we must bear the spiritual in mind, also in our feelings. We have descended from the spiritual. We will again ascend into the spiritual, enriched and perfected. Small quote of the beginning of the meditation at the conclusion. In the spirit lay the germ of my body. In my body lies the seed of the spirit. End of record A. Record B, Sun, Earth, Meditation, Study. If spiritual exercises are not effective, then the cause is never in the exercises, but always in the meditator. Those doing the exercises must immerse themselves in them with fervor and as a result become entirely different persons. In ancient times people were confronted with the choice, success or death. Those who were not mature enough to pass the test could then hope for better success in the next life. That secured them passage through Devakan. Today, however, at least external life must become a matter of indifference to the student. He or she must become a different person. In the first instance, Students must become truthful concerning themselves. Then they must learn patience. Example the patience with which the sun constantly shines on everyone and everything. The Lord's Prayer as Material for Meditation A master said, I take only one petition for meditation once a month. The rest of the time I try to make myself mature and worthy enough to understand this petition. Theosophy is a living praxis. We must experience everything physical as a parable for the spirit, which is its foundation. 
Thus we come to the point of sensing within us an alternation such as from spring to summer and fall, sprouting and growing in nature in the spring and the melancholy dying away in the fall. Just as we fall asleep every evening, so do the plants in the fall. Only the seeds remain, and in them the capacities acquired in the summer. In the spring these horses awaken again, just as ours do every morning. There are lofty spiritual beings that stand behind the physical world. They are so far advanced that they need only once per year to perform this alternation that we go through every day. Preparation for meditation through study in order to make the ground receptive. Meditators should be devoted to the exercise with total concentration. They should set aside all everyday thoughts and open themselves only to the highest spiritual forces. They should understand meditation as a sacrifice. They should see it as the incense of offering, so to speak, which rises up to the gods. Thus we should too, of course, constantly keep the spiritual in mind in our lives and all our actions. In this way we contribute to the harmony of the great whole according to our best forces. We originate in the spirit and we are spirit. This should be expressed in our whole being. Esoteric Lesson Given in Cologne on February 27, 1910 Manuscript from Hulda Schutendietz Doubt, Superstition, Illusions of the Personality We must find our path in life through learning. We should not place ourselves in life with one-sided judgmental views. If we test everything that science, art, and the various world views offer us according to the state of today's science, then we will find on our way three threatening forces, doubt, superstition, and the illusion of personality. Do not avoid them. Do your own research, for we are not allowed to close ourselves off from modern science, neither from its inventions nor from its research. It is even our duty to take notice of science, although we receive an entirely different teaching in our theosophical circles, which is laughed at and derided by modern science. Modern science, for its part, cannot assess our teachings because it knows only matter and its research relates only to material and physical things of existence. However, in order to do justice to science, we should allow doubt concerning what is taught here to arise within us. We should not be afraid to doubt so that we can arrive at inner clarity in ourselves. In this way we struggle through to esoteric teachings out of our own consciousness. And what does it mean to defeat superstition? The fetish that Africans see and worship in an idol, in a piece of wood, we call superstition. However, if they are not thinking of something spiritual that stands behind it, to that extent it is superstition. But we can just as well speak of superstition when we see how modern scholars build their fetishes in their hypotheses of atoms and molecules, which also remain as nothing but hypothetical matter, if one does not admit to the spiritual standing behind it. However, we should not allow this kind of superstition to rise within us. There is still a third thing that joins doubt and superstition, that is the illusion of personality. These three forces, which rise and sink within the human soul, want to rule the human being. If we have struggled through powerful doubt to knowledge of the truth, and through superstition to faith in the spirit that lies behind all matter, then we will also be able to overcome the illusions concerning our personality. However, this is often the most difficult. 
Even if we sometimes think we are inwardly free human beings and believe that we confront the facts of the world and other people without prejudice, nevertheless, this only too often mirrors the illusions of our personality. One more thing must be brought to our attention. Do not carry our teaching into social gatherings of another kind. Speak of our teachings only where you have come together for this purpose. Do not carry them forth to argue with outsiders and speak just as little about them during your meal times, for on such occasions only light conversation should be conducted. It is best if you avoid society where only ordinary gossip of the day is exchanged. However, if you must engage in such gatherings because of your position in life or if you are forced to do so for other reasons, then you should attend them in a spirit entirely different from before, not because you enjoy them, but rather you do this as a duty so that you do not offend anyone because of who you are. I do not say this in order to give a moralizing sermon, because I do not forbid anything at all. However, for this reason, I have to say it to you. Esoteric Lesson, Munich, March 13, 1910 Manuscript from Matilda Scholl In esotericism we must pay attention to something we call the spirit of the day. The creative, divine beings have brought a different spirit to expression in each day. And the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings have given us meditations with which we can approach these spirits on each different day. We want to begin today, Sunday, with the verse that the masters gave for it. Readers aside, and here's the beginning of it. End of readers aside. Great all-encompassing spirit, from your life many archetypes came forth. And that's the end of the sample. Continue the reading. Today we want to discuss how easily an esotericist tends to forget even the simplest introductory exoteric principles of theosophy. Such a principle is, quote, everything perceptible to the senses is maya, is illusion, close quote. Every esotericist should use this as a constant meditation. Most, however, will think to themselves that they already understood this statement long ago but very few consider how little they bring it into their lives, into their feelings, and few consider what they should include under this statement. For example, one might say, quote, Every morning I pray the Lord's Prayer and draw strengthening forces for the whole day from the spiritual contents of this wonderful prayer. Close quote. Now, a master of wisdom said that he prays the Lord's Prayer only once a month while the rest of the time he prepares himself to pray it worthily. Thus one could say that one also wanted to pray it only once in a month, for one must imitate a master. But what would that be? That would be absolute arrogance. That would be an expression of the feeling that we could do the same as a master, that what we can draw from the spiritual content of the Lord's Prayer at his elevated position, is also available to us. We often think that we have already eliminated a trait such as arrogance, but have only shifted it to another corner of our souls. For these traits are also maya. So, too, the concepts we have made here on the physical plane of good and evil, just and unjust, When we spoke in the exoteric lessons of the influences from luciferic beings on the one hand, we formed the point of view that these influences are bad and that we must oppose them. On the other hand, we know that Lucifer brought us freedom. However, we absolutely must not carry our learned concepts of good and evil, just and unjust, over with us into the higher regions in which Lucifer and the good gods are engaged in what is expressed as a battle, indeed as a battle that unfolds for the most part in human souls. 
There is an occult secret that certain human traits developed too quickly during earthly evolution. Lucifer is involved in this. How does this come about? Lucifer comes from the old moon stage of evolution and brings the tempo of the moon to everything that falls under his influence. Since he influences our intellect and our reason, they have been developed far ahead in time. We will go through many incarnations with the most varied experiences, yet our intellect, our reason, will be the same as today. But what is the consequence of this premature development? It is that we cannot bring our intellect into harmony with the wisdom that we find given on the earth. And from this, error after error arises. I can give you a trivial example of this. After the first terrible eruption of Mount Pele, the local scholars calculated that a longer pause would come next. However, More eruptions came, worse than before, and lava and ash buried not only the proclamations of the scholars, but also the scholars themselves. This is an example of how our combinatorial intellect, instead of slowly permeating the wisdom of nature's powers, rushes ahead and thereby finds itself on false paths. Lucifer has his influence in play all over the earth. But we would be in error if we wanted to find an expression of this influence in earthquake catastrophes, in storms, weather, and hail. On the contrary, we are to seek his influence in everything that is blossoming quickly toward ripeness. And this acceleration must be held back, hindered by the good gods. Weather catastrophes are even often the expression of the good gods. They are the hindrances that the good gods must place against Lucifer in order to avoid an evolution that takes place too fast. And indeed, they are hindrances that also correspond to moon evolution in order to compensate for Lucifer's moon temple. What was proper during the moon stage of evolution is now destructive in its effect. And in the same way, the good gods must intervene to impede the development of an esotericist. What, then, is Lucifer's work in our esoteric life? It is his influence that causes us to take the maya of our everyday concepts from material life over into our meditations. However, so that we do not enter the spiritual world unprepared on this erroneous path, the good gods throw hindrances onto our path, hindrances such as all our bad character traits. They are arrogance, vanity, envy, anger, and ill will, which break out when we approach the spiritual world with our earthly attitudes and feelings. And until we have eliminated them ourselves, the spiritual world remains closed to us, because these worlds must be kept pure from everything that is maya. When we reflect on this relationship of the good gods, of Christ, to the Luciferic beings, to Lucifer, then the meditative sentence, quote, everything around us is maya, is illusion, close quote, will appear to us in an entirely different light. We become aware of how often we forget in everyday life the things and characteristics that we think are essential are really only maya. The end of that lesson. Esoteric Lesson, Munich, March 15, 1910. Manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Amelie Fuggerglet. We want to begin today's esoteric lesson with a reading of the prayer to the Spirit of the Day. Exoteric churches direct their prayer to God in general. However, theosophists know that every interval of time has its own regent, and so they turn in humility to the spiritual being who under the name Mars rules over today, Tuesday. Quote, Great 
all-encompassing spirit, knowledge lived in your sensations. Close quote. Continue the reading. Those who enter upon an esoteric training must be clear that they are thereby undertaking something very serious, that they must work on themselves with all seriousness in order one day to be capable of participating in esoteric work. In what way should an esotericist work on himself or herself? We know that the human being's etheric body is born only in the seventh year. Until then, the etheric body surrounds the physical body like a mother sheath. Now, until the fourteenth year, in which the astral body is born, the etheric body should be prepared in the right way for its later development. But all kinds of unfinished and undigested components are attached to it, partially from earlier incarnations, partially from the present one. Everything that lives in us as habit is developed in the etheric body from the seventh to the fourteenth year, and according to how we solidify our views into prejudices, Parenthesis, educators can have a great influence here. Close parenthesis. According to this, a person will be, for example, more or less able to take up theosophy. Those who acquire firmly defined opinions will find theosophy's teachings less accessible than those who remain open to everything new. The etheric body is fully developed between the 7th and 14th year. If children do not take in great role models, if they do not look up in reverence to an authority, then the etheric body during this age, seven to fourteen years, will not be soft and pliable. Such people then have a difficult time finding themselves in life. The etheric body is hardened, and it costs a great deal of effort to dissolve this hardening. The moon forces, luciferic forces, make use of this and flow into it. Not without good reason did Christ say, quote, Watch and pray. Close quote. The astral body then develops from the 14th or 15th until the 21st or 22nd years. The remnants that remain attached to this body are by far not as troublesome to the reception of the teachings of theosophy as the etheric obstacles, because the etheric body is a much denser mass than the astral body. From the 21st year until the 28th year, the self, the human eye, capital, now develops. And the teachings of the masters of wisdom and harmony are so designed to be appropriate for our time that they work primarily on the eye, are taken hold of by the eye. Earlier, This was not the case. Then an esoteric teacher had to work not only on the eye, but also on the astral body. However, with the constitution of humanity today, with its much more individual inclinations, this would not be possible. If a teacher tried to intervene in an astral body today by attempting to direct the passions, drives, and desires, this would immediately call forth a revolution in these astral regions. For the human self, the I should be developed only in freedom in human beings of the present time. What people acquire in the I as knowledge through the teachings of theosophy, they must apply to ennoble their older but less lofty bodies. Why can human beings understand all the teachings of theosophy through their thinking, through the I? We received the physical body on old Saturn. On old Sun, the etheric body was newly added. Then the physical body was in the Sun state. The etheric body, however, was in the Saturn state, that is, the first state. On the old Moon, the newly added astral body was in the Saturn condition, the etheric body in the Sun condition, and only the physical body was in the Moon condition. On Earth, The physical body is in the earth state. The newly added youngest part, the I, however, is in the Saturn state. For this reason, the I understands everything 
that has happened since old Saturn times, for it is Saturn within us. End of lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Hamburg, May 16, 1910. Record A, manuscript from Matilda Scholl. Record B, notes from Günther Wagner. Record A. Among theosophists, one often hears that an esoteric development is associated with dangers. In response to this, it must be stressed that one should not let oneself be held back from treading the esoteric path because of a feeling of fear. Those who get instruction from a mystery school that has a right to exist and who properly follow these instructions will develop themselves in the right way. The main thing is to awaken the proper seriousness within and to entirely permeate oneself with the knowledge one learns in the esoteric lessons. It is always good for esotericists to say to themselves that they still have a long path ahead of them. One can already long ago have grasped something with the intellect and still not guide one's life according to that knowledge by a long way. An example for this is found in the statement that should be well known to all theosophists. Quote, everything that surrounds us is maya. Close quote. There are people for whom this principle is very obvious, who, however, never apply it to their lives, who allow pain and joy to affect them without saying, quote, if everything is maya, then the cause of my pain is also maya, close quote. But it is good that this is the case, for if people were to take this principle to heart, into their feelings too soon, then perhaps they could not withstand the shock that they would thereby experience when they apply it to their pain. This requires great strength that must be slowly developed before applying it to the great events of life. Indeed, we develop strength by practice in applying the truth of this principle to the small, everyday occurrences that surround us in life. We know that everything that surrounds us shows itself to us in a way other than it really is. Let us take, for example, a red object. By what means do we see the red color? By means of the light that falls upon it. If the object is in darkness, then we do not see it as red. But when light shines upon it, the red color arises through the fact that the object absorbs all the other colors called forth by the light. Only the red color is reflected back, which the object cannot use, does not want, or like. It shows us precisely what, in its essence, it is not. Can human beings manage to penetrate into this inner aspect? Can they come to know the true essence of things? They can do this only through meditative means. If we remain at visual perception, at the mental picture, then we also remain caught in maya. But we usually do something else. When we meet a color, say red, it then exerts an effect on our sensations, our feelings. We have a feeling of refreshment when we are looking at the color red. A blue that is lightly mixed with violet will convey to us a mood of devoted reverence. We have these sensations within us, and we have them with respect to the feeling of the true. The objects that cause these feelings may be maya, may come into being and pass away, but the feelings themselves remain the same. We could go for a walk in the woods, hear a rustling, and be startled and scared by it because we imagine it to be caused by a snake, when actually a gust of air was the cause. Farther on, we might again hear a rustling, but this time it actually comes from a snake. Each time our fear is the same. It is true even though the cause was an illusion the first time. But how do we manage to get behind to the true essence of things through our feelings? 
when we see the plants in the springtime sprouting, shooting forth and blossom, how are we to recognize the truth behind what they extend to us as maya? There is a moment in the life of plants when they show us something of their inner essence, and this moment occurs when they begin to die away. When does this moment occur? At fertilization. Until then, the plant has expended all its energy to reject what it does not want. Now it has received something from outside, and its life is turned around, so to speak. It loses the power of defense and withdraws back into itself. The energy that it had applied outward, it now turns inward. Can we awaken a feeling in ourselves that is like this process in the soul life of the plant? When do we want to withdraw and turn within ourselves? When do we lose the power to defend ourselves toward the outside world? With the feeling of shame. When we awaken this feeling in us without its being occasioned by an external event, and also observe a fertilized plant. Then we become aware that exactly the same feeling lives in the plant, that it lives in the plant so intensely that it causes the plant's death. In the autumn, a feeling of enormous shame goes through the plant world. The red rose is a special example of this. What color would we then choose for the feeling of dying away? of drawing back from the outside world and turning toward the spirit. Black. And therefore we have the black cross, upon which red roses are blossoming, black carbonized wood, in which everything external has died, is for us an expression of the fact that the spirit is revealed behind all death and dying. Goethe once spoke of the color that the earth will have when it is dying away at the end of the present cycle and is passing over into a spiritual kingdom fructified by the spirit. It will have to, quote, glow in flaming red, close quote. And this statement originates in a deep knowledge. For how could the earth otherwise glow but with deep shame when it is ripe to be fertilized by the spirit? If in this way we awaken within ourselves feelings that are caused by external things, then we will come closer to the truth behind external things. But we can also awaken pictures and feelings within ourselves without any external reason whatsoever. We can produce mental pictures and feelings all alone within us. Then we are together with the world within us that was not called forth, by any external cause, and thus we can find our way to absolute truth. This should happen in our meditation. When we look at the sun and meditate on its enlivening influence, we always have an external reason for the meditation. However, when we ourselves awaken a mental picture of light using the words, in pure rays of light, and so forth, and then imagine that it is the garment of God. Then we have created something that is not bound to some external object. And when we awaken the feeling of love for all beings in the next lines, then we are permeating ourselves with this feeling, and it will become a powerful germinating force within us. The end of record A. Record B. well-known general principle, everything is maya, illusion. But it is very difficult to arrange one's life according to the meaning of this principle only. And this is good. A soul would not be able to bear a sudden change. Let us consider a red plant. The red that it appears to us is only an illusion. It would not appear that way in the dark. It is only the effect of sunlight. Indeed, the plant does not show us its true inner being. It rays back to us not the colors that it absorbed, its actual characteristics, 
but what it does not want. Thus its color is indeed maya. However, a time does come when the plant shows something of its inner being, the time of bearing fruit, when it begins to weaken. Then it has only the power to work on itself, and no longer the power to hide its inner nature. The feeling that then holds sway in it is shame. This is something real. At the edge of the forest a rustling is heard. We believe that it is a snake and are alarmed, but it was only the wind. At the other end of the same forest there really is a snake. What is real in both instances is the feeling of fear. We should learn to feel with the plant, which shows the feeling of shame when fading and dying. Then we will gradually learn the laws that stand behind the plant and see that all color is only maya, illusion. Goethe was right when he asked, quote, On the day of the last judgment, when our earth will change its form of appearance, in what color will it radiate? Close quote. And he answered, quote, In fiery red. Close quote. It is a feeling of shame, because it is beginning to pass away. The end of record B and the end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson, Hamburg, May 19, 1910. Record A, manuscript from Matilda Scholl. Record B, notes from the collection of Elizabeth Freda. Record A. Before we begin today's esoteric lesson, I want to direct a prayer to the spirit of Thursday. Esotericists should increasingly acquire a truer, higher modesty that leads them to turn not to the highest divinity, but to consider that between this divinity, which we cannot even imagine with our highest human intellect, and all of us, the great hierarchies are present. Beginning quote, Great all-encompassing spirit, in your light life streams to the earth. Close that. Steiner again. Today I again want to illuminate our meditations from another side. Esotericists, through their meditations, want to approach the Spirit of Christ more intensely. They want to try to connect with Him more intimately than they could through exoteric Christianity. The Christ principle's entry into our earth evolution was so decisive, even for external history, that we calculate our timeline according to it. At the time when Zoroaster beheld in the sun the approaching form of the spirit of the sun, he gathered disciples around him in order to make them into servants of the great Ahura Mazda. And he prepared himself more and more to take this spirit of the sun into himself. When the earth with all its beings, looks up to the sun, then it must say that it cannot do what the sun can do, send forth light. The earth would be a dark, black body if the light of the sun did not permeate it, and if the earth could not reflect back this light. Now, since Christ became the planetary spirit for the earth, through the event on Golgotha, he is in the forces that cause the green covering of the earth to shoot forth. The masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings give us the great truths and symbols, and here above all it is the rose cross, which mirrored in us, can awaken and strengthen the power of Christ in us. In the last esoteric lesson, we saw that the red rose brings the feeling of shame to expression in the color red. Now we know that all colors stimulate their complementary color within us. Thus red calls forth green. Parenthesis, compare entitled The Education of the Child. Close parenthesis. Thus the sight of the black cross awakens the white, radiant sunlight of the Christ in us. And through the red roses, the power is stimulated that allows green life to shoot forth from the red roses. 
When we imagine the rose cross with this feeling and let it live in us in this way, we participate in part of the power of our earth, our earth spirit, the Christ. As esotericists, we must constantly be trying to bring good thoughts to the things that appear to us as maya. We must be permeated by the feeling that in everything there sleeps a spark of this power, which will one day break forth in order to ray out over all that is evil. We should also bear within us complete trust that all that is good on the earth, all that is positive, will and must emerge victorious. The end of Record A. Record B. It is impossible for human beings to approach God directly, and therefore it is better to try to approach the spirit of the day by reverently calling upon this spirit with appropriate expressions. The parenthesis, the spirit of Jupiter is called upon. Close parenthesis. The loftiest of all symbols is the cross. We can draw from it the entire history of the world, and even natural science could be constructed out of it. If we observe how colors have complementary colors, which are well noted by natural science, then we will also understand that the particular colors that are used for the rose cross exert a specific effect that we can experience in our soul as the complementary colors. It was already pointed out in the small pamphlet titled The Education of the Child how the color red has a calming effect within the soul. One would, at the same time, be able to see that the soul is immersed in green. It produces the complementary color. In the observation of the black cross with red roses, the black, which otherwise is darkness for us, becomes as white light. Thus one can understand that when meditating the black cross, light arises in our souls that can bring us to enlightenment. The red of the roses produces green as its reflection in the soul and brings us to a very lofty feeling when we imagine the effects of Christ's power. Zarathustra, or Zoroaster, saw how Christ, who for him was still connected to the sun, was to stream down to the earth. And as that happened, the earth was fructified, filled with the Spirit of Christ. And this Spirit then became the Spirit of the earth. The earth, which until then had been dark, was inwardly filled with light. And the effects of this light showed itself in the green that covered the earth. The living, sprouting green is the effect of the Christ Spirit in the earth. The earth is thereby permeated, so to speak, and it is literally true that we walk on the earth on the body of Christ, and the green is his etheric body. Through the meditation of the rose cross we become illuminated within, and the effect of green will awaken in our souls the power of Christ, which also awakened in the earth by this same power. And when this power works in us, we will feel the greatest trust growing in us, that pure love must overcome all evil, and that truth can be found. That is contained for us in the words, beginning of, quote, in pure rays of light, end of record B, and end of that lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Hamburg, May 25th, 1910. Record A, Notes from the Collection of Elizabeth Freda. Record B, Manuscript from Matilda Scholl. Record C, Manuscript from Alice Kinkle. Record A, there's the beginning here of the quote, Great all-encompassing spirit, in the knowledge of your being is knowledge of the world. Close quote. The last time we saw how the symbols that are given to us in our meditations can and should work upon us. Now today, in order to enclose these three esoteric lessons in a circle, I want to speak about the erroneous paths 
upon which we can find ourselves as esotericists. In ordinary exoteric life, we have all kinds of terms for characteristic traits that we know as good or evil. These terms are often inadequate and one-sided for an esotericist, for every character trait has two sides, a good one and a bad one. And maintaining the proper balance must be one of an esotericist's chief tasks. Altogether, esotericists must constantly guard themselves, be on the watch. Human traits are such that when they remain in proper proportions, human beings can control them very well with their eye capital. However, if we allow one of them to become too intensive, then the eye can fall under the power of that trait. This is not so dangerous for people who are living only exoterically, as the spirit of the everyday will bring them back into balance. But it is different for esotericists. A character trait that acquires dominion over them can lead them into all kinds of dangers. Above all, something like this can come to expression already in their present life as an illness of the physical body. I would like to clarify this with an example. Who among us does not know irritation and a bad mood? All of us have certainly already been subject to them. But esotericists must now attempt to fight against them with the ordinary self or I. If they allow a bad mood to master them, something very specific happens they fall prey to the false spirits of heaviness. There really is a spirit or spirits of heaviness. In itself, the spirit of heaviness belongs to the primal powers, parenthesis, spirits of personality or archai, close parenthesis, and is the one who in the morning brings us back to our physical bodies when we awaken. That belongs to the field of work of the spirit of heaviness and it is good and proper for us. Now among these spirits are those who go beyond their field of work and want to work in the realm of the spirits of form. These are the ones that overcome the etheric body of an esotericist who surrenders to irritation or a bad mood. They then change the etheric body so that the esotericist falls victim to hypochondria. In the physical realm, this is then expressed in illness of the digestive tract. This can also be said in exoteric lectures. We must remember that in our esoteric lessons, we are receiving direct messages from the Master, who intends these messages especially for esotericism. Another character trait that an esotericist should constantly be on the watch for should constantly be observant for, so that he or she does not succumb to it, is vanity and arrogance. We are often not aware how far we have already succumbed to it and therefore must give this special attention. How many imagine that they would like to help others because they, quote, love humanity, close quote. However, When one tells them that they can achieve this helpfulness only through unceasing assiduous study, one notices that they really don't want to do this. They would like to take matters in hand and act immediately without considering how much damage they could do with false help. This is, however, a very dangerous vanity, and all those do-gooders and confused dreamers have succumbed to it. They preach their worldview, for which they think they have a mission, with beautiful words and unclear sayings. Now, what happens if esotericists do not suppress this vanity? They succumb to the spirit of light. And indeed, again, not the normal good spirits that are recruited from the host of the spirits of wisdom, but rather the kind that work into the realm of the spirits of movement. The good spirits of light have the task of leading people into the spiritual world at night when they fall asleep. 
They are to direct the entrance of human beings into the spiritual world so that, although unconscious, they arrive there. If esotericists want to accelerate their development and in so doing do not learn what they of necessity must know about the spiritual world, the other spirits of light overpower them and influence the etheric body in such a way that the head is affected in the physical realm. Confusion, fanaticism, and finally worst of all, insanity ensue. Those who succumb to the spirit of heaviness injure only themselves, and we should try to help such people with all means possible, for we should love not only all of humanity, but every individual human being. However, those who succumb to the spirits of light can injure humanity, not only themselves, with their confused fanaticism. For this reason, we should question ourselves again and again, asking whether the reasons we want to develop ourselves are really selfless. We should never tire of learning, for the more we learn, the more self-evident will our humility become. We need have no fear if we feel the spirit of darkness in the following way. When, awakening in the morning, we feel exhausted and our limbs feel so heavy that we can hardly move them, this is a passing stage and is a sign that we have skipped over the false stage of hypochondria. And those who at certain times have the feeling that they can hardly hold themselves with their feet on the earth, that they must hover, They do not have to be worried either, for they have skipped over the stage of fanaticism, and this symptom is developmentally normal. The human soul is kept in balance by the spirit of heaviness and the spirit of light, and an esotericist should always be concerned not to disturb this balance. Instruction concerning this balance is given to us from the Masters of Wisdom, in the prayer that we speak at the conclusion of this lesson, a prayer that contains all the wisdom of the world that will be revealed to us more and more. Beginning of the quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body. Close quote. End of record A. Record B. First, the spirit of the day is invoked. Mercury. There are symptoms that appear in the esoteric life which have great significance for an esotericist. After the preceding lessons have had their effect on us, it is necessary still to receive these last in order to connect them to a whole. In ordinary external life, the world itself corrects the mistakes we have brought with us through our inborn constitution. But in an esoteric life, our character traits and predispositions have an entirely different significance. Indeed, this goes so far that the word that characterizes a certain trait no longer even expresses what is characteristic of this trait. We have been told that arrogance, vanity, and pride are dangerous. However, if we wanted to entirely eliminate these traits from ourselves with our striving for balance, then we would lose our feeling for self the I capital would dissolve away and we would become human beings without content. On the other hand, the character trait that could be called love works in a way just as dangerous. People who are always inclined to give only love and believe that they must help everyone fall into the other extreme. There is danger that they are always concerned about themselves and become wrapped up in their own I. Capital. When characteristic traits appear, there are always two forces in play that work against one another. If there were only love as the greatest thing in the world, then nothing at all would exist. An opposing force must always hold the balance. Thus today we will point out those forces or beings that work in us and call forth those peculiar states in us that every esotericist knows. The first state is that of a bad mood, 
an irritation in the soul that rises apparently without any reason, which can find a reason in every petty problem and can deteriorate into such vehemence that the entire nature of a person can appear changed. In this case, we are dealing with beings belonging to the hierarchy of primal powers, archai, which are beneficial beings when they remain in their own realm. But when they step out of their own realm into that of the spirits of form, their work is destructive. They are called spirits of heaviness and they help us to come down to the earth in the morning when we awaken. This often gives us a feeling of heaviness, of lethargy upon awakening. But when we add a bad mood to this, then these spirits work upon us in a disadvantageous way and make everything heavy and dark for us. They then influence the physical body and fill it with darkness so that one is as if tied to the earth. If the eye does not oppose this and does not suspect the dangers that threaten, then these spirits rule over the eye. The human being becomes powerless and succumbs to hypochondria. Everyone knows how hard it is to heal hypochondria. This illness always points to an effect of an earlier incarnation as an esotericist, for it cannot arise in one incarnation. When the spirits of heaviness have thus overcome us, this shows itself in illnesses of the lower body and the organs of digestion. Now, we must also make the acquaintance of the spirits of light, which are also beneficial when they remain in their own realm. However, when they step outside their realm and move themselves into the realm of the spirits of movement, they bring trouble to human beings. This is the case, for example, when people imagine they must help humanity, but actually they have the desire to ascend higher without any effort and they want to lose themselves in love. Then these spirits of light penetrate into these people and bring them to fanaticism, so that all their ideas are transformed into something untrue. Such people think that they are forces for the good and that they should improve the world. When people succumb to the power of these spirits, then the eye is so filled with itself that it can no longer see the things outside of itself in proper perspective. Finally, such people succumb to a state where the body is influenced and, indeed, the brain is destroyed. However, if they react against these forces and attempt to understand that it is all only fantasy that they believe they can help others, and so forth, and rather they attempt to redirect their forces away from this occupation with love, suppress within every desire for progress, and trust that the proper maturity will appear at the proper time, then these spirits work as beneficial powers, step by step, bringing them closer to the light. These are the spirits that help us at night when we fall asleep, that bring us to the light. Thus we must constantly be on the lookout for these two forces, and when they show themselves in our feelings, we should immediately be alert and direct our attention inward toward ourselves. If we have a bad mood, if we are irritated and have always wakefully battled it, then the moment will come when we feel that our body is done in, that it pains us even into the marrow. This will be proof that we are victors, and if we are inclined to fanaticism, as is here described, and we have courageously fought against it, then a feeling will come over us as though we no longer had any legs to stand on, as if the body were too light for the ground to hold it firmly. This is proof that we have won our battle with the spirits of light. These are the consequences of exercises that have been properly carried out and they should encourage us to go forward bravely rather than becoming fearful and in a bad mood. When we gradually learn to understand how we are always surrounded on all sides by forces that influence us, 
Then we learn to live through our days with full self-consciousness and establish a balance between all these influences working on us. Thus we also better understand the concluding words of our discussion, whose first half presented the spirit of heaviness. I'm going to try the German. Im Geiste lag der Keim meines Leibes. Translation, in the spirit lay the seed of my body. And in second half, the spirit of light. In meinen Leibe liegt des Geistes Keim. In my body lies the seed of the spirit. The end of record B. Record C. The fivefold spirit and where it works and how he expresses himself. Number one, the spirit of truth. Number two, the spirit of devotion. Number three, the spirit of good of a good attitude. Number four, the spirit of heaviness. Number five, the spirit of light. The kingdom of the primal powers is the kingdom of the spirit of heaviness. The primal powers, or the spirits of personality, work in the physical body. They are properly what hold the human being on the earth. The work of the spirit of heaviness, when they are working as do the spirits of form, that is, in the eye, is improper. If the spirit of heaviness works there, then it happens that irritation, bad moods, hysteria, and hypochondria appear. The heaviness of the body is good. The spirits of wisdom work properly as spirits of light in the etheric body. They produce healthy judgment. It is wrong when they work as spirits of movement. Then their work is revealed as confusion, fanaticism, as improper working even into the physical body. The Rose Cross Let us imagine a plant, the cross, and a red rose. It is the blush of a plant. In this case, we need to imagine the cross as white and the rose as green, that is, in its complementary color. The end of that lesson. Esoteric Lesson, given in Christiania, Oslo, June 16, 1910. Record A, Manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Barbara Wolfe. Record B, Notes from the Collection of Elizabeth Freda. Record A. Exoterically regarded, theosophy is knowledge. What we learn in exoteric lectures, as esotericists we should take into our thinking, feeling, and willing, so that we can then let it flow out into our exoteric lives. This is esoteric work. And what happens through this work? How can we carry a simple theosophical truth directly into life? For example, there is the truth concerning falling asleep and waking up. That is, the truth that the physical and etheric bodies remain behind while the eye and the astral body go into the spiritual world. In ancient times, human beings received prayers to say in the evening before falling asleep and in the morning after waking. That was good because they strengthened their souls with spiritual forces by preparing themselves before entering the spiritual realm. And after they had left the spiritual world, they permeated their souls once again with higher forces. They extracted soul forces out of the spiritual world, so to speak. The three kingdoms below the human being, the mineral plant and animal kingdoms, are permeated by spiritual forces that are constantly renewed. So, too, the four elements, fire, water, air, and earth. It is different with human beings. If they do not put themselves in touch with these spiritual forces, then they do not receive them. When they fall asleep without having prepared themselves, they do not receive an influx of spiritual forces in the spiritual world that they enter. Materialistic people no matter how well educated, how scientific or prominent, when they enter the spiritual world unprepared, they stand far below the simplest primitive people, who, through their prayer, are already in touch with forces in the spiritual world. In our materialistic age, 
whose scientific accomplishments are so boundlessly amazing. Human beings have more and more forgotten how to pray. They fall asleep and awaken with their everyday thoughts. But what are they doing in this way? For something is happening through this omission. Every time they kill something of their spiritual life, of their spiritual forces on the physical plane. Human beings are unconscious when they go into the spiritual world. If, for example, a man were to fall asleep around 11 o'clock and wake up unprepared at 12 in the spiritual world, he would not recognize where he was. He would have the feeling that he was spread out over infinite space and had lost his center. Such a person would be in ecstasy, quote, out of himself, close quote, in the actual meaning of the word. This ecstasy was artificially induced in the Druid mysteries in ancient times in order to cause the pupils to experience higher worlds consciously. However, so that the pupil did not lose himself, so that his I capital was not lost, twelve helpers had to stand at his side. These helpers poured the entire power of their pure eyes into him at the moment when the ecstasy began. That much power was necessary in order to prevent this dissolution of self. This druid initiation was the external path expanding into the cosmos, while the inner path was followed in the old Egyptian mysteries. There, those to be initiated had to seek a path through the lower astral world during three and a half days. That means that they had to climb into their own inner being. Twelve pure priests had to accompany the pupils so that they were not taken hold of and overcome by all the lower drives, desires, and passions that slumbered deep in their being, what otherwise only in the course of their incarnations would slowly be worked through in ordinary evolution. Unknown vices would have been awakened in them if the twelve priests had not protected them with their purity. Today neither of these paths mentioned would be possible, because modern human beings would rebel against such an intervention into the I, the self, and they would object to the patronizing treatment of their drives, desires, and passions. The Rosicrucian school combines both parts, and at the same time allows human beings complete freedom. They themselves must, through the meditations given to them, acquire the power that was given to them earlier by helpers. Through this work on themselves, esotericists increase the spiritual forces that humanity needs. They battle against the desolation that will appear as a result of the terrible materialism because people have simply forgotten their connection with the spiritual world forgotten how they can obtain forces from those worlds. When the time comes when human souls are becoming increasingly desolate and empty, then it will be the task of esotericists to let their spiritual forces work in a lively way. Under all blows of destiny, they will be able to maintain a cheerful balance in their souls and thereby cause happiness to flow to the rest of humanity and thereby relieve its soul pain. This soul pain will be felt by people as agony, as a consequence of the achievements of materialistic science. Today many ways have been found to anesthetize physical pain, to make it disappear, but in reality the pain has not disappeared. We are also taught in exoteric science that no force disappears, and so the power of pain does not go away either, but rather expresses itself in other ways. The pain returns again in later incarnations as soul agony. Thus the human being will have to go through intense psychological pain, and esotericists will then use spiritual forces that they bring down from the heights in order to relieve this agony. Every one of us has made a decision, even if unconsciously, when we entered upon the path of esotericism, a decision to intervene 
in a helping way in the suffering of humanity. The End of Record A Record B In earlier, less materialistic times, prayer was a customary activity before falling asleep and upon awakening. Humanity little suspects the injury it is causing itself by entirely laying aside this habit. Through prayer, people obtained strength from the spiritual world for daily life when they awakened. In the evening, they took the strength that they had gathered in their daily lives with them into the spiritual world. Thus our exercises today are also intended so that our strength for the spirit may grow more quickly and so that we learn to employ it consciously. It's the end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Christiania, Oslo, June 18, 1910. Record A, manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Barbara Wolf. Record B, notes from the collection of Elizabeth Freda. Record A. In the ancient Egyptian mystery schools, those beings prepared for initiation, intended that that incarnation was to be dedicated entirely to initiation, for it was a life or death procedure. They had to undergo trials that placed great demands on their courage. For example, they were shown things that could so stir up their fear that they fell over dead. If they lived through these trials, then they had arrived on the other shore and were newborn. They had descended to the God in their inner being. They had encountered the drives, desires, and passions in their own bodies and had victoriously withstood the encounter. They could now say to themselves, Ex Deo Nasimur. Now, one could ask about the evil that was encountered on the path to the inner God. Does that also come from the gods? Here, we must always say that it was originally something divine, that only we human beings made it into something evil. The path of ecstasy was followed in the Druid mysteries. Those beings initiated united themselves with the spirit that held sway everywhere in nature, per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. In the Rosicrucian path, the two paths are united that is, from each was taken what is beneficial for us. The modern human being can no longer be initiated unconsciously. Since the advent of the Christ principle, the human being must be present with his or her waking consciousness. The meditations given to us by the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings are all directed toward the Christ, even though his name might not appear in them. The words beginning of, quote, in pure rays of light, close quote, are so arranged that if one makes oneself deaf and blind toward the closest environment, one slowly lifts one's etheric body out of the physical. And in this way one is united with Christ's etheric aura, which is now the aura of our earth. If we were to lift ourselves out of our bodies without the content of our meditations, then the soul would be alone with itself. Now, however, it is permeated by Christ and experiences what Paul said, quote, Now it is not I who live, but Christ in me. Close quote. And, quote again, In pure love to all beings. Quote, in pure love to all beings. Close quote. With these words we are reminded that everything soul-like is woven out of love. This meditation is a slow dying of the lower I, the lower self. And in this dying and coming to life again in Christ, we have the connection between the two paths, in Christo Morimo. It is a conscious expansion and living into the Christ Spirit. For this reason we also have added the word sanctum to the words perspiritum. End of record A. Record B. One of the greatest advantages achieved by esotericists is when they faithfully apply what the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings have compiled in corresponding pictures or principles. 
There followed as explanation of the meditation, quote, in pure rays of light, close quote. It was described how one is gradually made free of the body and thus goes into the spiritual world. In the second part of the meditation, esotericists at the same time penetrate into their own inner souls. That which had to be experienced separately in the past should now take place simultaneously, since humanity is now further advanced. These meditations are based on that. When one has become so strong that one feels oneself transported into a spiritual world outside of one's body, then the next step is that one begins to perceive something in that world. However, since at the same time one is also penetrating into one's inner being, one also experiences the dangers of illusion all the more. At that moment we are in the grip of the forces of temptation, and we imagine pictures that we then take for realities. But precisely the most beautiful, the noblest visions, are the deepest illusions. Only a long time after we have achieved the power to rise into the spiritual world is it possible for us to distinguish reality from illusion. Only the deepest seriousness with which we acquire theosophy makes this discernment possible. If we always carry in our souls, in our wakeful consciousness, the concepts given to us by theosophy, then we create the reality for the spiritual world. And if we achieve this, we will be able to recognize what we see. In the beginning we should defend ourselves against the visions, not allow them, and not, as usually happens, spin them out further and apply our fantasy to them. The moment will certainly come if we wait in the proper frame of mind when we will know whether we are dealing with something real or not. That is the end of that esoteric lection and the end of this first section of the book, which goes up to page 43. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 266, Volume 2 of Steiner's Esoteric Lessons. These are from 1910 to 1912, and this is Part 2 of the reading. Uh, It begins on page 43 of the book, translated by James Hines. Esoteric Lesson from Christiania Oslo, June 20th, 1910. Record A is a manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Barbara Wolf. Record B notes from the collection of Elizabeth Freda. Record A. Prayer to the Spirit of Monday, beginning, quote, Great All-Encompassing Spirit, in your forms of life shown forth sensation, close quote, To support us in our meditations, there are helping thoughts that are given in all esoteric schools whose existence is justified. When you place these thoughts before you in the form of pictures and let them work on you, when you immerse yourself in them, then they are of unlimited value. It is not the same with these thoughts as it is with our ordinary everyday thoughts. Rather, When we occupy ourselves with these, they have germinating, awakening powers for us. One such thought is the following. Just as we know our consciousness as both a waking and sleeping consciousness, so too we are imagining the consciousness of the surrounding spirits of the earth that work on us when we say the spirits of the earth sleep in the mineral kingdom. The plants are the waking thoughts and life of the spirits of the earth, and the animals are their dreams. If we immerse ourselves in these thoughts and think about, for example, what our thoughts actually are, parenthesis, misty forms flitting about like whispers, close parenthesis, 
And if we compare these, our thoughts, with those of the spirits of the earth, then we can feel the incredible distance between them. The thoughts of the spirits of the earth sprout forth from the earth as a carpet of green in endless variety. Their thoughts are thus creative forces in the physical world. These spirits once went through a human stage like ours in the past evolution of the earth. Back then they thought the same way we think now. They developed themselves higher and higher and became creating beings. We can see in them what we should strive for. We must always bear in mind that we are becoming different from other people. Our interests are changed, and one can often hear esotericists complain that they feel their interest in many things disappearing, things that they were interested in before, and that an inner desolation and emptiness overcomes them. However, this is an entirely normal state that quickly passes, and the emptiness of their souls will soon be filled with interests that will replace the others a hundred, yes, a thousandfold. Nevertheless, we should not give up our connection to other people, nor our interests that previously filled us. Above all, we should not expect of other people that they change their circle of interests. The difference between exoteric and esoteric individuals is this, that the exoteric people have their physical bodies firmly permeated by the other bodies. Everything pushes forward toward the outer surface, so to speak. Ordinary people who are born into an ethnic group, into a family, thereby inherit certain concepts about good and evil, about honesty and other virtues, that the creating gods, in the course of evolution, placed in them. Esotericists will gradually live out of their own knowledge according to these virtues. But concerning these things, they are not allowed to place themselves beyond the concepts that live in the people, for they could slip into serious danger with respect to their development. In esotericists, the inner person is gradually separated from the external person. Their higher parts abandon their lower. And if they do not attend to the usual laws of humanity, concerning truthfulness, for example, they can slip into deceitfulness, which is naturally a hindrance for them in their development and can cause a great deal of damage. The strife and conflict among esotericists can be traced back to this. We leave behind not only part of our etheric body and our sentient soul, parenthesis, we begin our esoteric work in the sentient soul, close parenthesis, but also the physical body, and we experience all kinds of states in it, illness too. We are now afflicted by states we have never no known before. However, we need not consider them illness and run immediately to a doctor. For, of course, an exoteric doctor naturally cannot give us anything for these conditions, and they will go away by themselves anyway. On the other hand, we should not think that every sickness that befalls us is caused by esoteric development, and that there is no doctor who can treat us. That is spiritual arrogance. One can continue for a long time to seek advice from a doctor for one's illnesses. Esotericists should always pay attention to their health in the right way. One should not allow oneself to be prevented from developing spiritually because of laziness or cowardice or because of the difficulties that one encounters or through a loosening of the etheric body. This loosening is something that must occur if one wishes to penetrate into spiritual worlds. And if we struggle for this with earnest striving, then the master of wisdom and harmony of feelings will come to meet us with his strength and his help will never fail. If not in this life, then with absolute certainty we will achieve the goal of spiritual sight 
in the next lifetime. The end of record A. Record B, bracket, the basis for this formulation is that in the copy of these notes there is a text preceding which contains word for word the discussion of June 18, 1910. Record B, close bracket. There are other aids that can lead one relatively quickly to a deeper insight into spiritual connections. They are the following three sentences. In the mineral kingdom, the gods sleep. In the plant kingdom, they dream. In the animal kingdom, they awaken and think. Taking first the animal kingdom, we must imagine that the spiritual beings in earlier times stood on our level and had confused thoughts at that time as we do now. Meanwhile, they have advanced so far that their thoughts have become so regular and definite that they are able to spread out before us what we see as the world of animals. When we immerse ourselves in such thoughts, then the course taken by our developing thoughts will be strengthened and we will thereby come into a closer connection to the beings that have placed their thoughts into the earth, to those beings also that placed into the earth the force which in its wholeness is the power of Christ. As esotericists, we experience great inner transformations which in general are directed toward making the self an I, capital, free from the body, until we finally perceive our I as a higher or second I within us. In comparison to exotericists, we develop as esotericists entirely different feelings and sensations in the astral body. Moral and ethical impulses now come from within although earlier they came from specific established norms prescribed by religion or human laws according to which we lived. Through this new way of experiencing, the connection between the eye and the ordinary astral body is loosened and the feelings thereby become more independent, emerging more from within. This can have the consequence that people appear at first less moral than the ordinary average person while they are actually busy working their way out of conventional feelings and sensations. The etheric body is also gradually loosened. Habits, prejudices, relationships are transformed, are set against what is forced upon us from outside by the spirit of our time and generally accepted ideas. What was accepted earlier as true now appears deceitful to us, out of proportion, and one easily comes into conflict with the outer world. In this transition time it often happens that we ourselves become less truthful, that we can only see conditions as all wrong, and so forth. Major changes also take place in the physical body. This could be called the loosening of the body, through which a feeling of illness can appear in all possible parts of the body, We then believe that our body is becoming sickly or more frail, and during this transition time it may also really appear so. But we will soon notice that we cannot cure these illnesses with medications as was previously possible. The dangers of a loosening of the bodies lie in the disdain we can acquire for human beings and the conditions of the world which would only lead us deeper into delusions. What we should do is apply a kind of averaging measure of ongoing inner reverence and awe as we behold what human beings have accomplished precisely through the help of spiritual beings working from outside, as we understand the majesty of those spiritual effects on human beings who are not yet inwardly awake. Thus we can recognize the higher path of self-consciousness. And when we place ourselves between extremes, we can be a help to human beings who are still less conscious. End of record B and the end of that lesson. Esoteric Lesson, Munich, August 24, 1910. 
Record from the collection of Elizabeth Freda. This lesson is merely preparatory for the lesson that will follow next Friday. Lesson begins with invocation of the Spirit of the Day, Wednesday, verse with extensive supplementary remarks. Those who begin an esoteric training must be clear about what they are doing. We are connected through karma to everything that we are and do as human beings. We are placed into the entirety of earth existence by divine beings who lead us. Everything that we think, feel, and will in terms of the greatest, loftiest beauty, the highest morality, is always connected to evolution in general. However, with this one decision to want to enter upon an esoteric training, we take a step out of this evolution in general, which is guided by higher beings. We thereby start something entirely new. By means of this esoteric training, we develop from creatures who are being guided by divine spiritual beings into independent partners with these creative beings. On the earth, the human being consists of these four elements, physical body, etheric body, astral body, and I, which are kept in the harmony given to them by higher beings. When our decision to enter into an esoteric training is followed up with a deed, then we begin to work independently on the transformation of these individual bodies. Indeed, this happens through the exercises that are given to us. They gradually work upon the etheric body so that it is loosened from the solid constitution of the physical body. However, this influence is not exerted directly upon the etheric body, but rather upon the astral body, which is affected by our exercises. To begin with, we work on the astral body by means of our regular, daily or weekly, periodically repeated exercises and by pictures that we allow to work upon our souls. In the verses of our meditations, every sound has its significance, every word, every sequence of sounds, every sequence of ideas. They work upon us through regular repetition, accompanied by complete self-forgetfulness. When we awaken in the morning, we sometimes have a quiet memory of the spiritual world, of the world from which strength flows to us through our exercises. And this quiet memory of that world, from which we have drawn strength and in which we were present at the source of strength, belongs among the most beautiful experiences of an esoteric student. If someone has taken leave of a dear person, it is possible that something of this person can flow into the esoteric student's memory of the spiritual world. And those who experience something like this should regard it as a special grace. After meditating for a time, we notice that we have changed. Many loveless actions that came from us earlier we no longer commit. We acquire a much finer logic. We feel that we have become better. We are becoming better. However, through the fact that we are placing ourselves outside the usual and customary framework of contemporary consciousness, we lose the support that is given by conventions and traditions we become freer within ourselves. But just in this way our bad side comes more to the fore. Only now do we notice how bad we are. We really are much worse than we customarily think. For every esoterically striving person, difficult, dreadful times will come. Then it is good to have a support. We find this support in the New Testament. We find their advice for every situation, for every case, a support for every weakness. We need only seek it. And if we do not find it, then the conviction of our own weakness, that we cannot yet find the right passage, should comfort us that it must certainly be in the New Testament. 
illusions can easily appear along with beginning clairvoyance. We think we are seeing something before us externally, but it is something from within ourselves that is reflected there. It is even worse with sounds that we think we have heard. Beings that want to pull us down deceive meditators in this way. For those who are striving esoterically, it is necessary not only to undertake meditations and to pray, parenthesis, if praying is understood in the best sense, close parenthesis, it is also necessary to watch, to be alert to bad influences that want to intervene when an independent transformation of bodies is undertaken. An esoteric saying against all illusions states, quote, All paths into the spiritual world go through the heart. Close quote. During meditation we can feel how from every point of the external physical body lines go toward a center point. This middle point is the heart. In their further course, these lines continue in the opposite direction into the spiritual world. This is like a feeling of Christ within us. This kind of phenomenon is genuine. Every one of our bodily members is related to a sign of the zodiac. Thus forces from the sign of Leo flow down into our heart. Forces from the sun also stream into our heart. So too the spirits of fire work on our heart. All three are often used as symbols for the heart, Leo, the sun, and a flame. Like the heart, every member of the human being has a relationship to forces that stand outside us. We have come forth from and are embedded in the whole world. When we allow this fact properly to live in our souls, then we are understanding this verse in the right way, beginning, quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body, close quote, end of esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Munich on August 26, 1910, record A, from Paula Stritzik, record B, source of notes unknown, Record C, manuscript from Barbara Wolf, additional record, author unknown. Record A. With the same intention as last time, we want also today to invoke the spirit of the day. When an esoteric lesson can be held on a Friday, it is to be regarded as special good fortune. The verse for Friday follows, beginning of quote, Great all-encompassing spirit, in your life I live with the earth's life. Close quote. During the night, with the astral body and the eye, we are in divine ether spheres from which we bring down strength for our physical life. For this reason, we should never have banal, everyday, egotistical thoughts immediately upon awakening. We cut ourselves off in this way from the spiritual beings and forces in which we were immersed during sleep. Rather, before we engage in any task of daily life, before we engage in any thoughts of physical existence, we should devote ourselves to our meditations, during which we immerse ourselves in those regions of self-forgetfulness. All meditators should make it their holy obligation to undertake their meditation immediately upon awakening, or, in any case, their first thought should be to think of higher beings with gratitude. An even more sacred obligation, if there can be one, should be for all esoteric students to bear in mind with complete clarity that they do a great injustice not only to themselves, not only to their fellow human beings, but also to higher spiritual beings when they approach meditation with impure thoughts and feelings. They thereby pollute the spiritual spheres. The forces that have to be applied in order to remove this pollution are taken away from the progress of humanity. 
we can carry out our exercises with good concentration, and yet in doing so, not be wholly within. This carrying out of our meditations is only a matter of will, which of course should be consolidated and developed. However, in doing so, our entire inner life should be sanctified so that only lofty, holy content lives in our souls during meditation. Just as we should not go into meditation with impure feelings and thoughts, neither should we go into sleep at night with such thoughts. Also in this way, we bring impurity into the divine spheres when we take with us thoughts of arrogance, of vanity, and of pride. We should fall asleep with the thoughts of reverence and gratitude for spiritual beings. For we could not live for a minute longer unless divine spiritual beings maintained our physical and etheric bodies when the astral body and I are outside during sleep. We should fall asleep with reverence for great spiritual beings. Esotericists differ from exotericists through this, that God lives in them consciously, that they really allow the power of God to become active within them. This does not happen through the ideas that they have of God. They can harm themselves precisely through these ideas when they later enter the spiritual world. For example, they want to find Christ there in the same form they think of Him on earth, and they do not recognize Him beyond that form. Yet He is different from even the highest idea that we can form of Him. Arrogance, pride, Vanity. These are characteristics that especially an esotericist should above all set aside. Also those esotericists who imagine that they have already set aside arrogance, pride and so forth must know that these traits are always present in a subtle way. The thought alone that one has already set aside these traits, that one has advanced far in one's development, contains a certain vanity that is much worse than the vanity of external life because it is strengthened and is related to higher spiritual things. We are living now in a special time, an extremely important time. It is the time for preparing for Christ, who will become visible, will appear in the etheric realm. To be blessed by Him, to see Him there, we must prepare ourselves. Those who do not have the good fortune to come across theosophy now will not be able to experience this event. We have come into being through higher spiritual forces, as we have heard throughout these days. We have descended from the divine womb. We have a divine origin. Thus, out of this knowledge we can place before our souls the Rosicrucian saying, Ex Deo Nasimur, Out of God we are born. But another statement should stand right next to it, one that makes us feel much smaller, so that we surrender and lose ourselves. We devote ourselves to Christ. And when this mood properly lives in our soul, then we can add in Christo Moremur, to ex Deo Nasimur. And as a further view of how we can consciously develop the Spirit, the Holy Spirit within us, the Rosicrucian verse gives us the sentence that follows the first two sentences, Per Spiritum Sanctum Levevissimus. In the Holy Spirit we will live again and again. And when we use this Rosicrucian verse as the fundamental mood of our meditations, then we will be taking it into ourselves with complete understanding and with a holy feeling. This is the verse that reads, beginning, quote, In the Spirit lay the seed of my body, close quote. End of record A. Record B. An esotericist should learn to be awake and to pray, to be awake to all deleterious influences that want to intervene when an independent transformation of one's bodies is undertaken, and one prepares oneself to become an independent co-worker 
with creative spirits. Here many powers and beings approach us that want to tear us away from this undertaking. We easily fall prey to illusions, an occult saying against all illusions, all paths to the spiritual world go through the heart. The heart is the center of spiritual movement. The brain is the center of intellectual movement. During meditation, we can feel how from every point of the outer physical body, forces are streaming toward a center. This is the heart. In their further course, these lines continue in the opposite direction, past the border of the skin and into the spiritual world. That is a feeling for Christ in us. At the same time, this is a sign that no illusion is present. From the constellation of the lion, forces flow toward the heart. Forces from the sun also stream toward the heart. The spirits of fire also work upon the heart. All three are often used as symbols for the heart. Lion, sun, flames. Prayer we unite ourselves in the right way with our heart forces. Waking Esotericists should be clear that when they approach meditation with impure thoughts and feelings, they are doing a great injustice not only to themselves, not only to their fellow human beings, but also to lofty spiritual beings. They thereby pollute the spiritual spheres and the forces that must be marshaled in order to remove this impurity are withdrawn from humanity's progress. One can perform one's meditation with relatively strong concentration and yet in doing so be unholy within. This execution of meditation is ultimately a matter of will. Of course, the will should be strengthened. But in doing so, the entire inner life must also be sanctified, so that only sacred and lofty content lives in our souls during meditation. And just as one should enter into meditation with pure thoughts and feelings, so should one also enter into sleep. Thoughts of arrogance and vanity pollute the spiritual world during sleep. We should fall asleep with thoughts of reverence and gratitude for spiritual beings. Esotericists differ from exotericists through this, that God lives in them consciously, that they really allow the power of God to become active within them, not just ideas that they have about God. They can harm themselves precisely through these ideas when they later enter the spiritual world. For example, they want to find Christ there in the same form they thought of him on earth and therefore they do not recognize the true Christ, for he is different from even the highest idea that we can form of him. Arrogance, pride, vanity are characteristics that an esotericist should especially above all set aside. Even when one thinks that one has set them aside, these traits are still present, and in an even more subtle way. Even in the thought, that one has already set aside these traits because one has already advanced so far, there lies a certain vanity, which is worse than the vanity of external life because it is strengthened by the fact that it is related to higher spiritual things. An esotericist must learn to be awake and to pray in the right sense. End of Record B Record C Prayer to the Spirit of Friday this is especially effective, beginning, quote, Great all-encompassing spirit, in your life I live with the life of the earth, close quote. After awakening in the morning, we should strive as soon as possible to immerse ourselves again in the spiritual world with our meditations. At night, before going to sleep, we should prepare ourselves for the fact that we are entering the spiritual world, but not with prayers having any kind of egotistical wishes, such as for a blessed end or anything like that. We should bring nothing impure into the etheric world. Of course, through the intensity of our will, we can penetrate into this world even when impure, 
but then our experience is totally worthless. It is a great advantage to enter into an esoteric life in this present time. This is more beneficial than in any other incarnation. In twenty years, many will experience the Christ event in the etheric, and for this reason we must strive for the greatest seriousness and with the greatest intensity to experience it purely, for many people experience only their own picture of Christ. End of Record C Additional Record Bern, September 10, 1910 Under this date there is a record of an esoteric lesson in Bern, the text of which is of such questionable quality that it is included here only for the sake of completeness. Quote, the essence of memory is this, that we can call up again through the power of our own eye as a picture within what we perceived through the instrument of the physical body, so that we do not need the physical body, but rather out of the ocean of the etheric body we create a picture of what we had previously perceived through the physical body. The picture that is newly awakened to an idea within us is formed from the ocean of the etheric. When we perceive with our external instruments, they are used up. Exhaustion sets in. In order to eliminate this exhaustion, human beings must experience the sleeping state in the night. When they are out there in the cosmos, they draw in divine spiritual forces, and behold how these forces work on the physical body to restore it. There, humans work with the divine spiritual beings who once created them. There, they experience the ex Deo Nasimer. However, the etheric body is left without this restoration. In order to fill it with strength, we must do something else. We must cr- ourselves create something within it. Just as the eye, E-Y-E, has been created through light, and without light would not be an eye, but here we are talking about the physical body, upon which physical sunlight has worked. So there is a spiritual light that creates the spiritual eye, E-Y-E. The spiritual eye is created from this power of light. We must allow this power to work upon us. It creates our spiritual organs. And this power of light also equips us with renewed forces for the etheric body. And we can receive these forces only when we carry out with our souls what lies in the words in Christo Morimer. Again and again we must repeat this anew, conscious of the fact that only in steady and patient repetition, which corresponds to the principle of the etheric body, can we succeed in having the spiritual light experience. We die in Christ whom we find in the depths of our bodily nature, just as we sleep into the cosmos at night. We unite ourselves with Him. It is His strength that strengthens us in the etheric body. His power of light and warmth creates for us the organs with which we are permitted to experience and to perceive Him. Here we experience per spiritum sanctum revivissimus, the end of the additional record and the end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric Lesson, Berlin, November 4th, 1910 Record A, Notes from Günther Wagner Record B, Anonymous Manuscript, Freda Collection Record C, Manuscript from Camilla Vandry Record D, Notes from the Collection of Elizabeth Freda Record E, Notes from Margareta Morgenstern Record F. Manuscript from Alice Kinkel Record G. Manuscript from Nellie Lichtenberg Record A. Learning to walk, to speak, and to understand All who have already heard an esoteric lesson know that what is said here is said not only from me, We want to ask for the aid of the spirit of the day. The verse for Friday follows. When we observe life as it unfolds between birth and death, we must consider, from an esoteric standpoint, that it exists so that we can learn 
during this span of time. Learn for our esoteric path. Now, when we survey this physical life, we see that we bring the preconditions, the organs needed for all that we are able to do in life. However, there are three exceptions. These three things we must first learn here in physical life. If an impression of color enters our eyes, then we are able to see it soon after birth. We do not first need to learn it. The ability is simply present. It is the same with hearing and so forth. There are only three things we must learn. That is walking, speaking, and understanding, that is, forming concepts. In order to walk, we must first of all, mainly, learn to stand. Before we can do that, we simply fall over. We do not yet have a feeling for balance. We must first learn to feel our way into three-dimensional space. So, too, we must learn to speak and to understand. If we have learned to walk in the first year of life, then we can go on our way. If we have learned to understand, then we can give life to truth. We can bring life through the Word. In our first three years of life, we learn to walk, speak, and think. We find these three years of life symbolically in Christ's three years on earth. Everything that has come to us from Christ, we must find again as a foundation in the first three years of our life. Everything esoteric students need for their esoteric life is given to them in the esoteric lessons. They receive answers to all their questions through what is given them in the meditative exercises. They must only listen properly and apply everything properly. What is given to us as meditation must acquire life. Thus the verse, quote, in pure rays of light, close quote, we should allow these lines not only to pass by in thoughts, they also should acquire life in us. We should give ourselves entirely to the content of the meditation and forget everything that is around us in the physical world, our personal interests and so forth. As a reward for the fact that we have given up our physical life, so to speak, that we have sacrificed it for the time of meditation, after the first two lines, quote, in pure rays of light, shines the divinity of the world, Close quote. a tone will sound forth within us, which will last as long as our karma prescribes. This is a tone that does not sound within us, but rather sounds forth to us from outside of us. Nothing more will be said about this here. One must experience and understand it oneself. And while this sound, this holy word, this unspeakable name sounds forth, the student should take a vow, which can already be taken beforehand, but it must be taken in this moment as well. The vow that the student says to him or herself is this, quote, Every other sound that reaches my ear, if it is not based in the physical world, every other sound aside from this holy word, I will consider to be a work of Araman. This is a withdrawal, a turning away from what is around the student, which produces a feeling of cold within the student. A feeling of indifference and apathy takes hold of the student who feels him or herself to be left alone in an incredible frost. The student must bring love to this feeling of frost that is created by pure thought. And when we have heard this sound, we receive with it the direction of, quote, the East, close quote. The sound comes from the East. We can orient ourselves in the spirit. We no longer fall over like a child that has not yet learned how to stand and walk. We can now stand and walk in the spirit. And if students allow the third and fourth lines to live within them, quote, in pure love to all beings, rays 
the godliness of my soul, close quote, then they will feel warmth, radiant, living warmth. Only those experiences that come to them during this feeling of warmth have genuine value as truth. Everything else is the work of Lucifer. And if the students have brought the last three lines, quote, I rest in the divinity of the world. I will find myself in the divinity of the world. Close quote. To life within them, then they will grasp the truth. Thus students have achieved the way in the first two lines, the truth in the last three lines, and then life, spiritual life, flows to them from the middle two lines. Tomorrow we will speak more about this. There is something that students must develop within. Much is said concerning this in outer life, and yet it does not at all find expression. The depths of it are not even recognized or even suspected. Love of our fellow human beings is spoken of so much, and yet there is nothing corresponding to this feeling in what people think it is in outer life. Esoteric students should begin to say to themselves in all humility, I know nothing about love of humanity. We love people for various reasons, but none of those reasons are the right ones. We should love people because they are human beings. Christ gave us the right example for this. And then a quote, In the Spirit lay the seed of my body. Close quote, end of record A. Record B. Let us summarize in a few words the life of human beings from birth to death and review all that human beings must themselves develop during life as well as what they bring with them already developed. There are three things that human beings do not bring with them when they enter the world, things that they must acquire in the course of their lives. Newborn human beings bring organs with them already finished, their eyes, for example, through which they perceive their surroundings, their ears, and so forth. However, the three things that they must develop themselves are walking, speaking, and thinking. Why can we not yet walk when we are born? Because we cannot yet find our balance. We must first seek it and establish ourselves in a relationship to surrounding nature. Then for a long time we sway back and forth, seeking a foot footing that cannot be found so quickly. As soon as we have found it, we can stand and also find our way alone. The second thing that we must acquire for ourselves is understanding which leads to thinking and through thinking we come to the truth. The third is language, through which we send out into the world our thoughts and feelings, our inner life. If we apply this picture as a symbol to the wonderfully beautiful words that Christ spoke to his disciples out of esoteric wisdom, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life, close quote, we will find that these words relate to the esoteric development of the human being. When we begin our meditating, it is the same for us as for a child who must first learn to walk. We sway back and forth. We err to the right, then to the left with our thoughts, until we finally have found our footing, the necessary serenity and collectedness that gives us balance which is Christ himself. He wants to be our leader, and we should seek our foundation in him. We should find our inner balance through him so that we can walk in his path. In ancient pre-Christian times, students needed a guru who would helpfully stand by their side during meditation. Since Christ has walked on the earth, he has left his power behind in the atmosphere of the earth so that we can fill ourselves with it when we open ourselves to it. Furthermore, our meditation should become pure thinking 
so the truth can become life through the words that we send forth to our fellow human beings. Once we have found our way after a longer time of practice, without swaying to the right or the left, we will come to an inner experience when we immerse ourselves in the first lines of our morning meditation, quote, In pure rays of light shines the divinity of the world, close quote. We will feel this experience as something that cannot be expressed in words. A stream of warmth, a, a light from the east, will flow through us, and within us a tone will sound forth that allows us to feel that we are connected with the light of God. When we ascend further in our development, a new experience again approaches us when we meditate the next two lines, quote, In the pure love of all beings, raise the godliness of my soul. Close quote. Now we perceive a name out of the light and sound that comes to us from the east. We are not able to speak this name that thrills the soul and causes us to feel, quote, that is God's name, close quote. At the same time, a stream of indescribable cold will blow through us, combined with a feeling of abandonment and loneliness. This name will flood through our inner being, and we will know that He is this name. This experience will lead us to knowledge of the truth, and we will have arrived at a place where the spiritual world opens to us, where we can know whether what we see is truth or illusion. Everything we think we have heard in terms of sounds, knocking or other phenomena from the physical world before this experience, none of that was the truth. We know that now. It was Araman or Lucifer doing tricks around us with their illusions. For this reason, we should strictly turn away such experiences of sounds and so forth that come to us from the physical world. For we know that we will not be able to experience true spiritual phenomena until we feel the warm stream that pours into our souls from the east, until we have lived through the freezing cold and the feeling of abandonment, until we have perceived the tone that causes the name of God to sound forth within us. Let us once more consider the words, quote, In pure love of all things, raise the godliness of my soul. Close quote. The Christian Church chose this quote, practice of pure love close quote, as its favorite saying. To be sure, this saying is used a lot by Christians. However, seldom are actions guided by it. Furthermore, it is also not easy when we consider all the consequences. Let us consider for a moment what it means to love all human beings, to bestow love without expectation of love in return, without recognition, without demand for reward. For our ideal should be that we love a human being because he or she is a human being. How far must we be in our development in order to be capable of such love? Can we educate ourselves to this selflessness that we love all others as we love ourselves by means of commandments and dogmas of the church or through the coercion of a moral law? Is it not much more fruitful for our souls if we bring this lofty virtue to blossom within us without any coercion whatsoever? In practicing this teaching of Christ, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Parsi, a Catholic, a Protestant, a Jew, indeed even a heretic, could be a true Christian without even belonging to the Christian Church. And we also learn in our meditations that within them lies hidden the way that Christ showed us, and that He Himself is, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Close quote. End of record B. Record C. Esoteric students must learn to regard the course of their lives in the physical world in such a way that they learn during the span of time between birth and death. 
learn in order to find their esoteric path, so that they do not lose their connection with the world of their origin, the spiritual world. With the exception of three things that we must first learn here in our physical life, when we survey this physical life, we see that there is much we are able to do for which we have already brought the prerequisites, the organs. Soon after birth we are able to see. We do not need to learn that, and so it is with tasting, smelling, and hearing. These capacities are already present, even if we learn only later how to consciously make use of them. However, there are three things that we must learn after birth. They are walking, speaking, and understanding. In the esoteric sense, learning to walk means being able to raise oneself upright through the power of the I, capital, that lives within and is increasingly strengthening itself. It means being able to maintain oneself upright in space with respect to the spiritual forces that permeate one and learning to find one's way through them. Where to? Toward the spiritual east, which students learn of at a certain step in their development. When students have found this path, then it is absolutely quiet and loneliness over against the outer world. They must listen for what sounds toward them from the east. This is an experience that every student has sooner or later, according to when one's karma allows it. Students hear, sounding forth from the east, the, quote, unspeakable word, close quote, the name of God that speaks itself. This sounds into the calm and loneliness of the student. And in the soul of the student, this word becomes a power in the soul, which is enkindled to awaken in the student, in the depths of soul, something that is asleep. The creative powers of existence awaken in him or her. The second step is, the student learns to speak. In the esoteric sense, speaking is a sounding forth of what was in the soul before as life and now sounds outward. In the midst of these two experiences, parenthesis hearing the name of God from without, from the spiritual east, and speaking within oneself, close parenthesis, exactly in the middle, only in meditation, the student can receive revelations from the spiritual world. This sounding into the soul as a spiritual sound, it is audible to physical ears, and according to a student's karma, it will remain a longer or shorter time, this holy word, this unspeakable name of God, cannot be said by the teacher. Every student must take hold of it and experience it for him or herself. And while this sound is sounding forth, students must take a vow, which they could have taken earlier, but must take now. They must say to themselves, Every other sound that reaches my ear, if it is spiritual, that is, not founded in the physical world, I will regard as a work of Araman. When students have had this experience, then descending into their own being, they can feel new life. Then they can know the truth of the spiritual world through their own experience. The real, the true path of an esoteric student proceeds only in this way. Everything else is deceiving illusions from Araman, which seek to reach students before they have perceived the spiritual sound, and deceiving illusions from Lucifer, which come before students have received the life rising in their souls. But this spiritual sound that students perceive from the spiritual east of their souls, which enkindles a new light, the spiritual sunlight, within them, does not work as the external sunlight works when it enkindles light in the outer world and sends warmth streaming through it. The spiritual sound of the sun works in such a way that it creates an icy coldness in the soul of the students 
They feel themselves to be lonely, as if entirely separate, hovering entirely alone in empty space that is filled only with thoughts. This must be so, and students must go through it. When they have struggled through this, then they will feel an entirely new inner warmth rising out of the depths of their souls. This is the warmth of Christ's love. And in the midst of cold streaming in from without and warmth rising from within, there revelations from the spiritual world occur. There the students find the truth, only there alone. And they find it when they say to themselves, quote, Everything that I receive, I receive by going through the phases of development spiritually, just as I went through them physically in the first three years of my life as a child. Thus, as a student, I must first learn to raise myself upright inwardly, spiritually, through the strength of my eye. Then I must learn to go to the east in my soul. Then I must learn to speak, that means to form concepts, in order finally to find the truth. Close quote. Only after Christ had been on the earth and the mystery of Golgotha had taken place, only then could students of the Spirit learn to follow such a path. Only after Christ had set an example by living through these mysteries of soul evolution, which are expressed in the words, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Close quote. Students must live through the stages of Christ's life by means of their own strength. This verse awakens life. Quote, In pure rays of sunlight shines the divinity of the world. Close quote. We must learn to devote ourselves entirely to such meditative content in our souls. Then we will see how the content of this esoteric lesson is contained within it. However, if it is really to awaken life in our souls, we must forget everything that is present in physical life as our personal interest during the time of our devotion to our meditation. If we are inwardly entirely empty, entirely empty, entirely filled with a sacred mood, then the spiritual light that shines from without shines forth for us. Quote, in pure rays of light, shines the divinity of the world. Close quote. And now we allow the third and fourth lines to become active in us. Quote, in pure love of all beings, raise the godliness of my soul. Close quote. We will feel warmth, pure radiant warmth. Only what comes to us during this feeling of warmth in terms of experiences really has value as truth. Everything else, perhaps a feeling of overwhelming floating in joy, is the work of Lucifer. However, if we have brought these three lines, quote, I rest in the divinity of the world, I will find myself in the divinity of the world, close quote, fully into our conscious life, then, indeed, we will certainly grasp the truth. In this way we have achieved, in quotes, the way in the first two lines and, in quotes, the truth in the last three lines. Life is opened for us in the middle two lines. And this, my dear sisters and brothers, is the most difficult to achieve. How much is spoken in outer life about human love? How little is done? For this is the most difficult of Christ's words to fulfill. Love your neighbor as yourself. Develop pure love of human beings. Those who love a human being because he or she is a human being, only those who do this are in truth Christians, regardless of what creed or which religion they may belong to. Thus in a genuine Rosicrucian training, we learn the path to enter the spiritual world under the guidance of Christ, looking toward Him. We learn how to follow his earthly path independently in our esoteric training. Everything esoteric students need for their esoteric life is given to them in the esoteric lessons. They are given these lessons as an answer to all of their questions, whether expressed or latent in their souls. 
They must only listen properly and properly apply everything so that it holds sway in their soul awakening and maintaining life. And they will walk the path of esoteric training in such a way that their inner independence is completely untouched. Such a Rosicrucian path is possible now, only since Christ has dwelt on earth. In earlier times, students had to take every step under the leadership and guidance of a guru. Looking toward Christ with a truly esoteric understanding of his words, as it was given to you today, we learn without any interference in our independence to find the path to the great universal guru, the Christ. While fully maintaining the independent self and while bearing in mind the guiding words, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Quote, Wisdom lives in the light, thought. Wisdom shines in the light, feeling. The wisdom of the world shines in the light, will. End of record C. Record D. There are three essential powers that we must acquire after birth. They are walking, speaking, and understanding. Seen superficially, they are merely the natural result of our growth. But for an esotericist, they have a very profound inner significance. In learning to walk, we learn to find our balance within the three dimensions of the physical world. We are led to the truth through thinking and speech gives life to the truth. Esoterically speaking, one could say learning to walk is learning to know the way. Thinking is learning to know the truth. Speaking is learning to know life. In this regard, the first three years of life are the most important, for they correspond to what Christ spoke when he said, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life, close quote. If we want to understand the words of Christ, or even his parables, we must return to the first three years of the child. These years reflect the last three years of the life of Jesus of Nazareth, when Christ walked on the earth. We must return to our childhood in order to understand what Christ said. In the meditation given to the student beginning, quote, in pure rays of light shines the divinity of the world, Close quote. Parenthesis, which can be continued day after day for years before results are noticed. Close parenthesis. According to when our karma allows it, a moment will one day occur during which we are swimming in the light without distinguishing anything specific, entirely filled with serene calmness. Then a sound will be revealed to us in the space that we feel surrounds us on all sides a sound that is unlike anything that can sound in the outer world. But this sound will fill the space and announce to us the unspeakable name of God. We will know then in that moment that we are hearing the unspeakable name. And with this experience, something highly significant will happen. When we hear this sound, we will know that we have come into contact with something that we will feel spiritually as, in quotes, the East. When students have heard this sound, they vow to themselves that they will regard all other sounds and tones that they can experience as impure compared to this sound. Every other tone or sound that we hear in meditation we must reject and regard as an illusion what Araman wants to impose upon us as the truth. Also the mysterious knocking that one can sometimes hear is made by Araman and shows the effects that he tries to exert upon us. Those who pay any attention at all to such sounds or knocking and do not exclusively hold on to the sound previously described, endanger their entire esoteric training. Something like this can hinder any progress for years. 
While this sound is ringing within us, we feel ourselves surrounded by light that fills space. And in this light, a second feeling arises within us, a feeling of icy cold. We feel ourselves totally alone in this cold light, as if one existed all alone in that space. When the meditator then immerses him or herself in the next lines of the meditation, quote, in pure love to all beings, raise the godliness of my soul, close quote, then the icy cold is transformed into a warmth that streams in from all sides, a warmth that is pure love from spiritual spheres, love that is the true life. Quote, I rest in the divinity of the world. I will find myself in the divinity of the world. Close quote. In these lines lie hidden the entire mystery of our unity with Christ. In the course of the years we have looked at the Christ event ever more closely as an historical event in the course of humanity's evolution. Here in this meditation we find Christ as our highest leader, our highest guru, who will lead us directly when we turn to Him. In pre-Christian times, Human beings needed a guru on the earthly plane. In order to advance, they had to adhere strictly to the guru, to obey him. Since Christ has been on the earth, he has become the guru for all human beings. In an esoteric sense, everyone can be a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Catholic, a Protestant, a Jew, as well as a heretic. For it is, quote, Christ in us, close quote, who can be found by all. For the first time we become aware what love is in this warmth streaming toward us. Quote, universal love of humanity, close quote, has become a trivial expression in recent time. People do not even suspect what it is, much less understand it. If esotericists want to catch a reflection of this love, then they must feel themselves encompassed by this warmth and at the same time say to themselves, quote, I know nothing yet of universal love of humanity. I must first begin to learn it. Close quote. The end of record D. Record E. For a student, nothing further is necessary than to understand what the exercises are all about. There are three things, above all, that are necessary when a human being enters the physical world. He or she must learn to walk, speak, and understand, think. We will take hold of our task here and be able to fulfill it only if we pause to reflect on what Christ taught in the last three years of his life. He taught what was most important to him when he said, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Close quote. The way is connected with walking, the truth is connected with learning to understand, and the life with speaking. Thus in the spiritual life, on a higher level, we must learn to do what a child learns to do in the first three years, walk, speak, and understand. When we learn to walk, we are concerned with three directions in space. This is also the case in learning to walk spiritually in which certain directions must also be balanced. In doing so, our starting point is complete rest, calmness of soul. That is necessary, above all. Meditation must also end in such calmness, whereby we vow to ourselves that only what sounds forth to us as tone, as the meditation ends, will be recognized as truth. On the other hand, every kind of knocking or other sounds that we hear must be considered illusion until it has become something harmonious. Only sounds from the spiritual world that come to us in serene calmness after meditation are what is designated as the, quote, unspeakable name of God, close quote. When hearing this word after meditation, we realize what is meant by the two lines of the meditation Quote, in pure rays of light, 
shines the divinity of the world, close quote, pointing to the spiritual east, which is intended here. With this knowledge of God, something else appears to us, to which we must pay careful attention. In the following words, quote, In pure love of all beings, raise the godliness of my soul, close quote, a feeling of minor coldness and loneliness will appear in us. Space becomes empty to us, and thoughts also disappear, until later a feeling of inner warmth appears in us. As a consequence of this experience, a liberation from egotism then appears. However, between the two moments characterized lie the revelations from the spiritual world that are revealed out of the meditations. As reward for our efforts, Christ can be seen for moments. The end of record E. Record F. Quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Close quote. I am the way. With this is connected a human beings learning to walk. The truth, learning to think, and the life. A human being's learning to speak is connected with the life. Walking makes it possible for us to be oriented in space. Thinking makes it possible for us to grasp the truth. And speaking gives us the inner warmth that belongs with the coldness of thought. Spiritual sound comes from, in quotes, the East and brings vision. The unspeakable name of God is the revelation from the entire world. The first three years of life of a human being on the physical plane teach the human being to walk, to speak, and to think. The child's first three years of life and Christ's three years of teaching on earth have spiritual connections, but are understandable only by this way of comparison. Do I know what the universal love of humanity is? No, I do not yet know anything about it. The universal love of humanity is loving a human being because he or she is a human being. It is Christ in the man or woman whom one loves, the Christ. He is always present. Only the sound that floods space during meditation, during the influence of pure thought, is effective. But the sound must come to the student from the spiritual world. The student must not listen to anything else. The end of record F. Record G. There are three important things that every human being must learn. Walking, speaking, understanding, which means forming concepts. Through walking we learn the way. Through understanding we learn to know the truth. Through speaking the truth acquires life. So we can translate this into the words of Christ Jesus, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life, close quote. Every human being must change and, quote, become like a child, close quote. That means learning these three things that a child accomplishes in the first three years of life. During meditation, when we are filled with the content of the meditation, after we have previously ordered ourselves to be completely serene and calm, we will perceive a voice in the quiet, and we will know that it comes from, in quotes, the East, from where all things spiritual will come. It will seem to us as if we were set free from the content of the meditation and are floating in the room. We learn how to walk, so to speak, how to orient ourselves in space. All other voices that we think we have heard from the spiritual world lead us astray. They are whisperings from Araman. Then there are moments during meditation when everything appears to us to be cold and austere. We feel ourselves to be completely alone and that we can rely on ourselves alone. These moments must occur, for now, with the words, quote, in pure love to all beings, close quote, we feel how warmth of soul is poured through the body. 
between these two, parenthesis, the spiritual light from the east at the beginning, and the feeling of warmth of soul, the life at the conclusion, close parenthesis, is the only time that a revelation from the spiritual worlds, the truth, can flow into us. Only meditation that is permeated by Christ has value. There is an expression that has become trivial out in the world at large, the expression, quote, universal love of humanity, close quote. One could say that only those who admit that they know nothing about it are beginning to understand it in its rudiments. There is only one who has taught it in the truest sense, Christ Jesus himself. The end of that record and the end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Berlin on November 5, 1910. Record A, notes from Günther Wagner. Record B, notes from the collection of Elisabeth Freda. Record C, source of manuscript unknown. Record D, manuscript from Nelly Lichtenberg. Record E, notes from Margareta Morgenstern. Record F, manuscript from Camilla Wandry. Record A, Noah's Ark. As always, also today, we want to ask the spirit of the day for help with our work. Saturday verse. Yesterday already we said that students hear a spiritual sound, a sound from the East. If students now want to say that they know how the spirit sounds, that they have now heard their first spiritual sound, then they would find themselves in a major fatal error. This tone that a student hears is much more the last word from the physical world. Every tone that could somehow come forth from the larynx, incarnated in flesh, is not from the spiritual world. First of all, the spiritual world is completely colorless, without light, soundless, and so forth. Everything we see in terms of color is not spiritual, but rather comes from within us, and indeed presents us with characteristics that we do not yet have, that we have yet to achieve. For example, when we see a red color, this means that we do not yet have love within us, that we have still to develop it. If we see violet, then that wants to say that we must acquire devoted piety. When we hear tones like earthly sounds, this is nothing spiritual, but rather something that originates within us. If someone has a desire to eat a certain food, for example, if someone begins to eat in a vegetarian manner, but inwardly he still has a longing for meat, even if he is not aware of it, then this craving sounds in tones in discordant tones. All these tones and sounds are only occult squawking ravens. If a figure from earlier times appears to a student and he or she wants to interpret it immediately, that is all wrong. We must be able to wait with our interpretations. We should not interpret in the present moment, but only later. If such an image appears before the soul, then it will vanish as soon as we approach it with thoughts. However, if it is a genuine picture, it will appear to us again later and remain still in its true shape, and we will know what it signifies. But we must be able to wait, to wait and keep silent. Even as we ourselves should not approach our experiences with our own thoughts, even less should we speak about them. We should regard and treat our entire spiritual life as something holy. With all these experiences of sounds, colors, and so forth, we must say to ourselves that they come not from the Spirit, but rather from within us, from our own I, capital, which is inundated by waves from the sea of our desires and passions, just as Noah's Ark was surrounded by waves of the sea. And we must live with the conviction that none of these experiences and phenomena are spiritual. 
and in saying this very clearly and relentlessly to ourselves, we must surrender the I, surrender the desires of the I for experiences and let them fly away as Noah let a dove fly away from the ark, which then never came back. Then later another esoteric experience comes to the student. When we have understood that there is nothing, nothing at all spiritual in those experiences of sound and color, when we have recognized with inner strength that the spiritual world is entirely empty for us, then we recognize that those experiences, nevertheless, have significance for us. The colors come to warn and advise us. They tell us what we do not yet have, what we still have to achieve. From the sounds, we learn that they present us with bodily cravings. And when the pictures that we calmly allowed tell us their significance, then the soul is enriched by such experiences. This is like the second dove set loose, which returned with the olive branch, the symbol of peace. However, the soul is not left entirely alone to its own devices on this difficult path of the esotericist. There is something that it can hold on to. The rose cross is something like this. We should let it have an effect on us. We should understand that the black of the cross represents our bodily nature, which is hardened and withered. That we must allow the lower self, which identifies with this bodily nature, to become just as dark and dead as the wood of the cross is dead. Then the higher self, the spiritual I, will work in us, just as the black of the cross is transformed into bright, radiant rays of light. In the same way, the red of the roses will be transformed from the color of the love that works within into green, the color of the life that works outward. When we experience symbols, those that make us happy, that we experience joyfully, are not genuine or originating from the spiritual world. Rather, it is only those symbols with which we experience sorrow. And we must carry them around with us until we have grasped their meaning. The spirit must be born in suffering, out of those symbols. And there is something else that we must understand. That is this. We cannot even be non-egotistical. We are never non-egotistical, never, never, never. And when we imagine that we have now done something that is entirely selfless, that is an error. We cannot act selflessly at all. It is the karma of the world that causes us to act egotistically. World karma is God. And if we ever get so far that we act nobly and for the good, that is God in us, who is good. When we become less selfish, we will observe, for example, that we no longer feel fear or shock. If next to us a sudden sound occurs, we will no longer shrink back as before. God, who causes us to act nobly and for the good, is our archetype. Our archetype created us to be what we are, and we ourselves must again become an image of our archetype. When we have properly understood all this, then we will understand in the right way the genuine esoteric Rosicrucian saying, quote, ex Deo Nasimer. in, and in the reading here there's just three blank lines, Morimer, per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. Close quote. What has been left out here is unspeakable for an esotericist. When we begin to speak this one line, then our feeling must go to that which is unspeakable. And only when our feeling returns can we continue to speak. Those who experience this inwardly with the proper feeling will also understand the other esoteric verse properly. Quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body. 
close quote. End of record A. Record B. What was said yesterday concerning the unspeakable word, which is heard in meditation and indicates the direction toward the east, we should not think of as something representing a sound having anything in common with human speech. That which we hear as a vowel, as articulated sound within it, is simply what we ourselves have laid into it. Nothing of all that is seen or heard in the spiritual world, no sound, no color, has anything in common with the things of this world. If we see a red color, then the red color is something that belongs to us, and indeed it represents what we ourselves are not yet. Red in the spiritual world signifies love. Therefore, when we see red, it signifies that we have not yet developed love. While meditating, we are lifting ourselves more or less consciously into the spiritual world as though we were standing on a high mountain and the waves of our passions are pounding around us and toward us just as Noah's ark floated on the flood. These are the passions that are revealed as sounds, as voices, at the beginning. As esotericists, we are obligated at the beginning of our development to reject all tones, sounds, to regard them as the squawking of ravens. We must begin by regarding everything we see or hear as wrong. So also when, for example, we see individuals whom we know as they were in their previous incarnations. All of this students should pay no attention to and should release in such a way that it does not return. What we see in this way, after a long time, for it can last quite a while before a change occurs, will dissolve and be transformed into something else. What is then newly formed is what is true. If a red color appears, we must understand this is coming forth from ourselves. Only when the red color is dissolved as if in a cloud and then becomes another color is the last color to be seen as significant. This is the dove that returns to the ark with an olive branch. This is a revelation from the spiritual world that has something to tell us. But this too should be understood as a symbol that we should learn to decipher. Again, a long time can pass before one is in a position to do this. Even when a symbol is shown to us, we should not stand still with it, but rather much more direct it away from us. We should consider colors and symbols only when they have already previously appeared to us for a while, so that it is more likely that our personal interest in them has disappeared and we can perhaps find their true significance. We must get used to the idea that we are entirely permeated by self-seeking and that we carry this with us into the spiritual world. We must have the courage and the strength to permeate ourselves with the certainty that on the physical plane we can do nothing, absolutely nothing, without egotism contributing to our actions. We should undertake to vow to ourselves to always bear in mind that all that we do originates from egotistical motives. This could perhaps discourage us. But if one manages to do it for oneself, one will notice that one makes certain progress. For example, fear and shock, which we feel when suddenly hearing a sound, will fall away. Only what we do in the name of another, in the name of the one within us, whom we could call our God, does not proceed from egotism. In order to feel this God within us, we must permeate ourselves with the consciousness that we are a reflection of the archetype according to which this God created us and that only slowly and gradually can this reflection be transformed into the archetype. The archetype is our true self, our true I that was formed as seed in old Saturn 
and this is what approaches us when we utter our Rosicrucian verse. The Rose Cross is the symbol through which the way is shown to us to ascend into the spiritual world. If it is seen as it is in the spiritual world, then the black of the cross is seen as white, the counterpart of the reflection, and the red roses are transformed into a shining green color. The Rosicrucian verse is exoteric as long as one speaks it complete. It is esoteric when it is spoken in this way, ex deo nasima, in morimur, per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. One must feel for oneself what a great difference lives in the soul when doing so. The end of record B. Record C. We are easily prone to misunderstanding if we think that the sound that comes to us from the spiritual east and signifies the name of God proclaims itself in articulated sounds and tones such as we perceive in the physical world. It is an entirely different kind of sound, another kind of tone that has absolutely nothing in common, not even the least similarity to anything in the physical world. For this reason, then, students must be incredibly careful, using their power of discernment, especially with their self-knowledge. It is a fact that when someone begins to perceive colors, forms, sounds, or even words from the spiritual world, these actually come from the spiritual world in the least number of cases. Mostly they come from the physical world. That is, they come from the individual, him or herself, often simply because the individual is inspired by a burning wish to experience something in the spiritual world. Then, phenomena, sounds and so forth appear from our own world. But in a certain way these phenomena are, nevertheless, based on truth, and this must clearly be borne in mind, inasmuch as they take part in our thoughts and in the character of a human being. What is expressed in colors and so forth, therefore, is not as a rule from the spiritual world. Rather, it is often produced by some bodily malaise, or it could also be caused by the following. If we have become vegetarian, but have not yet lost the desire for eating meat, then this desire will torture us on the astral plane where we abide at night. And this malaise makes itself perceptible through sounds or words that we then think we are hearing as sounds from the spiritual world. This is what is known in esotericism as squawking ravens. Or, let us assume that we see a red color, the red color signifies spiritual love. It is placed before our eyes spiritually because it is precisely the trait we are lacking. It is placed before our souls as a challenge. Many complain that they cannot hold on to the colors, but this is not necessary. The colors must disappear like a dove, and when they later return, they will appear entirely different. The color red will be transformed before our eyes into green, blue, or yellow. That is the sign that it is based on a spiritual phenomenon and that we are at the stage where we are taught in symbols and a view of the spiritual world is granted us. At the beginning we will not understand the symbols. We must allow them to sink down into our memory and gradually it will become clear to us in our meditations what is supposed to be taught to us and said to us by the symbol. As students develop further, it is granted to them to read in the Akashic Chronicle. However, before they reach this stage, they must have worked on themselves a great deal. Above all, they must recognize that all their actions on earth are based on self-seeking that even in their ostensibly selfless deeds of love, self-seeking secretly lies hidden. As long as human beings live on earth, they will not be able to entirely overcome self-seeking. The masters of wisdom give us many things for our meditations, 
One of the most effective of these is the one concerning the Rose Cross. We are to think of the Black Cross as the dying away of human passions and see in the red roses a symbol of the purified human being who has shed the lower elements. If we transform the black cross into a white one in our meditation, then this symbolizes for us the human being ascending spiritually. All egotism is then extinguished. The red roses are meditatively transformed into green ones, and devotion to the divine awakens within us. The veil before our eyes is torn away, and we will see into the spiritual world consciously. The end of Record C. Record D. Referring to what was said the day before, the doctor said, We should not think that our visions and so forth are correct and of value until we have heard the unspeakable word, which is not a word in human sounds. It is altogether not a tone or vowel sound like any earthly tones or vowel sounds. Everything that might manifest to us like that would come from ourselves. Parenthesis, Lucifer and Araman bring deception. Close parenthesis. And the sounds, for example, sounds of knocking and our interpretation of them, would have to be characterized with the expression squawking of ravens. And talking about those kinds of experiences would also be nothing more than the squawking of ravens. Only when we have perceived the word, in quotes, would we arrive at an understanding of what the expressions, quote, East, wise masters of the East, close quote, signify. If the objection were raised, quote, yes, how do I know that I really have knowledge in colors, for example, close quote, then here, the indicator would be that these pictures of color would have to change. So two forms or shapes, which if they do not change, signify nothing. If we have such pictures, then we should keep quiet about them and try to correctly interpret them. That is like a dove that we send out and that never returns, so to speak. Neither should we become sad or impatient if after we have once had a vision None occur again for a long, long time. It is necessary to wait, to wait patiently. Example of an interpretation. If we see red, that does not mean love or that we have love, but rather exactly that we do not have it, that we should acquire it. So too with violet, where devoted piety is lacking. If we have found the correct interpretation, then it is like a dove that returns with an olive branch in its beak. The same is true with forms, symbols, and shapes. It is above all important for us to have in our consciousness the insight that we are egotistical and never, never, never should we say, quote, I am doing this or I feel this entirely without egotism, close quote. For egotism belongs to the karma of the world and for the time being we cannot get free of it but we should acquire the insight that this is the case as a weapon against Araman. Every human being is created from an archetype of him or herself and is only a reflection of this archetype. All that we have been permitted to do in the world in terms of the good, the beautiful and the noble, this we did not do ourselves, but rather we must thank our archetype. When we have developed this knowledge in ourselves, it is like a third dove that climbs higher but constantly returns to us, and in this way connects us with our archetype, which is contained in Christ. If this knowledge has fully come to life within us, then we capitulate before Christ and die in Him. Exoterically we speak the words E-D-N, I-C-M-P-S-S-R Esoterically, they are not to be written down. The end of Record D. Record E. The word from the East we must take up in the right way. 
Above all, we must be careful with inspiration to distinguish between truth and deception. Everything that we hear from the spiritual world that is spoken with the character of something spoken by a larynx, that is, appears as a vowel sound, does not in truth originate from the spiritual world. There can be no characteristics of any earthly sound. For this reason, the word, in quotes, from the spiritual world, flows not as human language. Everything with a vowel sound character must disappear. As soon as something is present with the character of a vowel sound, one must say to oneself, this is a temptation to acknowledge voices other than those from the spiritual world and to follow them. But the Spirit never speaks to me with earthly sounds. With time we will experience that the soul is changed by meditation. And what we experience because of this change can be shown to us with a certain sound. But neither should we consider this to be a true inspiration. It is nothing more than the occult squawking of ravens, of our wishes and desires reflecting the internal aspects of our physical body. This occult squawking of ravens is overcome when I send the ravens away. Therefore, with the first messages that we receive, we must always say that is only our internal bodily nature that is so reflected. These deceptive images are indeed a danger. Nevertheless, we should not allow ourselves to be discouraged because of them and say, quote, Now I have been at work for five years or more and still haven't experienced anything positive. We must rather continue our attempts again and again until we have arrived at a positive result. Human beings clothe their experiences in the physical world in forms, colors, tones, and so forth. However, the spiritual world does not express itself in colors, forms, and sounds in the physical sense. For this reason, human beings must undergo an inversion, in quotes, of the self, in order to be able to see in higher worlds. And they need inner strength for this. Indeed, we must learn to recognize that to begin with, we ourselves create the colors and forms, imaginative pictures. We must confess this boldly, courageously. The voices we think we hear are usually only an expression of unpleasant moods in the body. This is much more the case with those who eat meat. However, the solid faith must continue to exist in me that sooner or later colors and sounds will appear that are not merely the expression of an unpleasant sensation in my body, but really do originate in the spiritual world. The dove of our own spirit is no longer allowed to return to us when it has once flown away. We must learn to interpret the symbolic language that sounds to us from the spiritual world then the dove of our spirit no longer returns empty-handed, but rather with an olive branch. We must try to understand the spiritual experiences in the language of pictures. The first symbols that appear to us should be a summons for us to acquire this capacity. If, for example, the color red, the color of love, appears to me, then I should say to myself in all humility, you don't have it. Violet is the color of devoted piety. It tells us that we should have patience and we should be able to wait. One day when these colors are transformed into their complementary colors, then we can say to ourselves that we have taken a step forward and cleansed ourselves of egotism. The training guides the students and tells them what is important for recognizing symbolically the expression for the first impressions from the spiritual world. Only when we do everything in the name of God are we feeling rightly. Thus human beings must learn to regard themselves as an image, as an archetype of God. The threefold Rosicrucian verse tells us that. The end of record E. Record F. Students should be as distrustful as possible of their esoteric experiences, above all those characterized by a sound. 
even when they want to believe that they are experiencing the sound of the unspeakable name of God at a time when they have found the direction toward spiritual east, when they want to believe that it is spiritual truth when a sound comes to them that reminds them of a physical sound, they are deluded. For this spiritual sound that they hear is like a last residue from the physical world and at the same time like a first something from a higher plane, something that comes to one from the other side of the threshold in order to mediate a connection with higher worlds. Having the character of earthly sound signifies something from the physical plane. Vowel sounds sound forth only here, not there. Genuinely spiritual hearing is something entirely different, something that has nothing at all of a characteristically earthly sound. It does not come from a larynx incarnated in flesh. Now when students are raised up in their, in quotes, ark, on the, in quotes, mountain, they feel themselves encircled by the, quote, waves of the sea, close quote, that is, their own sea, their own astrality, encircled by all that still lives and their drives, lusts, desires, and so forth. They look upon them, they surge around them like waves. They must see through them with understanding. They must know that what is sounding toward them there, or rather what appears to be sounding toward them from the spiritual world, is nothing more than the reflection of their own lusts and desires. To begin with, they experience a reflection of their own lower being. The reflection of their own thoughts is shown to them in colors and in light. Parenthesis, Lucifer is at work in this. Close parenthesis, not their higher self. Sounds are reflections of something living in the physical body as a craving that longs for satisfaction. For example, someone who lives as a vegetarian merely because of his or her decision rather than for spiritual reasons that rise up within, who perhaps still has a desire for meat and suppresses it, can experience how this desire sounds like a tone apparently from spiritual worlds. Here, for example, a student can see red and must learn to say, this shows me that I lack something. I still do not have true love in myself. Red, the color of love, summons me to develop warm love for human beings. And if a floating light violet color appears, the student must say this is merely a sign that I have to develop devoted piety. Or if an event or a personality appears that gives us instruction concerning previous incarnations, this tells us nothing about earlier incarnations but rather that we are not yet mature enough to look into our earlier incarnations, that is, to look into the Akashic Chronicle. A higher development is required for this. For this reason, one must be as distrustful as possible. One is hearing, as is said in occultism, only the squawking of ravens from one's lower self when one is on this mountain, surrounded by the waves of one's own astral sea. Then one gradually learns to distinguish, but one is still exposed to many deceptions. Only when one has learned to say to oneself with complete resolve that all of this is nothing more than the product of one's lower self, not really true experiences of the spiritual world, which are nevertheless experienced at first as they come toward the student, then one can gradually approach the truth, which can be achieved only by overcoming this phase of esoteric development. Then one sends the ravens away with complete resolve. Sending the ravens away means giving up one's everyday I, capital, that is bound to the world of the senses, and it must be so bound, giving up all one's desire for content that is connected with one's experiences. It means becoming entirely quiet, entirely empty, entirely without wishes within. If we have achieved this, 
then we understand that those experiences that still come to us from the physical world still have value, but the value is for us alone. Then, for example, colors tell us that they are advisors, warning us, telling us what we do not yet have, what we still have to achieve. And from the sounds we recognize bodily desires. Then we calmly allow these experiences to work in our souls with their true significance. Now, through the inner calm and quiet in the souls, we have come far enough to send out the first dove. It does not return. And that is good. We wait. Then we send out the second. It returns with an olive branch, the symbol of peace. This means having balance within oneself. What is this dove? When the color form is transformed so that its complementary color arises, when, for example, the color red changes and becomes violet, then this violet is really something coming to us from the spiritual world. This is the dove that brings a real message from the spiritual world. Students must experience something like a turning around of their own eye before they can have this experience. And now students themselves must give form and shape to everything that comes to them from the spiritual world. There is something that can give us a support on this difficult path, which is so full of self-denial the rose cross we should carry in our souls. A recognizing mark of what the spiritual world gives us is that everything that appears as a symbol is not immediately understood by students. They must allow these symbols to work on their souls for days, often for weeks, in silence, filled with self-denial. They must do this with total peace and calm in their souls without desires, without wishes. Then, at a certain moment, one turns around, so to speak, and suddenly understands what the symbol wanted to say to one. We let it work long enough in the soul as a force, and we are silent and wait. Patience, endurance, silence oneself. The esoteric equipment of a student should be this, that the student's soul lives in trust that it will be given what it needs, In the peaceful calm of the soul, the confidence lives that the student will receive at the right time the right instruction from the teacher. The student must say to him or herself again and again, I will not be able to be a participant in the spiritual world until I have learned to say to myself that I am full of egotism and I cannot be anything else here in the physical world. However, the part of me that lives here in the physical world is only a picture, a form, a reflection of my archetype. This form, this picture, is entirely permeated by egotism. And it is the karma of the world that permeates us in our course of evolution through the incarnations. However, the karma of the world is God. God also lives in us. And when we advance to the point where we act for the good and noble, then it is God in us who drives us to it. And the God in us who causes us to act for the good and noble lives in our archetype. I myself am full of egotism, but I am foreordained to become a reflection of my divine archetype. This archetype rested in the bosom of God and it has descended into this physical form. And this form stands under the power of God, who stands over my destiny, my karma, which is entirely permeated by egotism. Never, never must I say that I am without egotism, for it is never true. Without egotism, I could not even exist on the physical plane. However, When I learn to look up to my God-given archetype, when I allow my thinking, feeling and willing, all my soul forces entirely to die into this archetype, then I am allowed to hope to overcome the egotism in myself and again approach my archetype. We will also notice 
that in the same measure that we become less egotistical, we also become stronger physically. We will notice that we no longer feel fear or shock. We will no longer flinch in sudden fright. We will become powerful and strong in our whole human existence. If we rightly understand the genuine, ancient, esoteric Rosicrucian verse, then we say E-D-N. Here the knowing essence of the human being goes to what is unspeakable, the creative word. Then the feeling returns and one can repeat, I blank am. That is, we allow our egotism to die into Christ and resurrect to new forces of life through Christ's power of love. In blank Morimer. Thus one speaks this mantra esoterically. And its meaning lights up for us. The God of my destiny releases me through this that I die into him in blank more and more. The end of that esoteric lesson and the end of this second section of the book up to page 86. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 266, Part 2, second of three volumes in that number, uh, entitled Esoteric Lessons, 1910-1912, to translated by James Hines. This section 3 that we're on now is covering pages 87 to 131 in the book. Esoteric Lesson, given in Kassel on December 3rd and 4th, 1910. Notes from Wilhelm Hüberschleiden. Esoteric lesson exercises are the technique of the spiritual life. Maya equals Maha Aya. Ya or Ye equals being. A equals negation. Maha Aya thus, great not being. We have become inhabitants of earth only through the influence of Lucifer and Araman. Otherwise our eyes, capital, would have remained in spiritual regions and guided our bodies on the surface of the earth from those regions. Despite the fact that Lucifer and Araman battle against the direct workings of the Divine Spirit, they are intended by the Spirit, because only through such resistance does the eye arrive at a complete physical objectification. If Araman did not exist, we would not see at all the green of the plants as such, but only the spiritual being represented by the plant. An individual plant is like a hair on the body of the earth, so to speak. Our egotism arises only through Lucifer and Araman. However, it is necessary that these beings live in us and come to full expression, for only in this way can all life be completely physically formed. But we must become aware that all our actions have a selfish nuance. Our compassion drives us to help because we simply do not like feeling the suffering of others. There is no point in the infinity of space that does not have force. All human etheric brains of differ more than the leaves of a tree. The luminous points in a brain are like a photograph of the heavens full of stars. The effects of Atma, Buddhi, and Manas are formed in the human eye, E-Y-E. And there's a symbol of a triangle with an eye in the center of it. This symbol works on us in the night too. We should keep the chaotic impressions of the day away as much as possible. We should also refrain from chatting or speaking casually about theosophy during our daily acts, such as while eating. It should be a sacred matter.
End of Esoteric Lesson Esoteric Lesson given in Munich on December 11, 1910 Record A, Manuscript from Mathilde Scholl, Barbara Wolf, Amelie Fugger Glett. Record B, Manuscript from Alice Kinkle. Record A. We have often spoken in our esoteric lessons about the paths that esotericists had to follow in the ancient mystery schools. At that time, human beings and their soul and spiritual characteristics were turned inside out, so to speak, turned around relatively more quickly by means of certain methods, because human souls and bodies back then were more robust than now. They had stronger souls, and because the soul is the architect of the physical body, the physical body was also stronger. This was at a time earlier than our historical research can reach. Humanity at that time was altogether less complicated, more unified. It came forth from the bosom of the Godhead, and its task is, after gradually losing its ancient clairvoyance, to raise itself again to divinity on its path through matter by taking up the Christ impulse and filled with it uniting again with God. Because of constantly increasing materialism, human beings have become gradually weaker in spirit, soul, and body. One can no longer subject the more delicate constitutions now to the kinds of trials imposed upon students in the ancient mystery schools. Back then work was done in the first instance to eliminate two traits that those to be initiated in their instability soon learned to know and set aside, egotism and fear. With our usual concepts of the physical plane, we cannot judge at all what egotism really is. Those to be initiated were put to sleep. Then their souls were shown in the spiritual world what they had achieved up till then. The I capital was absorbed by the macrocosm, and they noticed that they were nothing. Of course, this standing before nothingness as before a dark abyss stirred up their feelings of fear, which they had to move beyond. They came forth from these trials, either useless for external life, because they fully understood the knowledge that everything transitory is futile, or they remained strong and resolved to use this incarnation as much as possible to evolve further and one day come to know the higher worlds. A modern person could not be handled in such a robust way. It is already a lot for people of today when they say that the ground under their feet is swaying. The entire striving of modern people is to stand firmly. They do not wish to make a leap, but rather move forward at a slow pace. Esotericists, however, must make a leap over the abyss. They should allow the ground to slip away. For when they want to penetrate into the spiritual world, the concepts they have formed here on the physical plane will help them absolutely not at all. They are not allowed to take any of those concepts with them across the threshold. There is one thing alone they are allowed to keep, the ability to form concepts, a sense for truth and logic. The capacity for forming new concepts and a sense for the new truths they will learn. The masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings send us a comparison so that we can understand this matter. It is as though we were to see all the objects in our room in a mirror and then were to go around behind the mirror in order to discover reality there. We would see that there is nothing behind the mirror. It is the same with our concepts in higher worlds. Here, we must allow concepts about the higher worlds to flow into us from higher beings. These concepts must work on us so that we form such concepts for ourselves. When we have then acquired some for ourselves with earnest and honest work, then we must again step before the mirror, make a bold decision, and 
shatter it. Then a darkness, a gaping nothingness will again face us. But when we steadily endure this, then a light will appear for us in the darkness, and an entirely new world will be revealed. Our esoteric work consists in this, that we gradually raise the astral body and etheric body into spiritual heights. In this way, however, the lower part of the two bodies remains behind in the physical body. Now the I, capital, plays a peculiar role between these two parts that have been torn apart. Because of the fact that we had been so anchored in the material world, the I is chained to the lower parts and is their slave, so to speak. In this way, peculiar phenomena appear. The astral body, now left alone, might have some sort of vice, which we might have mastered easily earlier, when its better part was still connected with it. This astral body now finds such vices growing boundlessly, and the human being appears to him or herself as a totally dissolute person. If the eye were united with the higher parts, then from there it could rule over the lower, and thereby over all drives, desires, and passions. Then the higher parts would also not be unconscious as they are when the eye is in the lower. Because of the fact that the higher part leaves, the lower bodies often become weak. Then the physical body also inclines toward illness. But this is a transitory condition. For when the higher parts have obtained enough strength from the higher worlds, they will again work upon the lower to harmonize and make them healthy. Esotericists must simply say with such irregular phenomena in their lower bodies, I will stand firm. Through thick and thin, I will go my way to the Spirit, whatever may come to meet me. If they remain anchored against their mistakes, then they will also master them. Art should be an aid in these battles. True art was given to us for this purpose. Any art that does not elevate us must perish. It cannot endure. It is not true art. When artists have recognized the mission of art, when art is permeated by theosophy, then it will become what it should be. When the gods created human beings, they gave us weaknesses too, so that we could test our strength on them. For this reason we should be thankful also for our weaknesses, because fighting them makes us strong and free. But for that reason we must never for a moment love them. We could never have thanked such gods as might have created us pure and perfect, for they would have made us weaklings at the same time. And we should say to ourselves, even if the world were full of devils, we, nevertheless, have our origin in God, ex Deo Nasimor. When we earnestly battle and strive without letting up to enter the spiritual world, then we will feel how the lower, the error-prone part of us dies away, in Cristo Morimor. And then we will awaken in higher worlds consciously, Per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. There is an exoteric version and an esoteric version of this verse. Used esoterically speaking, the most holy name can cause earthquakes, storms and thunder, powerful events in nature, if the speaking happens unworthily. For our thoughts, even our hidden thoughts, have a destructive effect in the spiritual worlds if they are false. That is what is meant where it says in the Rosicrucian Mysteries that the gods must often break worlds in order to repair the damage that we human beings have done. Therefore the esoteric version of the verse is ex deonasimur in blank morimur per spiritum sanctum revivissimus End of Record A Record B Manuscript from Alice Kinkel an esotericist must acquire entirely different concepts. As an example for this change in concepts, 
the masters have said we must see our task as a mirror that we have to break through. Esotericism must tear apart our entire being, and we must take the etheric body, astral body, and I, and an extract of our physical body, above with us, everything that has been purified. The lower part of our being we leave behind below in all three bodies, which are then left to themselves. And if the physical body is not carefully watched, this separation of the higher from the lower brings about disease or weakness in the physical body. The body becomes especially susceptible to the diseases of the current age. In the etheric body our memory is lost. In the astral body the passions are strengthened. This can be intensified to the point of dissolute behavior because of this split in the human being. Clear thoughts and feelings are realities in the spiritual world, and the expression is true that says, quote, the gods must break worlds, and so forth, close quote. Consideration of the Rosicrucian verse exoterically and esoterically. Egotism in everyday life is something entirely different from egotism in the spiritual world. Physical life is simply not possible without egotism. An esotericist must acquire positivity and self-possessed composure. Blasphemy of God is denial of the wisdom of the world. It is denial of all that encounters us. We should be grateful to the gods for our mistakes because a stronger power is formed through overcoming mistakes. The end of the esoteric lesson. Next esoteric lesson given in Hanover, December 17th and 18th, 1910. Notes from Emily Hübner, and this is a very short one. It begins with E, English sound long E, leads to the divine within. A, revelation of the divine. A, leading upward to the divine. O, enclosing the revealed form. E, expresses the incomprehensible form, withdraws before shy reverence. U, divine peace, rest. A, overcoming difficulties. Knowledge of the world, macrocosm. Self-knowledge, microcosm. This is a reflection of the archetype. End of Esoteric Lesson Esoteric Lesson, Berlin, December 20th, 1910 Origin of Manuscript Unknown From the Freda Collection Esoteric Lesson exercises are the technique of the spiritual life. Ordinary human beings have their physical and etheric bodies bound closely together. When they use their physical bodies, whether in raising a hand or in thinking, they set the corresponding part of the etheric body in motion at the same time. This should become different for an esotericist. The connection should become looser. Human beings have a backbone that is connected to the brain and the sense organs. When we meditate, we create in the etheric body a front bone, in quotes which is the series of lotus flowers that lie behind the sternum. The human being will no longer have a sternum in the seventh post-Atlantean age. By means of the loosening of the physical and etheric bodies mentioned above, the human being now becomes able to heal his or her own wounds faster, and so forth. On the other hand, weaknesses of the physical body can appear that had remained hidden at first, because of the close connection between etheric and physical. Without any exaggeration, one should not pay particular attention to all these little pains and sufferings. It will all pass. In the transition time of this loosening, one can certainly feel unwell. Simply studying theosophy brings about this loosening already although scientific development makes the connection between etheric and physical bodies even stronger. Thus, through meditation, 
the etheric body acquires the inclination to separate from the physical body. This can be strengthened by means of an appropriate diet. Through diet, it is the other way around. The physical body gets the tendency to expel the etheric body. This is an aid that brings about exactly what is wrong, unless it is supplemented with esoteric exercises. If that happens, then the physical body expels the etheric body, with the etheric body having developed sense organs. Then one is blind and sees only one's own fantasies. As our sheaths undergo changes in this way, our connection with the macrocosm is also changed. This connection must be cultivated in the right way, otherwise harm results, not only in the human being but in the entire universe. For example, if someone in an inappropriate society were to speak the holy, unspeakable name, something worse than earthquakes and volcanic outbreaks would be conjured up over the entire region. Therefore, there is an enormous difference in how the Rosicrucian verse is spoken, whether with a name that is merely a pseudonym for the highest spiritual being, or without this name. Only the last way of speaking the verse is an esoteric way. End of Esoteric Lesson Esoteric Lesson given in Stuttgart, Christmas to New Year's Eve, 1910 Summary of Two Lessons Notes from Günther Wagner Our esoteric feeling of responsibility must be increased. We must acquire theosophical conscientiousness. It is seldom to be found today outside in the world. Example 1. A man who wanted to write a long book and also wanted to absorb something concerning theosophy asked Dr. Steiner to tell him his opinion about it because he had no time to concern himself with it. Number two, an American summarized the lectures he heard here by Dr. Steiner as much as he understood them and published them as a book in America. We must acquire theosophical tact and speak about the esoteric school and so forth only when it is appropriate. Never speak about esoteric matters while eating. Our physical bodies have grown together very closely with our etheric bodies. A loosening is possible in two ways. One on exoteric paths with external exercises and vegetarian food. Number two on esoteric paths through training, meditations and so forth. The first works on the astral body and the second works on the etheric so that it is loosened. One could say that through meditation, concentration, and so forth, a frontal spinal cord of the lotus flowers is created as a counterpart to the physical spinal cord. This is what is proper, so that no injury can occur to the physical body. If, on the other hand, only external means are used, then a loosening of the etheric body will occur without its being strengthened by meditation, or the introduction of theosophical truths. The consequence must be illness of the physical body, or if the etheric body has also been loosened from the physical brain, then confusion and so forth will occur. End of Esoteric Lesson Esoteric Lesson given in Stuttgart on December 31st, 1910 Manuscripts from Matilda Scholl and Barbara Wolf. Esotericists should bring clearly to their consciousness what they are actually doing with the exercises that have been given to us. We have often spoken about the fact that the striving of an esotericist is intended to loosen the etheric body and altogether to loosen the four bodies with respect to each other. Now this can happen in two ways, an exoteric and an esoteric. One can cause the physical body to expel the etheric body, to squeeze it out by sufficiently preparing the physical body through diet, breathing exercises, and so forth. Fundamentally speaking, our vegetarian way of life has the purpose only of supporting the physical body in this effort. 
This is an exoteric means of loosening the bodies. The esoteric means are our meditation exercises. And here it must be said that this is the main thing, that we must carry out our exercises with devotion and earnestness, that everything else should only be a support for this main thing. In our materialistic age, there are many who, in their materialistic longing, would follow the most detailed dietary instructions and would do breathing exercises for hours if they could thereby achieve something. However, striving spiritually by means of meditations and concentration exercises is much less pleasant, and often only this reveals the spiritual lethargy present. But if we squeeze out the etheric body through physical influences alone, then the physical body would not be able to give the etheric body anything, and it would step out into the unknown empty-handed. Then certain mental states appear. For example, we would not be able to properly take hold of something with our thinking when we want to think our way through something. With the etheric brain, we would be unable to make proper use of the physical brain because we would not be properly incarnated in it. It would be as though we were swimming in water and wanted to grasp something that always slips away from us. Reasonable esotericists in such a condition would say to themselves that they must first of all create order here through suitable will, concentration, and thought exercises. Also, in normal development, some things will occur that we must say are a passing tribulation. The withdrawal of the etheric body has much the same significance for the physical body as the temporary loss of fluids has for a plant. It dries out. And the physical body also dries out in part, although it is not visible physically. And where the physical body has a disposition toward illness, it will come forth. But when the physical body has been permeated by spiritual truths, it draws from them new strength, and this in turn brings health to the physical body. One can observe that even cuts in the physical body heal faster, and wounds altogether heal faster, when we are permeated by spiritual truth. Indeed, when we just allow theosophical modes of thought to work in us. To begin with, we are working on the astral body with our meditations. This astral body is architect of the nervous system that proceeds to the spinal cord, or, as one says today, proceeds from it. Now, in the etheric body, we are to achieve an imprint from the astral body that is developed as lotus flowers, which are connected to one another, and in this way create a, quote, frontal cord, Close quote, so to speak. This frontal cord is, of course, present only in the etheric and astral realms and can be formed only through meditation and concentration. For this reason, they are the most important part of our esoteric development. And the only thing that is directly injurious for an esotericist is the consumption of alcohol. In any case, alcohol must always be avoided. It is, of course, good for us to support the process with a vegetarian diet because this lifting out of the etheric body is not at all easy today. Many of our modern-day professions are directly set up to drive the etheric body firmly into the physical body. Thus it can often directly cause pain to clairvoyants when they see something like that. Also, the food that is served today in our great hotels is entirely prepared so as to drive the etheric body firmly into the physical body. Through esoteric work on ourselves, we should acquire a new way of thinking, feeling, and willing. When we have boldly taken the courage to walk the path of an esotericist, we must say to ourselves that we must, quote, jump over an abyss, close quote. Once we have thought through a thought, we must pass it through our feeling and 
permeate it entirely with our feeling so that we do not say something lightly, something that we have not actually grasped in its depths. A sentence that we can so often hear people say today, which is abused in its applications as few others, is, quote, I am a Christian, close quote. Esotericists should be clear that, quote, being a Christian, close quote, is a distant, distant ideal toward which they must constantly strive. To live as a Christian means, above all, to accept with serenity whatever destiny may bring us, to never complain about the work of the gods, to accept with joy whatever they may send. It means that the saying, quote, look at the birds in the sky, they do not sow, they do not reap, they do not gather into barns, and yet they receive what they need, close quote, becomes second nature in us. Accept with gratitude what is given to us. Then we are living according to this verse. If we do not do this, then the verse becomes blasphemy in our mouths. Altogether, it should be clear to us that if we do not sufficiently prepare ourselves for the leap over the abyss into the spiritual world, we would per- perpetrate so much damage that the divine worlds would have to shatter in order to repair this damage. For what is ruined must be destroyed in order to be built anew. We have emerged from the Spirit, ex deonasimer, and when we make the leap over the abyss, we express that with in Christo morimer, with firm confidence that we will live again on the other side in the Holy Spirit, per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. And because we should keep the name of the Most Holy Being, who has always been connected with our earthly evolution, so holy that we do not speak it unworthily, there is an esoteric version of the Rosicrucian verse, in which the name is not spoken. Ex Deo Nasimer, in Morimu, per Spiritum Sanctum Revivissimus. The end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric Lesson, given in Stuttgart on January 1, 1911. Record A, Manuscript from Marie Steiner. Record B, Manuscript from Camilla Wandry. Record C, Manuscript from Nelly Lichtenberg. Record A, Maha Aya, The Great Not Being. E, Existence. A, forming oneself, I am becoming aware of oneself. The Word works to educate and restore health. Morning and evenings as prayer for the benefit of children and the ill. To battle against ambition, vanity, arrogance, think on the teachings of theosophy. Envy, jealousy, think on a beautiful work of art. Chattiness, curiosity, anger, irritation, a quarter hour of quiet daily. Record B. A famous inscription, the Delphic A, this is the English vowel sound long A with the diphthong E sound at the end dropped, stood above the gate to the temple at Delphi. It means you are. Second person of the present indicative of the verb to be. Plutarch said that it was the greeting of the divinity on behalf of those who entered the temple. The Delphic sound A signified the number five, or half of the zodiac, that is, the five ascending signs. The Delphic A is also the anchor of the Seleucids. It was taken over by the Gnostics in order to signify the Savior and is often found among talismans and amulets of early Christians. Readers aside, now there are some symbols here. I'm unclear on them. I'm going to pronounce them as I see fit. Uh, Apologize. End of readers aside. Maha'aya. Ah, existence. E-A, inwardly ensouled existence. Aya, non-existence, 
abolishes again. Maha, great powerful. Mahaaya, great non-existence, illusion. CH, diffusion. IN, inner reflection. IACHEN, creative word that calls the spiritual beings in the world, works to heal, warm inwardly, gives strength. End of record B, record C. Mahaaya, A equals existence. Ya equals inwardly and sold existence. Aya equals non existence, abolishes it again. Maha equals great existence. Maha Aya equals contracted to Maya the great non existence, illusion. CH equals dispersion. IN equals inner reflection. Iachen equals creative word that calls spiritual beings in the world, works to warm inwardly. End of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Stuttgart on January 2nd, 1911. Notes from the collection of Fred Puppig. One must take the esoteric life seriously. For this reason, an esoteric hour must always be something holy. One should never accept it as something routine, All were certainly not aware of the necessary earnestness when they were asked to join the esoteric circle. However, now they should become increasingly conscious of this necessity and strive for a connection with the spiritual worlds so that they do not fall back into the everyday world. We are to consider the exercises that have been given us as coming from the Masters, esotericists, should attend to themselves and their feelings. Especially they should look at what concerns their self-knowledge. Most people, and we certainly belong among them, indulge in great illusions when it comes to themselves. We must attend especially to egotism. We often fool ourselves that we have done something selfless, or also we may feel jealousy and hatred toward someone to whom, as an esotericist, we must tell the, in quotes, truth, and that we are not permitted to allow this or that from him. As soon as feelings like this arise in us, we should imagine that we are subject to great illusions, whose deeper cause always arises from egotism. Feelings like this always express themselves with a feeling of warmth that flows through the etheric body, indeed the part that we call the warmth ether and then through the blood, and it works on the physical body. Feelings of this kind always have a deleterious effect on the human being and world evolution. The hierarchies who are charged with guiding karmic connections then work in such a way that they employ certain beings that destroy certain constructive effects in us, And in this way, these beings also work destructively in the soul and indirectly into the body. These are luciferic beings who have been entrusted with this task. This, then, is their work upon us. Correct self-knowledge through insight into our own base nature will permeate us with a cold, icy feeling in place of the feeling of warmth mentioned above, which satisfies us so. Everything that gives us satisfaction from our sensations and so forth expresses itself as the feeling of warmth described above, as opposed to this feeling of cold that enters with true knowledge of the self. These luciferic beings who approach a pupil destructively in this way are revealed to a clairvoyant a certain multitude whose leader is Samaya, These beings, which are in no way similar to human beings, are always perceptible to the eye, E-Y-E, of the spirit. If we have a feeling of disgust upon waking, as is often the case, especially with esoteric pupils, then such a feeling is almost always attributable to egotism, which often lies unrecognized, deep in unconscious depths of soul. Furthermore, we must direct our attention to everything connected with untruthfulness. Indeed, because of upbringing, 
we may never speak any blatant falsehood. Nevertheless, we always have a tendency to want to appear better than we really fundamentally are. Or, when it is a matter of life and death to admit the truth, we rather remain silent and conceal the truth. All of this also has an injurious effect on world evolution, and thereby works destructively on a human being. The effects of such untruthfulness work on the astral body, then on the etheric body, indeed upon the part we call the light ether. From here such injurious influences affect the physical body, especially the nervous system. The luciferic beings connected with this, whose leader is Azazel, are revealed to a clairvoyant as looking similar to a human being, usually as a head with the wings of a raven. Those who incline toward untruthfulness will usually be able to sense a choking, scratching feeling in their throat. They also often have the feeling as if they were being pinched with pliers and tortured by a thousand arms. Everyone who perceives him or herself with exactness will then notice how deeply he or she is still tangled in lies and dissembling. Furthermore, it is important to become aware of a certain indifference and insensitivity to spiritual worlds and influences. Many esotericists listen to an esoteric lesson, yet what is presented finds no echo in them. They cannot lift themselves up spiritually out of their usual daily life to give themselves to spiritual thoughts. Others do so only out of curiosity. They have the intention to see something in the spiritual worlds and then blindly start off meditating without wanting to devote themselves to a regular study because that is too much trouble. This has an injurious effect on the eye, capital, and then from there into the astral body, then further on the etheric body and indeed on the part we refer to as the chemical ether and from chemical ether into the secretions and glands of the physical body. There is a difference between the relationship that esotericists have with these luciferic multitudes and the relationship non-esotericists have with them. For example, Azazel and his multitude constantly want to bring forth only good effects in non-esotericists, since they bring about only supplementary effects and are not injurious to health. However, esoteric pupils are required constantly to be conscious of their complete responsibility for themselves and the world. For this reason, a dull esotericist will have a slight feeling of drowning when walking in the morning. Indeed, the more he or she has surrendered him or herself to the usual life of the senses during the day. Therefore, esotericists should constantly watch over themselves, and it will not hurt if they sometimes become melancholic brooders. Only in this way will they understand what is brought to us at the conclusion of every esoteric lesson by the Masters. Quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body. In my body lies the seed of the spirit. End of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Berlin, January 17, 1911. Record A, author of Manuscript Unknown. Record B, notes from Günter Wagner. Record C, manuscript from Camilla Vandri. Additional record, author unknown. Record A. In our meditations, we have given the techniques of our esoteric life. These consist in this, that we allow thoughts to work upon us and awaken sensations and feelings that are not taken from the physical plane. All thoughts are of two kinds, those that are awakened in us by perception of the physical plane and those such as are given to us by theosophy. Everything in the physical world is maya, including our physical body. How is it that this world is actually present? What do the planet, stones and animals around us consist of? Through the fact that higher beings formulated a thought millions and millions of years ago and then thought these things again and again. 
These things follow the principle expressed in the old st- saying, quote, steady drops hollow the stone, close quote. The same thoughts reinforce one another and finally create the physical object. The harder the stone is, the longer it is thought, in quotes, upon. Our physical body is also nothing other than the thought of many different higher th- beings. When we think only the usual thoughts of the physical plane, they're not actually thoughts, but rather mirror images, the illusion of a thought. For everything in the physical world has already been thought a long time ago. We are doing nothing more than repeating those thoughts, and improperly at that. For example, when someone hears a bell sounding, the tone from the bell isn't anything real, but rather the situation is as follows. What a bell is was thought out millions of years ago. So too what constitutes our brain was thought out millions of years ago. The interaction between tone and brain creates the sound that we hear. All physical thoughts are unfruitful and will have a destructive effect as time passes. They put the astral body into a certain vibration but that was already planted in us by higher beings. Anyone who never thinks non-sensorially never brings new forms into the astral body. What happens in the astral body works back upon the etheric body, but the etheric body is so constituted that it is designed to absorb new thoughts and forms. The old forms bring destruction into it, and from there also on the physical filaments of our nervous system. In sleep, all that must be built up again. The astral body is then inserted into the higher hierarchies for a time, and thereby gets strengthened again. The etheric body is separated from the astral body, and is thereby regenerated. Without sleep, the human being could not live very long. But thoughts that are not derived from the senses have an effect that is fructifying and upbuilding. Because of those thoughts, the human being is counted in the ranks of the hierarchies. They build new forms, the lotus flowers, into the astral body. For this reason, it is necessary to repeat a meditation hundreds of times. The mental pictures that we make for ourselves from theosophical teachings for thinking about something is also meditation, will not at first be entirely free of the world of the senses. For example, when it is said that old Saturn was a sphere of warmth, that the music of the spheres sounds forth in Devakan, then this will at first be imagined in sensory images, similar to the warmth in our blood, as a beautiful symphony and the like. However, As the thought is constantly repeated, the sensory element that still adheres to it will fall away by itself, and then the supra-sensory remains. The most sense-free thoughts in the world are mathematical, but even when modern human beings think triangle, they think it with color and a certain thickness, not abstractly enough. However, we come closer to supra-sensory thoughts when we attain to relationships. Remembering a sound is still a memory of something sensory. Remembering a melody is already something more, for it consists of a relationship between tones, which does not belong to the world of the senses. Or imagine a villain, and standing nearby another villain, or even two good people standing near one another, and one villain is a greater villain than the other or one good person is better than the other. Then in this relationship there lies something that is not in the physical sensory world, something that leads us up into the spiritual world. When we think of or see a villain, then we are affected in an unpleasant way. But when we see two villains next to each other, the worst villain will please us more than the less evil villain because greatness always attracts. The effect of Shakespeare's various dramas is based on this fact, for example. 
For this reason, it is so important for us to observe and study relationships in the external world, for this leads us away from the sensory world. Another way to become free of the senses in our thinking consists in this, that we allow processes to unfold in reverse order. For example, saying the Lord's Prayer backward or the reversed retrospective of our meditations. We improve our memory only in this way. Memory has diminished enormously in the last four to five centuries and that will be the case even more in the future if people do not now take hold of the opportunities that are offered to improve it. The time for these opportunities is especially favorable now. Later, they will simply not exist. Then memory will become something other than simply waiting to see if the content wants to appear out of some dark corner. It will be a kind of probing toward the past, like sending out feelers that reach for the past as if it were something real. The present time is now especially favorable for this development and for esoteric development. So we see how the body is maya. Thoughts come from beings who are again themselves thoughts. The thought thinks the thought. This is a sentence for meditation of the highest significance. It is not the brain that thinks, not the etheric or astral body, but rather thought itself thinks thoughts. That is also what clearly emerges from our verse, quote, in the spirit lay the seed of my body. End of record A. Record B. Steady drops hollow a stone. The hierarchies have again and again, periodically, held firmly to the same thoughts. That is, they have perfected further the same thoughts, and in this way work creatively. Thus our entire body and we ourselves were created through thought, actually nothing more than thoughts. Thinking about what already exists is never creative but rather destructive for the nerves and also for the etheric body, the actual organ for our advancing evolution. The disruptive effects of the astral body go into the etheric body during the day. The physical and the etheric body must be creatively restored in the night when they are freed from the astral body. Thoughts. So too the astral body is restored itself. Only when we think supra-sensory content do we ourselves work creatively as a human hierarchy and create lotus flowers through hundred and thousand-fold repetition. Then we are also imprinting the etheric body as the hierarchies would. Although the meditative images are taken from the sensory world, they are stripped of the sensory content through constant deepening and repetition. Already the relationships between sensory things and between good and bad people, even the reversal of a time sequence during the evening retrospection, help toward sensory free thought. Immersion in, quote, thought thinks the thoughts, close quote. We should use the present era for ascending upward. The times do not always offer such an opportunity. The end of record B. Record C. The hierarchies have concentrated periodically on the same thoughts again and again. Parenthesis, constant thoughts consolidate and strengthen what lives in wavering appearances. Close parenthesis. The hierarchies elaborate and perfect the same thoughts further and further. In this way they are creative. Thus the various bodies and the spiritual and soul substance that live in those bodies have been created by this thinking of the gods. Actually, they are nothing more than the thoughts of the gods. The thinking that we do with the help of the brain is not creative. 
Rather, it is destructive for the nerves as well as for the etheric body, which is actually the organ for advancing evolution. During the day, it is injured by the destructive effects of the astral body. During the night, the physical and etheric bodies must be freed from this destructive influence of the astral body and restored again by creative thoughts. So too the astral body itself. Only when we feel ourselves to be the hierarchy of human beings, that is, when we think thoughts of the greater world, only then do we ourselves not have a destructive effect, but rather creative through thousand-fold repetition of such lofty thoughts with content as is given to us in meditation, do we create. To begin with, we create the lotus flowers. Then we also are imprinting the etheric body as the hierarchies would. The meditations contain images and words that are taken from the sensory world, to be sure. Yet through constant immersion and repetition that penetrate behind the words and images to the hidden essences, the words and images are stripped of their sensory elements. And when we penetrate far enough to rest in the essences that are hidden in the depths of the words and images, then, by means of meditation, we come into another world. Immersing oneself in the thought, quote, thought thinks thoughts, close quote, helps us achieve this. Knowledge is always addressed as light, wisdom addressed as a kind of fluid element, water, in parentheses, occult. The end of record C. Here is a supplement added by the German editor. What is meant by this last sentence, quote, wisdom addressed as a kind of fluid element, water, a cult, is presented in greater detail in notes from a lecture on May 24, 1905 in Berlin, Collected Works, Volume 323a. If we want to acquire a real picture of four-dimensional space, we must carry out very specific exercises in imagination. First, we form a very clear and deepened perception of water. Such a perception is difficult to arrive at. We must immerse ourselves very exactly in the nature of water. We must, quote, climb into, close quote, water, so to speak. The second thing we must do is achieve a perception of the nature of light. Of course, we know what light is, but only in the way that we receive it from outside. By means of meditation, we can get an inner counter-image of light, know where light comes from, and then for that reason bring forth light ourselves. Those people who allow pure concepts to work on their souls meditatively can do it, those who can think free of the senses. Then the whole surrounding world opens for them as flooding light then they must chemically combine, so to speak, the perception of water that they have formed with that of light. This water entirely permeated by light is a body that alchemists called mercury. Alchemical mercury, however, is not ordinary quicksilver. First, we must awaken in ourselves the capacity to generate mercury from the idea of light. Mercury, the power of water permeated by light, is what we position ourselves to possess. That is one element of the astral world. The second thing arises when we create for ourselves a clear visual perception of the air, and then, through a spiritual process, we draw out of this perception the power of air unite this power with feeling within ourselves. Then you enkindle thus the idea of heat fire. Then you get fire air. So one element is drawn out, the other is produced by you yourself. 
This air and fire the alchemists called sulfur, luminous fire air. In truth, you have in the watery element the matter of which it was said, quote, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Close quote. And here's another quote. Water is water and remains water. Water is water and remains water. From the heaven of the wise, water rains down. The stone of the wise weeps the water of tears. But the world does not value water of this kind. Its fire burns in water and lives in water. Make water from fire. Cook fire in water. And you will have fiery water, like highly salted sea water. Your child is living water. If body and soul are consumed in water, it becomes stinking, green, foul, blue like heavenly water. Digest, calcinate, dissolve, and putrefy the water. Seek the philosopher's fourfold permanent water. And if it is made well, art becomes water. Close quote, end of that additional record. Another additional record. There is another write-up whose author is unknown. However, the text is, as, is of such questionable quality that it is given here only for the sake of completeness. The alchemical secret says to the human being, quote, achieve for yourself the light permeated power of water. Close quote. This is a picture for the higher consciousness that is attained through initiation. Human beings learn to add to what they can learn from their senses externally about things. They learn to experience the inner being of things. And gradually they advance from the mere concept that one forms of a thing to the essence that once creatively formed this thing to the divine idea. And that then becomes true reality. Thus one grasps the difference between today's understanding and intellect and the creative powers in the world. Inner wisdom that has sunk into the darkness of the unconscious continues working in the human being in dreamless sleep. And the task of the esotericist is to lift up this inner wisdom into the sphere of consciousness. For this reason human beings have received the self, the I capital. This is the I consciousness, the I am, that every human being once was, before it was poured into the human being by that collective being that we have symbolized as water. Divine beings had it. Human beings received it after it was embodied. Here we have the difference between what we call in Christianity the Holy Spirit and the Spirit itself. This is the Holy Spirit who is above with divine beings, before whom the embodiment took place, and Spirit itself who is embodied in individual human beings. The Holy Spirit is a unity and also is individualized in individual human beings. Separation, individualization always has something to do with egotism, joining together, flowing together in love, uniting. All have their archetype in the Holy Spirit. E-D-N. End of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Cologne, January 31st, 1911. Manuscript from Alice Kinkle. The Essence of Meditation. Meditation has two sides. Number one, a technical side. Number two, a side that is carried into life. That is, the way in which we think, feel, and act is changed by means of proper meditation. Patience and conscientiousness are necessary when practicing meditation. What do we do when we meditate? We imitate what divine spiritual beings and the highest hierarchies did millions and millions of years ago. Deeds that gave rise to our earth. 
Everything around us is condensed divine thought. Following the motif, quote, steady drops hollow out the stone, close quote, these spiritual beings were thinking rhythmically. What they thought about, often and in short rhythmic cycles, became hard earthly substance, diamond, for example. Imagining things that do not exist in the physical world is creative work, not thoughts about what is already present. Quote, I am an egotist. I am not a Christian. Close quote. These are two very fruitful sentences for meditation. We must get to know ourselves as monsters. An encounter with the guardian of the threshold is an awful experience for everyone. This must be said to an esotericist. Seeing beautiful things and forms is astral maya, is Lucifer. Hearing the masters and similar things is etheric maya, is Araman. One must research what one sees and hears. Then the true shape comes into view. End of Esoteric Lesson Esoteric Lesson given in Munich on February 12, 1911. Manuscripts from Matilda Scholl, Barbara Wolf, Amelie Fugger-Glett. It is important for modern human beings to become conscious of what they are doing when they enter upon an esoteric life, of the changes that are happening to them. We have often heard there are two paths that lead us into the spiritual world one in which we descend deep within ourselves, the other in which we strive outward into the macrocosm. The forces that we seek that created us from outside, we also have within us. We seek them not because we don't have them, but because we don't recognize them within us. In theosophy, we learn of the two paths that should balance one another, for modern human beings are no longer suited to follow only one path. Both paths have their dangers, which we will discuss later, and both are difficult. The inner path we tread in our meditations, in our inspirations. The outer path we tread in imagination, and through the thorough study of theosophical teachings about the evolution of the world. Not only is our intellect developed by this study, but our feelings are also influenced. And we will notice that we have become altogether new human beings after years of thoroughly studying these ideas. Theosophy has an effect on people whether or not they are receptive to it. Modern human beings fall into two categories. Those who seek theosophy and find what they seek within it and those who have no idea what to do with it, who oppose it with animosity. Since 1879, a small group of people have grown mature enough to accept theosophical literature, but it is a small group only. While other modern people are still incapable of acquiring these teachings and consider them reveries or fantasies, or are even angered by them, The etheric bodies of people who prove to be receptive for theosophical teachings are set gently vibrating when these teachings are allowed to work on them. On the other hand, those who completely surrender to the spirit of our age, who lose themselves in externalities, have etheric bodies that expand and thin out. If such people hear of theosophical spiritual teachings, then it is as if the wind were blowing through a narrow opening in their etheric bodies. This they experience as fear that appears externally as doubt. Such people notice only the doubt, which, however, is only an expression of fear and anxiety, both of which have moved into their etheric bodies as if into a space void of air. There they make themselves noticeable as doubt in our consciousness. To begin with, we cannot help such people who behave so dismissively toward theosophy. It is better if we leave them in peace without theosophy. 
However, whenever the opportunity presents itself, we should allow theosophical ideas to gently flow to them, following the principle, quote, steady drops hollow out the stone, close quote. For we have only 400 years left approximately to make this teaching available to all people in the form of theosophy. In order for everyone to have an opportunity, those people who have resisted the ideas of theosophy in their present incarnation will be incarnated again in the next 400 years. But then, too, a corresponding number of people must be present who can properly represent theosophy. For a long time, before the event of Golgotha, human beings could tread only one path, the one leading inward. In ancient India and Egypt, people ascended into their inner being. Had they wanted to go into the microcosm, they would have lost themselves within it. They would have stood before darkness, before the void. For human beings at that time were related to each other differently. Their inner members were related to each other differently. This form of union with God extended into the Middle Ages because the human being changes only slowly. Mystics such as Meister Eckhart, Johannes Tauler and Molinos teach us the inner path and describe it in detail. Molinos speaks of five steps of deepening immersion. He teaches how we must turn away from all that is external in order to arrive within. Number one, we must turn away from everything creature-like that corresponds to our physical body. Number two, from all life that corresponds to the forces in our etheric body. Number three, from all the talents that correspond to our astral body. Number four, from our I, capital, that coincides with our fourth part. And five, that we must merge with God. However, it gradually became necessary for us to tread both paths, the inner and outer, simultaneously. For this reason, in the 11th and 12th centuries, the occult schools of the Rosicrucians appeared and taught both paths. The writer of the Apocalypse first showed us the outer path. He showed us that we must be entirely separated from our personality in order to tread this path. In a humble way, he says that on the island of Patmos he was caught up by the Spirit. This has a very specific meaning. In order to tread this external path, that is, in order to find union with the divine in the macrocosm, it is necessary for us to choose a solid point from which we concentrate ourselves. So, John, the theologian, calculated spiritually the position the stars would have on September 30th, 395, and from this point he had his visions. On September 30th, in 395, the sun was in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin, that is, in front of the constellation, and the moon was below her. We expressed this picture in one of the seven seals. This time can also be calculated exoterically. Scholars have done this and concluded that the Apocalypse was written only around this time by John Chrysostom, who was alive at the time. But in reality we are touching upon a great secret here. For the Apocalypse was, of course, written much earlier, and the writer had merely placed himself in the year 395. Both paths, of course, harbor dangers that an esotericist must watch out for. Even esotericists who absorb theosophical teachings are attacked by many doubts, for this is according to nature. Also, it is better than if they were to thoughtlessly accept everything with blind faith. But they must, of course, overcome this doubt, and their strength will thereby grow. A second danger into which esotericists can fall on this external path is instability. Every one of us who has concerned ourselves with the study of world evolution will have experienced how interests that we had previously disappear, how we can no longer hold on to anything earthly. Here the danger that lies close at hand 
is not that we become conscious of the instability, but rather that it presents itself to us in the guise of a high ideal that we must strive toward, a mission that we must fulfill. If we see through this, however, and recognize it as camouflaged instability, then we are making great progress on the right path. When descending into our inner life, there are also two dangers that threaten us. Through immersion into our own souls, we can attain a certain sensual pleasure, a feeling of comfortable ease in the divine, and thereby fall into a subtle egotism. This then leads us to turn away from everything surrounding us that ought to still interest us. The second danger is that as we penetrate into the spiritual world through our inner soul life, we interpret what comes to meet us as a revelation of the Spirit, when it may well be no more than our own feelings. Mystics of the Middle Ages did not yet have the teachings of theosophy. We do not find them among those mystics. Their union with the divine is like a neo-Buddhism. They do not yet need the external path. The verse ex Deo Nasimur, in Christo Morimur, is in mysticism also in the form, in Christ we live. The end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Strasbourg, February 19, 1911. Manuscript from Alice Kinkle Suppose we ask the leaders of the present-day esoteric Rosicrucian stream why people today should devote themselves to an esoteric life, whether it might not be better for them to say to themselves, quote, If the will of the divine spiritual world wants to allow me to enter higher worlds, then it will do this by itself, and I will therefore wait. Close quote. Then these leaders would answer, quote, You are forgetting that you as a human being on the earth are on a battlefield. Indeed, you are in the battle between the good spiritual forces against Lucifer and Araman. Both are striving to collect soldiers for their armies from the souls of human beings. Close quote. What does Lucifer want to make out of a human soul? From a one-sided point of view, he has a high, noble goal. We know that the previous incarnation of our earth was Old Moon, a cosmos of wisdom, that it was entirely permeated by wisdom. But there, one power that is now embodied on the earth was lacking, love. So too, Lucifer is entirely permeated by wisdom. But he knows love not at all. He devoted himself entirely to wisdom. He became drunk with wisdom, so to speak. And for this reason he wants to fill all beings, all children of earth, with wisdom. Therein the great temptation always lies for human beings. Lucifer, whose power lives in us, speaks to us approximately the following, You want to see into all connections and relationships. You want to know everything. Everything will become clear to you if you take me entirely into yourself. He wants to give us wisdom without love, but this leads to self-seeking wisdom. Lucifer still believes that he can win human beings as soldiers for his army, and he works hard at achieving this. Lucifer is present in all learning and knowing, in all perception. There is only one place where he cannot get to us, and that is when we are entirely immersed with devotion into our meditations, in wisdom, then we escape Lucifer. And Araman, what does Araman want? He wants to give power to human beings. Araman is a spirit who fell away even earlier. At the time of Old Sun, the archangels were human beings, but entirely different from us today. Thinking at that time was immediately translated into action. The human beings of that time were mighty beings. Thought immediately became reality. Wisdom had not yet achieved the level of Old Moon, but there was power. 
Power alone, without wisdom, leads to black magic, to darkening. We conquer Araman through the attitude that we want to devote ourselves to the world spirit. Through the desire to be the instrument of the world spirit alone and allow only the world spirit to work in us. If we do our meditation with this attitude, then we can conquer Araman. We conquer Lucifer by filling the I capital entirely with this meditative content. Lucifer can enter my astral body only, not my I. The Christ impulse is love. Love without wisdom would be very bad. An example of this would be the mother who taught her daughter like an idol and therefore could not refuse her anything. Because of this wrong-headed upbringing, the daughter became a famous mixer of poisons at the beginning of the 19th century. This same daughter's individuality is incarnated again as a black magician. She was incarnated again so quickly because such beings are spit out by the spiritual world, so to speak. Lucifer is redeemed by Christ. Human beings who take Lucifer into themselves on future Jupiter will become mighty beings, but they will experience burning of their eye in wisdom without love. On future Venus, it will then be a case of black magic, a condition that will be like spiritual drowning. In order to, for pure love to shine on Venus, it is necessary for human beings already now to have a will toward esotericism. The end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Hanover, March 5th, 1911. Record A, notes from Paula Stritzik. Record B, manuscript from Nelly Lichtenberg. Record C, manuscript from Alice Kinko. Record A, drowning, burning. Daily verse, Sunday. Two verses are given to pupils in the Rosicrucian schools to support them in the meditations. They are, Beware of drowning in your esoteric striving. Beware of burning in the fire of your own eye. Protect yourself in your esoteric striving from drowning. Protect yourself from burning up from the fire of your own eye. There are two ways to strive toward the Spirit an inner way and an outer. Everything around us is like a veil, like a covering over the spirit, which we must penetrate in order to get to the spiritual world lying behind it. But in which direction? This covering surrounds us on all sides, above, below, in front of us, behind us, to the right and left of us, and within also. All that we experience as joy and pain is like a veil, like a mist that conceals the spiritual world within us. And this is the same spiritual world that we find when we penetrate through the external covering. So that humanity can develop further and grow into the spiritual world, from time to time there always appear those who are more advanced than is normally permitted by the current stage of humanity's evolution. These people have messages for us concerning the conditions of human development that extend far into the future. Such advanced beings must exist in order to lead humanity into the future. John, who wrote the Apocalypse, was one such person. Wanting to write down a revelation of the future, he said to himself, If I write this book out of my present environment, out of all that surrounds me, it will be influenced by the self that lives in my body, by the I that was created out of, is bound by, and is connected with all that surrounds me and with all that is in me. I must free myself of all of this. He had to place himself on something like a rock that would serve him as a solid foundation, upon which he would not waver and would not be influenced by anything surrounding him or within himself that might cause him to falter. And he transported himself to the evening of September 30th, 
395, on the island of Patmos at sundown, when the sun had already disappeared below the horizon, but its effects could still be felt, and as the stars and the moon appeared. And the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin, was present above the western horizon, illuminated by the glow of the descending sun, and below it at the Virgin's feet was the moon. This picture is represented again in one of the seals, the Virgin with the radiant sun and the moon at her feet. Thus all of these seals were brought forth out of deep mystical relationships. John broke through the covering that surrounds us in the direction of the constellation Virgo. There are twelve star constellations. Seven of them are good, those represented on the seals. The other five are, more or less, dangerous. Just as John chose this particular point in time and space in order to free himself completely from himself and from all things temporal, so too Rosicrucian pupils must find solid ground in themselves. And the best way for this to happen is for us to allow theosophical teachings to work upon us. The astral body, and thereby the etheric body, becomes expanded by listening to theosophical ideas. This is the effect upon everyone who hears something about theosophy. But the effect upon those who are inclined toward theosophy is different from the effect upon those who are not so inclined. The former feel the expansion of their etheric bodies and fill them with theosophical teaching by accepting this teaching. The others feel an emptiness in their etheric bodies because they do not accept these ideas which would have filled the expansion. Then doubt and skepticism arise because of this emptiness. However, the former feel themselves being poured into the universe and they must be careful to not let themselves go too far for then they would have a feeling of hollowness of not being at home in these widths of space much like a fish that is removed from water and yet cannot live in the air because it has not yet adapted its organs to this changed element. If a theosophist devotes him or herself to the teachings of theosophy and he or she continues expanding, then he or she becomes lost in this unknown, unfamiliar element. One must be careful not to be drowned here. And this is certainly possible, that one can study theosophy earnestly, take it in and penetrate it. It is possible for one to take hold of theosophy with one's feeling, not only in thinking and willing, but also to completely permeate it with one's feeling. One can do this only with great earnestness. One must acquire a solid foundation in oneself, like John when he wanted to write the Apocalypse and set himself on the island of Patmos in the evening of September 30th, 395, at the time of sunset. Astronomically, this position of the stars, sun, Virgo, moon, on that evening can be checked and has been. Now materialistic scholarship has concluded from this that the Apocalypse was written at that time. And then we hear that scientific scholarship has ascertained this. In this way, scientific scholarship has ascertained this fact. On the inner path, one finds all the joys and sorrows, pains and bliss that live in us. But all of this is nothing more than what lives in our lower, transitory self. This whole world of desires surrounds us like a misty fog that hides the spiritual world. We must break through it to reach the spiritual world. There are forces that approach the esoteric pupils to make the fog denser. Unless we fight against it, this fog gets thicker. We must burn off this fog in order that we not burn up in the fire of our own desires. If we do not overcome this fog, if we do not set ourselves against this ever-thickening fog caused by Luciferic and Aramonic powers, then we are prisoners, as it is called 
in occultism. As a matter of fact, there are people in the present time who enter existence with great gifts and quickly attain a certain stage, but they are then completely enveloped by the adversarial powers in just such a fog and are unable to escape. This is called occult imprisonment. Our world of desires consists of nothing but egotism, and we can conquer this egotism only through deep humility. What is the thought that can lead us to overcome egotism? It is the thought that we already discussed yesterday in the exoteric lecture, the thought that we have killed the Christ. We are murderers. Yes, that is what we are. We can transform this fact, but only by allowing the Pauline saying, quote, not I, but Christ in me, close quote, to become a truth in us, to live in us. Rather than killing the divine in us through egotism in our life of desires, we should allow Christ to live within us. With awe-filled earnestness, we should approach this easy and yet so very difficult task. We have arisen out of the divine. This is expressed in the Rosicrucian verse, Ex Deo Nasimer. We should take upon ourselves all suffering, willingly, and patiently with the thought that we have killed Christ. We should devote ourselves to Him completely. We should die in Him, in Christo Mormo. Then we will be born again through the Holy Spirit. We will awake again, per Spiritum Sanctum Revivissimus. This verse sounds different when expressed exoterically rather than esoterically but the difference is found only in one word that is left out. In leaving out this word, when we refrain from speaking this word out of awe-filled reverence for the one whom this word expresses, then our feelings go to him whose name is not spoken out of deep reverence. Exoteric, ex Deo Nasimur, in Christo Morimur, per Spiritum Sanctum Revelissimus. Esoteric, Ex Deo Nasimur, in Moremur, per Spiritum Sanctum Revivissimus. In these lines is presented again how the human being has arisen out of the Spirit, how the human being was originally contained in the Spirit. Quote, in the Spirit lay the seed of my body, in my body lies the seed of the Spirit. Close quote. End of Record A. Record B. Two meditations are given to the disciple in Rosicrucian schooling to support the meditations. These are, in your esoteric striving, guard yourself against drowning. And secondly, protect yourself from burning up in the fire of your own ego. There are two paths for those who are striving esoterically, the one outward and the one inward. Something lies before our eyes like a veil, like a covering, that we must penetrate in order to get to the spiritual world lying behind it. This veil lies not just in one direction, but all around us, above, below, left, right. The veil must be penetrated in every direction, and the same veil is found on the path inward. All that we experience in terms of joy and suffering is like a fog around us that covers the spiritual world, the same spiritual world that we find when we penetrate the outer covering. So that humanity can advance toward the spiritual, there are from time to time people who are further developed than current human development would otherwise allow. They have messages to deliver concerning times that reach far into the future of human evolution. One such person was John, the writer of the Apocalypse. However, before he wrote this revelation concerning future human conditions, he said to himself, Before I can do this, I must manage to escape my present surroundings entirely, these surroundings in which I am influenced by my own self, which is connected and bound to all that surrounds me. I must get free of all of this. He had to place himself as if on a rock, 
that would serve him as a solid foundation, upon which he would not waver, upon which he could not be influenced by anything of that which surged in him and around him. So he transferred himself to the evening of September 30th, 395, at sundown on the island of Patmos. When the sun had nearly disappeared from the horizon, as the moon and the stars emerged, the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin, stood in the western sky with the radiant sun, and below at her feet was the moon. This picture of the Virgin with the radiant sun, the moon at her feet, is given again in the seal. Thus all the seals are derived from deeply mystical connections. Thus John penetrated the outer covering in this direction, in the direction of the constellation Virgo. However, there are twelve directions toward the twelve constellations. Seven of them are good, five are more or less dangerous. Just as John chose this specific place in time and space in order to free himself from himself and from everything temporal that surrounded him, so too the Rosicrucian pupil must find in him or herself a firm foothold, must find solid ground. All who hear theosophical teachings sense an effect upon their astral body and through this their etheric body. An expansion of the etheric body occurs. That is the case with everyone. But the effects vary. Those who feel themselves drawn to theosophical teachings will have their expanded etheric body filled with the content of this teaching. Those who are repelled by theosophical teachings also feel an expansion of their etheric bodies. However, because they cannot accept the ideas, emptiness arises, and through this emptiness, doubt and skepticism. Those who are permeated by theosophical teachings can sometimes become poured too far out into the universe because of their expanded etheric body. Then they have a feeling of hollowness, of not feeling at home in these widths of space, like a fish that comes onto land out of the water and cannot live there because its organs are not adapted to this environment. One is lost in this unknown place to which one is unaccustomed. One must guard against drowning. And one protects oneself from this by taking up theosophy with great earnestness, by taking hold of it with feeling, not only with thinking, but by being entirely permeated by it. One must acquire a firm foothold in oneself as John did when he wanted to write the Apocalypse. He placed himself in the evening of September 30th, 395, on the island of Patmos. This can also be checked astronomically, this arrangement of the stars, sun, Virgo, moon, and it has been checked. And from this, materialistic scholarship has concluded that the Apocalypse was written at that time. And then we are told that scholarship has verified this, thus scholarship has proven this. On the path inward, we find all the joys and suffering, pain and bliss that live in us. Yet all this belongs only to our lower, perishable self. This whole world of desires surrounds us like a fog that covers the spiritual for us. It prevents us from seeing and noticing the spiritual. We must break through it to reach the spiritual. There are powers that approach the esoteric pupil and make this fog thicker and thicker. This fog becomes increasingly dense around us. We must burn it off if it is not to burn us, if we are not to burn up in the fire of our own desires. If we do not overcome it, then we are imprisoned by Araman and Lucifer in this fog. Thus, as a matter of fact, there are people who enter life with great talents and very quickly achieve a certain level, but are then entirely enveloped by the adversarial powers. This is called being, quote, held in occult imprisonment, close quote. Our world of desires is entirely made up of egotism, and we can overcome this egotism only through deep humility. What is the thought that can lead us to overcome this egotism? 
It is the thought that we discussed yesterday in the exoteric lecture, the thought that we have killed the Christ. We are murderers. Yes, that is what we are. And all of this we can compensate for only by allowing the Pauline saying to live in us, to become truth in us, quote, not I, but Christ in me, close quote. We do not want to kill the divine in us through egotism in our life of desires, but rather allow Christ to live in us. With painful seriousness, we must attempt to carry out this easy yet difficult task. We have arisen out of the divine. This is expressed in the Rosicrucian verse EDN. We should accept all suffering willingly with the thought that we have killed Christ. We should devote ourselves to Him completely. We should die in Him. I C M. Then we should be born again through the Holy Spirit, awaken again. P S S R. This verse sounds different when spoken esoterically than when spoken exoterically, but the difference lies in just one word that is omitted. When we do not speak this word, out of awe-filled reverence for the one whom this word expresses, then our feelings go to him whose name out of deep reverence is not spoken. In this is presented again how the human being arises out of the spiritual world, how he is originally contained in the spirit as the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings say in the verse, quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body, close quote, the end of Record B. Record C. The two paths that lead us into the spiritual world. The first path is going out into the macrocosm. The experience that a person has thereby is like drowning in fear. This is especially strong for someone who has not yet been properly prepared. The second way leads down into one's own soul. This is the descent into the microcosm. It is like a burning in shame. And the end of record C, and that is the end of this section, which uh, was from pages 87 to page 131. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 266, the second of three volumes of that number, entitled Esoteric Lessons from 1910 to 1912, translated by James Hines. This is section 4, which will go from pages 132 of the book to 181. Esoteric Lesson, Mannheim, March 10, 1911. Manuscript from Alice Kinkel. The first fruit of our meditation is this, that we get a feeling for our striving to unite with the beings of the higher hierarchies. And this should express itself as a feeling of being taken up into higher worlds, of having arrived at the place where we stood at the very beginning of existence. This is how we should experience it. This feeling of being taken into the spiritual world should become warm and alive. Those who would enter the spiritual world must say to themselves that everything, everything must change for esotericists. Their concepts, feelings, and knowledge must change. Take the egotism of human beings. It is Lucifer beings who have given us memory. And while we practice thriftiness in the physical life, we are terrible spendthrifts with the powers of our soul and spirit. However, we must become thrifty with these wasted forces and transform them into powers of vision. In order to do this, we need to practice self-knowledge. From morning to evening, we scatter and waste our feelings and sensations too selfishly. 
Therefore, we must first go through egotism with our spiritual soul forces. There is a danger here for an esotericist, the danger that egotism will be strengthened. Therefore, all genuine esotericism must be accompanied by a moral and intellectual purification of the human being. We must be clear that as esotericists we are required to do the impossible and that we must strive for the impossible. All striving is precisely this, a striving for the impossible. And it is also impossible to be non-egotistical. We must attempt to have the proper feeling for all striving for inner development. Greed for knowledge and advancement is not appropriate, but rather a serious feeling for the duty to develop. This is what we should have because the Divine Spirit has put powers in us and then developed them without our involvement, but also placed active forces within us that we ourselves must develop through deeds. It is the greatest sin to oppose the Divine Spirit and not develop these forces that the Godhead placed in us for the salvation of human evolution. These forces in us are so strong that they will lead us up into the spiritual world if only after a long period of time. For this reason an esotericist should say, quote, I will wait, for I know that the powers in me lead me upward one day into the spiritual world. Close quote. These forces can do this if we are devoted in the right way to the spiritual world. The auxiliary exercises create the character traits necessary for us on the physical plane. They are control of thinking, self-chosen actions, imperturbable composure, and so forth. Gradually we will develop a chamber in our hearts, in our souls, in which we can keep our most holy soul content, where we are esotericists, while at the same time we are in external life. Battle with ourselves and with the world is, of course, inevitable. We must become fighters if we are to become esotericists. The many complaints of those who meditate that thoughts storm them and disturb them are to be answered this way. These thoughts are beings that flutter about us, that increasingly attack us. And one can only say, be happy that this is happening. This means success in meditation. It shows you that thought is a spiritual power. Courage, fearlessness and faith are the character traits that esotericists need on their path. The end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Berlin, March 15, 1911. Record A, anonymous manuscript from the Freda collection. Record B, manuscript from Nelly Lichtenberg. Notes from Paula Stritzik with addenda from Günther Wagner. Record A. As was explained the last time, January 17, 1911, our meditations should stand under the motto, quote, steady drops hollow the stone, close quote. The study of theosophical works serves as an effective preparation for the exercises. It is better to have read one work twenty-five times than to have read five books five times each. And anyone who has read a book two or three times must not imagine that he or she has read it at all. If on a specific day of the year we have experienced something specific while meditating, then on the same day, a year later, If we have really studied in the meantime, we will be able to experience much more. It is good to retain the same meditation through long periods of time. This is much better than constantly changing one's meditation. Not only should we enrich our thoughts through study, we should also develop certain feelings. We can find a starting point for understanding very deep things in simple sensations. For example, we should at some time or another become aware of what it feels like to take hold of something, say, 
an object of some kind versus what it feels like to be taken hold of, for example, by the hand. Here we can feel a clear difference. If, for example, we imagine the feeling that is stirred in us when we take hold of a snail or when a snail crawls over our hand without our knowing it. If we develop well these different feelings, then we can form a concept of the difference between the sub-sensory world and the supra-sensory world. The whole physical world with our feelings of this kind is maya or illusion. We can picture this world as a field or a plane. Above it is a supra-sensory world. Under it uh, is a subsensory world. The supra-sensory world is such that it can be brought together with a feeling of being taken hold of. The subsensory world, on the other hand, can be associated with a feeling of taking hold of something. In Rosicrucian teachings, the subsensory world was always called the elemental world. This is the world of the elements, fire, air, water, and earth. One penetrates to the element of earth by meditating on triangles, squares, pentagons, altogether on geometric figures. This should be done by writing these figures with the fingers of one hand on the palm of the other hand. Then one should drop every thought of the hands and writing and imagine the feeling of the figure being written onto one's hand as if floating freely in space. One should immerse oneself in this feeling. In this way one gradually takes hold of the earth element. The element of water is grasped by imagining a fixed material point and another mobile point that moves in a circle around the first point. Then one should write this on one's hand and proceed as with the first figure. One should think of the second point as one that rotates continuously. For the air element, one thinks of two fixed points that want to fly apart from each other into infinite distances after they first describe a kind of semicircle around each other. If we work with this figure exactly as with the preceding figures, then we grasp the air element. Then we do not merely feel the air flowing past us and caressing us, we rather take hold of it. For the element of fire, we think of a closed figure such as a loop or a lemniscate, a figure eight on its side. One should especially feel that there is an intersecting point where the curve touches itself. Readers aside, and there are pictures of all these examples in the book. End of readers aside. One should do these exercises constantly for an extended period of time. They are not easy. One must first acquire a certain skill in feeling the sensations in space without using one's hand, and secondly, in holding the figures firmly in mind. But then these exercises lead to perception of the elemental world. One learns how to take hold of the elemental world. However, there is a rule, without exception, that these exercises simultaneously make one egotistical. For this reason, one must never do them without at the same time developing an all-encompassing feeling of compassion for everything that causes joy and pain to develop in the human soul. When we ascend into the suprasensory world, we are actually taken hold of by higher beings who use us as instruments, just as we use our eyes, ears, and so forth. The danger that accompanies this experience is that one loses oneself in the negative sense of the term. That is why it is necessary at the same time to develop courage and fearlessness. Then we can calmly allow ourselves to be taken hold of by spiritual beings in the spiritual world so that we feel now an angel is inspiring us, now an archangel, and so forth. Imaginations lead us into the subsensory world. Inspirations lead us into the suprasensory world. We see how these two directions, above and below, are united in the Rosicrucian path. 
It is necessary for us as clairvoyants to learn to strictly distinguish between the elemental world and suprasensory beings, between two aspects of what appears as a unity here in the physical world. Anyone who would see the two together in one picture, the being and its elemental expression, such a person would be making a fundamental mistake and confuse everything. In the beginning, it is not easy to separate the two regions, because the astral vision and the devakonic vision both exist. But one gradually learns, when looking upward at a being, to immediately descend in order to find the elemental expression of this being. Just as when looking at an object, one can immediately look down into a body of water to see its reflection. The Saturn condition of the earth could not be described if one could not, on the one hand, raise oneself to beings such as the spirits of will or the spirits of personality, and on the other hand penetrate to the spirits of fire. So too for the sun stage of the earth, one must recognize and know the spirits of wisdom and the archangels and the element of air. In the description found in title An Outline of Esoteric Science, both are given together, how the thrones send out the heat of Saturn and so forth. However, it is necessary in observing this to experience this as a duality. One must prepare oneself to see and hear things in the spiritual world that one has never seen or heard here below. Those who expect to find on the other side Only what they already know will never be able to penetrate into the spiritual world. This is what is expressed in the second sentence of our Rosicrucian verse, in Moremor. Only when death in Christ occurs in us can we again be reawakened by the Holy Spirit. This is again expressed in more detail in what is, to a certain extent, a commentary to our two-part verse. That is what is given to us by the Masters, quote, In my body lies the seed of the Spirit. End of record A. Record B. We have already seen the last time that we should not long for new exercises. Rather, it is just when we steadfastly, faithfully do the same exercises daily, example, steady drops hollow the stone, that they affect us in a fruitful way. Feelings will settle in us that lead us up into the spiritual world. It is very much the same with reading theosophical books. Theosophists must not think they really know a book if they have read it only three times. That is as good as never having read it. And instead of reading five books five times, we should read one book twenty-five times, we will then certainly notice the results. Unconsciously, they flow into our meditations and create mile markers in our path into spiritual heights. Everything around us, the entire world of physical sensory perceptions, we must imagine more or less as a large, wide field, a surface. The supra-sensory is spread out above it. The subsensory is spread out below it. Parenthesis, imagine the sensory world and the ordinary world of thoughts bound to the brain, maya, as a surface, a field. Above it, the supersensory world, hierarchies and so forth. Below it, the subsensory world, from which comes the uppermost sphere of the elemental world. How do the two differ? Close parenthesis. We are confronted by the subsensory in this way, as if we lay hold of it, by the supersensory world, as if we were taken hold of by it. For example, imagine taking hold of a snail or letting it crawl over your hand. That is the difference. If we imagine these two sensations often enough, we will certainly find the difference between suprasensory and the subsensory worlds. If we want to get to know the subsensory or elemental world, we should imagine geometric figures, 
triangle, square, and meditate upon them. Indeed, we should do it in the following way. First we draw a triangle in one hand with the other hand. Then we carry this activity over into free floating space, as if it no longer had anything to do with us. But we are to call forth the same feeling in ourselves as before, when we drew the figure onto the hand. If we want to understand the watery element in the elemental world, we must think of a point around which another point is constantly circling. Again, one first draws it on one's hand and then carries it over into the air, but in such a way that one imagines the movement as well as the sensation that is thereby brought about. If we want to live into the part of the elemental world that creates the air, then we must imagine two points that at first circle around one another in a half circle but then fly apart and are lost in space. Readers aside, the picture he shows here is sort of like the two spirals of a galaxy, starting both in the center, one turning, let's say, to the right and going out, the other one turning to the left and going out the other direction, sort of like a spiral. End of readers aside. Finally, to live into fire, We must imagine a point that is moving and touches itself again and again, a lemnus gate. Both of these last two symbols must also be first drawn in the hand and then carried over into freely floating air. When we meditate on these symbols in the indicated way, we will certainly notice how we live into the elements, how we will recognize which beings live in them. At the same time, we will feel how we are constantly becoming more egotistical. These exercises can benefit us only if we simultaneously develop a sense of universal compassion, which allows us to experience every cry or sound of complaint, every moan of pain in our surroundings, as if they were originating in our own tortured hearts. And just as the danger of egotism is great, when we settle into the subsensory world, so the danger of losing ourselves to the world is not any less dangerous when we settle into the suprasensory world. It is factually true that we are possessed by higher beings. They move into us, take possession of us, in order to work through us. Now, it is incumbent upon us to preserve our I, capital, our own self, not lose it. Courage, steadfastness, and fearlessness help us to do this. It is entirely useless for us to fear the possibility of any particular accident ahead of time. On the contrary, one should carry one's karma with courage and fearlessness. It is of no help to be afraid of it. From the beginning we must imagine that we will find something in the spiritual world that is different from the physical world. Spiritual beings present there come to meet us. If we enter that world expecting to find the spiritual beings in their element, then we will easily be misled. It is true that by means of such exercises we come to understand the earlier conditions of the earth and also learn how to set ourselves into them But such experiences only stimulate us in such a way that the intuition awakens the imagination. If we, for example, imagine the thrones and the spirits of personality at work on old Saturn, and at the same time the element of fire, then we will be misled by our picture of old Saturn. We will understand this condition only if we are able to picture both of them, parenthesis, the spiritual beings and the element, close parenthesis, entirely separated. Fire must be pictured as something entirely separated, as a mirror image. The same is true for the sun and the moon. The spiritual beings, whether angels or archangels, work from above downward. They want to enter into human beings, take hold of them, in order to work on the earth. We should open ourselves to them, but without surrendering our sense of self. 
Parenthesis. Working one's way into the spiritual world is connected with a feeling of being grasped by the hierarchies, which want to work through us. Working our way into the subsensory world is connected with the feeling of grasping something. The two feelings must be kept separate. For example, while we are meditating into the Saturn condition of the earth, if the thrones and the spirits of personality appear together with the element of fire, this is wrong and misleading. One must feel clearly the two as separated. Rise up to the hierarchy, dip down into the elemental world, and then back up again. Close parenthesis. End of Esoteric Lesson. Esoteric Lesson Prague, March 29, 1911. Record A, Anonymous Manuscript from Freda Collection. Record B, Manuscript from Alice Kinkel. Record C, Notes from Günther Wagner. In one manuscript, these words follow the Rosicrucian verse, quote, We close our gathering with the prayer of the day. The stones are silent. I have laid the eternal creative word into them. Close quote. Compare this to Collected Works 265, titled Freemasonry and Ritual Work, where we find this verse in a somewhat expanded form in Rudolf Steiner's handwriting in a facsimile reproduction. In a lecture from October 13, 1906, Rudolf Steiner speaks of an old Rosicrucian verse, quote, I have laid the eternal creative word into the stone, close quote, parenthesis, Title The Christian Mystery Collected Works Volume ninety seven Close Parenthesis Record A If we wish to follow the path of esoteric development, we will be given certain verses from an esoteric training, in which lies the power to develop our higher spiritual organs, if we apply the verses and meditations in the right way. Wisdom and the harmony of feelings were given. Parenthesis mantra, daily verse, Wednesday for Thursday. Close parenthesis. When we wish to immerse ourselves in the first lines of our morning exercise, quote, in pure rays of light shines the divinity of the world, close quote, we should understand that we will gain nothing for our elevation into the spiritual world if we let only the literal meaning of these words work on us, we should realize that we cannot see the divinity in the physical rays of the sun. Rather, we must look for this divinity in its high spirituality behind the rays of the sun. The sun's rays are only the outer garment for the divine. We should not take any picture from the outer world for our meditations, but rather such a picture should be created out of the spirit. To begin with, we must eliminate anything in our consciousness that reminds us of our outer surroundings. We must be able to forget everything, large and small, that stirs us in our daily lives. All outer impressions should be silent within. If we have prepared ourselves in this way, then we are immersing ourselves with our thoughts and feelings in the right way in these verses. After we have done these meditations for a longer or shorter time, then we must attempt to empty our soul of these thoughts also. In this way our souls arrive at a condition of calm and quiet, and when the intellect has been brought to silence, the higher members of the human being are lifted out of the physical body and enter into the spiritual world. However, this does not mean that the pupil has attained everything. For if we are not in the proper soul condition, having prepared ourselves for a long period of time by working on our weaknesses, that is, if we enter the spiritual world without the proper humility in our souls and without correct knowledge of our bad character traits, the spiritual world will appear to us in a false light. It will appear to us in a false light to the same extent the outside world would appear falsely to someone who, after wearing red-colored glasses around the house, forgot to take them off when going outside. 
Everything outside would appear in a red light that is entirely differently from the way it looks in reality. Just as wrongly would esotericists judge the things in the suprasensory world if they were to see them through the colored lenses of their personality. Esotericists would see the angels, for example, which stand one level above the human, not as radiant beings of light as one should see them in reality. Rather, these angels would appear before them as horrible animal forms or other grotesque things. If they should meet on the astral plane, the beings that stand at the stage between the animals and humans, parenthesis, that are luciferic or aramonic beings, close parenthesis, these beings could appear to them as shining radiant angels, as dissembling, alluring figures, and yes, even in the form of the masters of wisdom. In order to mislead the occultists, because they are still ruled too much by their arrogance and their own personalities, Esotericists should guard themselves against this and be concerned to lay aside their pride. If we want to tread an esoteric path, we can prepare ourselves only with the greatest humility in our hearts and through limitless reverence for the divine. There are other verses that can also lead us to the development of higher organs and to imagination, inspiration and intuition. But these exercises can also be done wrongly or be misunderstood so that we are led down a false path. For example, if we were to meditate with a certain egotistical self-awareness, quote, yes, a part of the Godhead itself uh, lies in me, close quote. In this way we cultivate arrogance within us and we achieve nothing more than strengthening our personality we would all too soon forget that a part of the Godhead can be found in every animal, in every plant, indeed in every one of God's creatures. However, to be able to enter into the spiritual world, we must leave behind precisely everything in us that is personality in the physical world. Above all, we must acquire a subtle feeling for the truth. If esotericists lack this feeling, they will soon perceive in themselves that they must bear the consequences. Esotericists are not allowed to be satisfied with the excuse that they thought they were telling the truth. Esotericists will never succeed with this excuse, for they are responsible for every one of their words. The consequences of untruth will fall upon them, even if they thought they had spoken the truth. In our everyday life, it is often difficult to stay with the truth. Things often have a nuance that leads into an untruth. How often one hears, quote, I thought it was the truth, close quote. It is not easy to tread the path that leads into the higher worlds. A good method that we can all use in order to come to greater clarity concerning our personality is to look often at certain portions of our life at least once per year, perhaps on our birthday. Then we should ask ourselves what we have to show for good and bad deeds in the course of this stretch of life. If we examine ourselves very earnestly, we shall find in most cases that our good deeds do not arise from our personality, but rather that we allowed them to happen out of an inner impulse. This inner impulse is our guardian angel, who drives us to our good deeds. On the other hand, we must not rely entirely upon our angel, thinking at every opportunity that our guardian angel will give us an impulse soon enough, for this would be completely wrong. Our guardian angel would soon leave us, that is, in a certain sense, leave us. If we continue this exercise for a number of years, we will experience that nothing contributes more to our discovery of character failings and their improvement than this taking stock of our accounts. Thus we gradually prepare ourselves to tread the esoteric path in a fruitful way. We do this by constantly freeing ourselves more and more from our personality. 
in a certain sense, by emptying ourselves so that the Christ principle can enter us, as Paul indicated with the words, quote, not I, but Christ in me, close quote. This being filled by the Christ principle frees our personality of egotism and leads to a vision of the highest. The name Christ is actually not the name of the principle that should be expressed, for the divine power that one names with this name is not to be spoken aloud. For this reason the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings did not speak this name during their hours of consecration when they spoke these words. Ex Deo Nasimur, in Morimur, per Spiritum Sanctum Revivissimus. The end of Record A. Record B. Prayer to the Spirit of the Day, Wednesday for Thursday. When we find ourselves in an event such as the one that is to be held here today, We begin with a verse in order for us to be inspired in the proper way. We address the spirit of the day. These verses are mantras and possess great power. This evening we stand before an especially beneficial day for an esoteric lesson. The evening before Thursday, the day of Jupiter. We call not only to the great spirit of the sun that stands behind Thursday, but also to the spirit that is best able to inspire us in a corresponding way. You all have certain exercises in order to fulfill your meditation in the right way, and this is actually the technical part of the esoteric life. These exercises are to be repeated with energy and endurance day after day. The intention is to fill the soul with such a content that can gradually lead up into the spiritual world. To begin with, this content is to fill the soul in a conceptual form with complete exclusion of all other thoughts and pictures of the physical world, all cares and worries. It should live in the soul for as long as possible, as vividly and pictorially as possible. For many, because of their karma, This filling of the soul with this meditative thought content must remain as the only correct kind of meditation. Along the path that we undertake, when we devote ourselves to esotericism, we will see how weak we are. We will see how weak we are when we step out into the great macrocosm and how egotistical we are when we attempt to enter into our own inner soul life. It would be wrong for us to want to say, Indeed, God is in me. The divine seed is in me. Therefore, I do not need to look out into the world. No, the Logos is everywhere, in stone and in plant, in animal and in human beings. It reveals itself out there in everything. The sun is its garment. And when we observe human beings, are these sheaths that surround them like a cloak? No, they are what we are to work with, not a cloak that would have nothing to do with us. And when a hammer is broken, only after other things have been done to it can it be again used for work. Every kind of egotism, every form of vanity must be eliminated in esotericists. We have been given two tasks, first to fill ourselves with the content of the meditations, to permeate our soul completely. Second, we are then to empty our souls completely of the content of the meditation. The soul does not then remain empty, but rather the spiritual world streams in. The pupil knows this moment when all subjectivity is completely overcome. But only then is it the true spiritual world, for otherwise one becomes a deceived deceiver. It may appear to such people that the Master appears, but in reality it could be that an evil being has taken on the mask of the Master. Truthfulness is an unconditionally necessary requirement in esotericism. One is not allowed only to believe that something is true, Rather, one must first research 
and only then is one allowed to say something. We should take one day per year for a retrospective on the previous year, perhaps on the birthday, and we should review all the events of the year in an exact way. In doing so, we will discover that we have done more good in the year than we thought. But this examination will also show us that it was not ourselves but our good angel who did the good things, and that it was we who did everything that was botched. The end of Record B. Record C. In pure rays of light. In quotes. For example, for a longer period of time, think yourself into a spiritual sun, S-U-N, from which divinity shines into the world. Forget yourself completely. Then let the words fall away too. Then with time the spiritual world will be revealed. Do not meditate on, quote, in me is a divine self, close quote. Then one does not remain humble. If we lack humility, angels easily appear caricatured in an animal or similar form, and luciferic spirits appear as forms of light. Even if a pupil stands at a stage such that he or she is consciously in the presence of the masters, but does not remain humble, perhaps even brags to others about the experience, then it is easily possible for evil spirits or an evil occultist to use the appearance of a master and then lie or seduce the pupil. Without humility, even when researching Atlantean conditions, for example, errors easily arise. So that perhaps something spiritual, say the etheric parts of a human being, are not seen. An unconditional striving for truth is also necessary. Even speaking an erroneous statement in good faith has severe karmic consequences. When surrendering one's personality in meditation, it is easy for everything to flutter away. Against this happening, one should hold firmly to Paul's words, quote, Not I, but Christ in me. Close quote. The Christ principle holds everything together. From time to time, for example on one's birthday, it is good to look back on the past. One will gradually get the feeling that the good deeds were not done by oneself, but rather by something within one, one's guardian angel. On the other hand, one also gets the impression that one has botched much by oneself. Therefore, we should look up to our guardian angel. The end of the esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Berlin on June 12, 1911. Record A, manuscript from Nelly Lichtenberg, notes from Günther Wagner. Record B, manuscript from Louis Glasson. Record A. My dear sisters and brothers, we must be very clear that there is a great difference between outer exoteric knowing and the knowing that theosophy provides. When we allow an outer perception to work on us, pictures and concepts are formed in us. In this way we get to know the thing that we are perceiving. We know something about it. Are matters the same with theosophical knowledge? Here, too, when we are told about the four members of the human being or something concerning the planetary conditions of the earth or the Akashic Chronicle, we form concepts, pictures in our mind concerning these things. But there is something else involved. While exoteric knowledge does not enrich us, leaving nothing behind that goes beyond death, things are different with all esoteric knowing. It flows into us, into the astral body where it creates certain new members. New threads are woven into the astral body and remain attached to our being. We know that the astral body surrounds the human being in the shape of an egg. Since an I, capital, is at work in it, therefore it radiates out. New threads, new knowledge is woven into this astral body so that we can call it the, in quotes, body of knowledge, or, in quotes, cognition body. This body of knowledge, 
will become ever denser and stronger, and eventually will be spirit self. The advancing planetary evolution of the earth is possible only by means of our developing this body. On Jupiter, this body of knowledge will already be as dense as the astral body. On Venus, as dense as the etheric body. And finally, on Vulcan, it will have become about as physical as our blood. Now, how can this theosophical knowledge become so fruitful that the body of knowledge is formed in the astral body? Let us clarify this with an example. We are surrounded by physical material air. We breathe it in. In this way we live. This is described in the Bible with the words, God breathed living breath into the human being and he became a living soul. Close quote. But what we exhale, carbonic acid, cannot sustain life. It is lethal air. Death began because we were released from the womb of the gods. Human beings ate from the tree of life, that is, with Lucifer's help they achieved independence and freedom. For this reason they were driven out of paradise, that is, they were no longer human beings of air, as in Lemurian times, They became water beings and then human beings of earth. As long as we are on the earth, Lucifer will have power over us. But this is what is tragic about this being. Lucifer's power does not extend above and beyond the earth. All pain and suffering arise through Lucifer and are connected with this tragedy. On Jupiter there will also no longer be any exoteric knowledge. Had human beings remained in paradise, they would have continued to eat from the tree of life. Lucifer's influence removed the tree of life, and in so doing, also the possibility of humanity's sinking even deeper than they already had after eating from the tree of knowledge. But now the tree of life is transformed into the symbol that, indeed, did at first signify death. But it holds a life within that is all the greater, a life that we can attain when we make the cross with the red roses our own. Just as the earth is enveloped by the air that we breathe, so there is also in this air a spiritual substance that wants to flow into human beings. It is up to us whether we exhale this spiritual substance as deadly air or whether we connect it with our theosophical knowledge and weave the fruit into our astral bodies. And this is important not only for ourselves alone but for the entire cosmos. If we breathe in this spiritual substance without making it fruitful in us, then we are taking something from the cosmos but giving nothing in return and thus we hinder evolution. It depends upon us whether the earth condition can be followed by the Jupiter condition by means of our increasing these spiritual forces surrounding the earth. When we look at old Saturn, we know that our physical body first arose there in seed form, so to speak. It came about through the thoughts of the gods. These thoughts were then condensed into what we are today. But already on old Saturn it was counted upon that human beings would continue the work of the gods. And we do this when we allow the spiritual substance of our surroundings to flow into us in order to create, out of this substance, our body of knowledge. That is the purpose of the mystery of Golgotha, to give human beings this opportunity. What is it, then, that we are taking into ourselves with this substance? It is Christ himself. Before the mystery of Golgotha, this was not the case. Then people could certainly say, ex Deo Nasimer. Those to be initiated in those times were prepared so that they could go back to what had been handed down by the ancient gods. 
But we know that with the mystery of Golgotha, the spiritual aura of the earth changed because Christ became the spirit of the earth. He poured his very substance into the earth's aura and since then is contained within it. And again the time has come when this substance of Christ, which was poured out, has again been concentrated so that it can be taken up by human beings. In Christo Morimur, means nothing more than immersing ourselves in this spiritual substance. And thus we are taking in Christ with this substance so that we can say, quote, not I, but Christ in me, close quote. But there is one thing that we must not forget. Where there is much light, there is also much shadow. Many errors will insinuate themselves along with the new wisdom that is given to our time. Then, It is our holy duty to test everything that we hear with our healthy common sense. This has always been stressed in all Rosicrucian esotericism. However, we should always be tolerant with those who fall into error. We must always say to ourselves that if what we have is really the truth, then it will exist through itself. But if it is error, then my passionate striving for the truth will achieve for me the certainty that in my next incarnation I will find the truth. Quote, In the Spirit lay the seed of my body. Close quote. End of record A. Record B. Knowledge on the physical plane, such as science, art, even spiritual knowledge, through a medium, is luciferic knowledge that is doomed for death, just as exhaled air is dead. Theosophical knowledge, on the other hand, is something with substance that creates the body of knowledge, the future spirit self on Jupiter. Just as air surrounds us, so also does a spiritual region that is the light of Christ since the event of Golgotha. It has now been so condensed that we can absorb it. We must absorb it with our body of knowledge so that it is not killed, but rather works in us in a living way. There is a Rosicrucian verse that says, quote, Man is immortal because he wants to be. Close quote. The body of knowledge is what is immortal, what we can take with us beyond death. Rosicrucian esotericism has formulated every word so that these words educate the power of logical thinking, human reason. Thus, everything that is presented to us as the results of research from the spiritual world must be understood and tested. Blind faith must not hold sway in human beings. Blind faith and authority kills logical thinking and the spiritual in us. Lucifer is a tragic figure. He knows that his power over humanity is at an end with the earth. All the pain and suffering in the world is luciferic. Earlier, Human beings were in the atmosphere around the earth. Only through Lucifer did they fall into the watery element and then into the earth element. This is the foundation for the picture of the fall into sin. Without Lucifer, human beings would have instinctively woven their other three members into the body of knowledge. The plan of freedom has been added as a second plan to earth evolution. The gods rested on the Sabbath. This is to be taken literally, because now human beings must themselves continue the work on their higher members. They themselves must build up the body of knowledge through theosophical thoughts and knowledge, just as on old Saturn the gods created our physical bodies with their thoughts and mental pictures. Clairvoyance in our time is the appearance of spiritual forms in the consciousness of human beings. We create these forms by taking the light of Christ into our body of knowledge. Human beings were not allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge in paradise because they would then have had to remain with their knowledge on earth in Lucifer's kingdom. Now, since the tree of knowledge has become the tree of the cross, of dead wood, from which new life, the roses, arises, 
Now they should eat from the tree of life and drink the juice of the rose. In Cristo Morimor means to rise up in meditation into the spiritual atmosphere surrounding the earth. Christ needed to come to the earth only once because humanity since then has progressed and will be able to see him in a different way in the future. The end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson. Given in Munich, August 23, 1911. Record A. Notes from Günter Wagner. Record B. Notes from the collection of Fred Popik. Record C. Manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Barbara Wolf. Record D. Anonymous manuscript from the Freda collection. Record E. Manuscript from Alice Kinko. Record F. Manuscript from Louis Classon. Arthur Rusel, Weimar, wrote in his diary about this hour, quote, morning, eleven o'clock, was the first esoteric lesson that I experienced. Dr. Steiner held it in the Princess Hall. All the listeners were members of the esoteric school, to which I now also belonged. A festive quiet held sway in the room until Dr. Steiner stepped forward with an earnest expression and spoke the prayer and then spoke about the proper way to meditate. He closed with a festive prayer that was almost sung. A deep quiet hung over the entire room until Dr. Steiner gave the sign for leaving. He spoke at the behest of the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings. The form of human rays of force. Compare with the lecture of August 20th, 1911, in Collected Works, Volume 129, Wonders of the World, Trials of the Soul, and Revelations of the Spirit. Record A. Dear sisters and brothers, as you know, it is our duty, at the beginning of every esoteric lesson, to call upon the ruling spirit of the day, who is involved with directing the earth in world evolution. Bracket, verse for Wednesday, close bracket. Today we want to say some things in general. Next Saturday we will be more specific. Today we want to look at something that can be characterized as the only true and proper beginning of clairvoyance. The primary focus in all esotericism, in all inner development, is to create absolute calm, inner peace and quiet, and to maintain it after the actual meditation. After we have meditated on the verses or have done other things, the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings have given us for our training. We should abide for a while still in absolute quiet. Nothing of our everyday life, no memory of it, not even a feeling for our body should penetrate here. We must feel ourselves to be without a body, as if empty. We should also drop all thoughts of our own existence, only the fact of our own existence should be admitted. And in doing this, we should not fall asleep, not fall into a dream or sleeping condition. Then the condition can enter in which clairvoyance can begin. What then appears before our inner eye, EYE, comes from the spiritual world. There are signs that indicate whether the pictures appearing here are pure spirit or deceptive images. What would happen if the etheric body were to leave the physical body even for a moment? The physical body would contract, shrivel, and become wrinkled. It has the tendency to contract into the smallest space possible and ultimately dissolve into nothing. The tendency of the etheric body is to expand into the widths of space, it feels itself connected with all the forces out in space. It fills the physical body and spreads it out to the size that it has. Because of the physical body's tendency to shrivel up, we get wrinkles in old age. The physical body shrinks together because the etheric body no longer works in it the way it did in our youth. Something similar occurs with the etheric body in our meditations. The etheric body spreads out in space and feels itself to be within everything. The same thing is also the case 
at the first moment of death, when the etheric body leaves the physical body. This can last for days. It is a blissful feeling when the etheric body feels itself as if dissolved in space. And if the astral body were not present, then the etheric body would remain that way until the next birth. But the astral body draws the etheric body together again through its desires, drives and passions. And in this way the human being enters into Kamaloka. Now in meditation we should strive toward the having, the feeling that the inner human being is illuminated through and through. And after years of effort this can be achieved. We ourselves become light. We become sources of light that illuminate objects in the spiritual world that approach us. The things that appear to us in moments of deepest soul calm are not the same as those that appear to us in outer physical life. Those we see from the outside, for example, when we see the sun rising over the horizon. But rather to stay with the picture of a sunrise, we would feel ourselves within the sun that rises above the horizon of our clairvoyant consciousness. We would feel ourselves there spread out within space. However, deceptive pictures arise before us if we bring personal feelings of sympathy and antipathy, especially antipathy, or an inappropriate bias for individual people, and so forth, into our meditations. Those who lie and are disingenuous in everyday life carry the lies within their etheric bodies and with them into space. The deceitfulness is reflected by the forms that the pupil sees there, just as a mirror reflects our face or an echo our voice. Seductive forms and visions, beautiful forms of angels, then appear there, caused by the deceitfulness that streamed out with the etheric body. These forms are increasingly attached to us because of the kinship of these forms with our own deceitfulness. In the end, we are simply unable to distinguish between truth and lies. Now many people may think that there must be means by which we can protect ourselves from these deceptive visions. But just as true as it is that I am standing here and speaking, representing the esotericism behind which the masters of wisdom and harmony of feeling stand, just as true is it that there is no means to banish these deceptive pictures all at once in order to prevent their appearance. Only gradually, through very patient, very gradual, steady work by oneself on oneself to overcome deceitfulness and untruthfulness, is it possible gradually to work in the direction that those deceitful visions no longer appear. This will happen when the lies are no longer mirrored because they are no longer present. Those who are too ambitious those who have a false ambition to enter into esoteric training, those who feel an intemperate longing to experience all the truths of the spiritual world, they create thereby error within themselves. They become susceptible to all kinds of chatter and gossip out in the world. They are happy to be occupied with the everyday destinies of people, and eagerly listen to all kinds of sensational explanations and events. They can no longer distinguish between what is true and what is not true. Thus excessive ambition and error are connected. We must battle within ourselves against excessive ambition and unhealthy desire for the highest truths, against lies and dishonesty, each one of us within ourselves. We must lift ourselves to the highest morality in our daily lives if we wish to arrive at correct clairvoyance that can proceed from properly carried through meditations. And for them to be properly carried through, we must not allow ourselves to carry feelings and thoughts from daily life into our meditations. Otherwise, we would pollute the etheric substance that should radiate out into space. 
The longer and more intensively the meditations are carried out, the more intensely they work on us. Yet we must be careful here. Those who notice that they do not feel well, who feel dizzy or something similar, should not extend the time very much, and they must seriously consider what they are doing wrong. One's sense of well-being should be the same after meditation as it was before meditation. We should reflect on our esoteric life often, very often. We should recognize our faults. We should be very clear about how corrupt we are. But this knowledge of our baseness should not depress us. Again, that would be crass egotism for our depression would only prove that we thought we were better than we are in reality. Actually, we have precisely the faults that we ourselves acquired in our earlier life, and thus they become part of our karma. We must clearly survey our faults and then go to work to eliminate them. We must learn to think objectively. Those who say that they already think objectively are often found to be suffering from a great error because this assumption is itself only subjective. It is an illusion. Ambition leads to error, to superstition, which we must not fall prey to. We should approach everything that we encounter, whatever it may be, with a wakeful, open mind, with clear thinking and sharp logic. We should not have absolute confidence in something that may well appear to us at first as true. We should investigate it critically and not give ourselves over to something randomly. We should act this way in our esoteric life also. There is no demand for faith in any authority. My brothers and sisters, this is what the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings would say to you, that you should maintain your clarity of thought and apply it to what I am here justified in representing, to what is given out of clairvoyant consciousness, and to me also. You should approach what is given and represented here with healthy common sense, with reason and unprejudiced, sufficiently expanded thinking. You should not have absolute confidence in this or that, but rather judge for yourselves. This esoteric lesson, like all esoteric lessons, should be sacred to us. So, once again, we want to summarize all of what this lesson has brought to us in this sacred verse, beginning, quote, In the Spirit lay the seed of my body. In my body lies the seed of the Spirit. Close quote. End of record A. Record B. Discipline of the will and inner enlightenment. We know it is our duty at the beginning of every esoteric lesson, to call upon the spirit that is the representative of the day, to the extent that it is involved in the leadership of the earth in world evolution. Parenthesis, verse for Wednesday is spoken. Close parenthesis. What can help us further along in life should pass before our souls in this esoteric lesson. To begin with, we want to observe what one should consider as the only true and first beginning of clairvoyance. As we already know, from the moment of spiritual insight, a feeling enters us as if we were expanding and dissolving into the universe. This comes from the expansion of the etheric body, an event that occurs to some extent in every meditation and takes place completely after death. When the etheric body is completely or partially loosened and separated from the physical body, it is expanded and pushes far out into space. This experience is accompanied by a feeling of blessedness, and the human being would, as a matter of fact, be able to abide in this feeling during the life between death and new birth if only the astral body were not present. The astral body's forces, which are still connected with all the drives, desires and passions, permeate and pull the etheric body together. Because of this, we at first enter Kamaloka. 
On the other hand, if the etheric body were not present in our physical life, then the physical body would pull together and shrivel up because it has this tendency to shrivel, even down to the smallest space, in order ultimately to dissolve into nothing. This happens through aging, when our forces diminish and we get wrinkles. In every meditation we should then strive for the feeling that we are inwardly filled with light, and after years of effort this can be achieved. We ourselves become light, become sources of light that illuminate the objects that approach us in the spiritual world. What appear to us then in the calmest moments in the depths of our soul are no longer similar to the appearances in the physical world. We do not see things from outside, such as when we see the rising sun in the morning. Rather, staying with the example of the sun, we then feel ourselves in the sun that rises on the horizon of our clairvoyant consciousness. We feel ourselves distributed and spread out in space. However, illusory pictures can also arise especially when we have feelings of sympathy and antipathy in an unfounded way for individual people, which we then take with us into the meditation. For example, the deceitfulness of those who in ordinary life are dishonest and lie streams into space with their etheric bodies and is then reflected from the forms they behold, just as a mirror reflects back our image. Thus deceptive forms in the shape of beautiful angels can arise, which are caused by the deceitfulness that streams outward with the etheric body. All beings are attracted that are related to the feelings of the esoteric student, and they suffocate the student even more in his or her weaknesses and vices. All around us in space are many beings, both good and evil, and we call to these divine forces and powers through our esoteric training. Now, many people may think that means must exist to protect oneself from these kinds of deceitful visions. But as truly as I stand here and speak and represent the esotericism behind which the masters of wisdom and harmony of feeling stand, just as truly is there no means to banish these deceptive pictures once and for all, in order to prevent their appearance. Only gradually, through steady work on oneself, is it possible to work in the direction that these deceitful visions no longer appear. Only by working on ourselves through an inward training of the will, so that the lies are simply no longer present in us, can we stop the illusions. Then they will not be reflected back through the etheric body. Those who enter into an esoteric training with too much ambition, for example, if they want to discover, if possible, all the truths of the spiritual world, and those who feel such an intemperate longing, thereby create error within themselves. They become susceptible to all kinds of chatter and gossip out in the world. They happily occupy themselves with the everyday destinies of people and eagerly listen to all kinds of sensational discussions and stories. They can no longer distinguish between what is true and what is not true. Thus are connected ambition and error. Each one of us must battle excessive ambition and unhealthy desire for the highest truths within ourselves. We must lift ourselves to the highest morality in our daily lives if we wish to arrive at correct clairvoyance, which can only proceed from properly executed meditations on the foundation of a moral life strictly followed. But in order to meditate in the proper fashion, all thoughts of everyday life must be excluded. However, if we, nevertheless, bring those kinds of thoughts and feelings along into our meditations, we contaminate our etheric substance. The longer and more intensively the meditations are carried out, the stronger is their effect upon us. However, 
One must be careful here. Anyone who notices that he or she does not feel well, who feels dizzy or anything similar, should not extend the meditation too long. One must give serious thought to the question, quote, What have I done wrong? Close quote. After meditating, one's state of health must be the same as it was before meditating. Yes, we should think often, very often, about our meditative life. We should recognize our mistakes and become very clear how evil we still are. But this knowledge of our baseness should not depress us, because these character weaknesses that we have prepared for ourselves through previous earth lives remain in our karma. We should survey our faults very clearly and then set about eradicating them. In doing so, we must learn to think objectively, just as we would observe a stranger's thinking. We acquire this precisely through the study of spiritual science. Those who say after a short period of time, quote, I do not think subjectively, but in an entirely objective way, close quote, are very mistaken, for this assumption is itself still completely subjective. It is nothing more than vanity, since to begin with we cannot think objectively at all. Let us think about this one more time. All ambition, all untruthfulness with regard to ourselves will lead inexorably to error, to superstition. We must not fall prey to this. We should approach everything that might come to us, whatever it may be, wherever it may come from, and above all we should approach ourselves with a wakeful, open mind, with clear thinking and sharp logic. This means we must not swear by something, even if it at first appears true, if we have not yet critically researched it ourselves. It means never blindly accepting the truth of anything. So, here too, in the esoteric life, faith in authority is not required. And this, my dear sisters and brothers, is what the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings want to have said to you, that you should maintain and use your full powers of reasoning when receiving these truths from them, which I am here entitled to represent to you out of clairvoyant consciousness. You should use your full powers of reasoning even over and against me. What is presented here should be approached only with healthy common sense, without prejudice, and with sufficiently expanded reasonable thinking. You should not swear upon this or that, but rather form your own judgments. This esoteric lesson, like all esoteric lessons, should be sacred to us. So once again we want to summarize all of what this lesson has brought us in this verse, beginning, quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body. The end of record B. Record C. The most important for our development, the most significant moments in our esoteric life, are those that occur after our meditation, when we allow complete calm to enter into our souls in order for the content of our meditation to work upon it. We should strive to extend these periods of time increasingly over time. For by means of this, quote, lifting ourselves out, close quote, of the circle of our everyday thoughts and feelings, by means of this emptying of our souls, we put ourselves into contact with another world. Out of this, World pictures come to meet us, pictures concerning which we must admit that they are new to us, that there is nothing in our life in the physical world with which we can otherwise compare them. Whether they are correct or not, this they will tell us themselves. What are we actually doing when we produce this calm in our soul? We are doing the same thing that certain beings do with us macrocosmically at the moment of our death. We have often said that the four members of our being are firmly woven together. Mainly the physical and etheric bodies stand in a special relationship to one another. 
What would happen if we separated the etheric body from the physical body? The forces in the physical body have the tendency to draw it together more and more. If separated from the etheric, the physical body would become increasingly smaller, would shrink together into a ball and ultimately disappear into itself. On the other hand, the etheric body has the tendency to spread out more and more. In this way it gives the physical body its form. Outside the physical body it spreads itself out into the cosmos and this self-expansion is connected with a feeling of blissful blessedness. After death this expansion is limited ultimately only by the astral body. What is present in the astral body in terms of drives, desires and passions draws the etheric body together again and thereby brings about Kamaloka. During our moments of meditation, which should be sacred to us, we independently induce this state. We loosen the etheric body from out of the physical body. Of course, this is not perceptible to our physical senses. Nevertheless, we lift it up into spiritual worlds. In such moments we should forget our physical bodies as much as possible. We should not feel it. We should forget that we are alive. Of course, not to the extent that we fall asleep. That would be wrong and injurious. But rather, in full consciousness of our life, we nevertheless should pay no attention to it. Thus we should allow nothing from our daily life or feelings into our souls, especially nothing of our sympathies or antipathies, which are so often unjustified. For what would we do with them? Through the fact that we pour the etheric substance of our souls into the etheric world, we come into contact with other hierarchies from which good and evil beings live in this world. And the substances that we pour into this etheric world attract other substances that are similar to them. When we carry our character defects along with us into this world, then they flow toward the other etheric forces and are mirrored back to us by them, but not in their true form. Rather, they are mirrored in figures that are often seductive, that dazzle us and dim and confuse our judgment. As an unclean room attracts flies, so too an etheric body permeated by faults attracts, in that world, beings inclined to deceive. If deceitful or excessively ambitious people carry these character flaws along into their meditation, then it can happen that they may increasingly prefer to give themselves over to deception, that they learn to love lying and deception. For this reason, an esotericist should pay twice as much attention to his or her faults. With courage and modesty, we should say to ourselves that we are bad human beings and that we will endeavor to set aside our faults. However, we must not be depressed over this and allow ourselves to be beaten down by the consciousness of this fact, for that would be egotism. We must say karma is the reason why we are the way we are. We must not wish to be otherwise through divine grace, which we have not earned. Rather, we should strive to become otherwise through our own knowledge. This is not easy. But in this way we come to the right path. In the beginning of our esoteric work, we should not expand this lifting out of the etheric body to the extent that it disturbs our physical sense of well-being. Upon return, we should find our physical body to be the same as when we left it. And if we experience dizziness or anything similar that we were not experiencing before, then we should shorten our meditations. Nowhere in genuine esoteric schools is it required that students become dependent upon a teacher. On the contrary, 
Esotericists should test what is said to them. They should permeate what is told to them with their intelligence, compare it with what was told them in the past, and seek to supplement it. Faith in authority is never required in schools that stand under the guidance of the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings. Great caution is called for whenever such faith is required, wherever such a pledge is demanded. Students should strive and test what they are told independently. Their knowledge will guide them. There is no magical formula to give them that will remove the faults and weaknesses that reveal to them a world of deception instead of the true spiritual world. Only through slow work and honest self-examination can a student gradually become a different person, a person who can bear to look at his or her true being with all its weaknesses and not lose courage and inner composure while seeing the truth. Students must take the transformation of their being in hand with great strength. Students must not be filled with a feeble longing for truth and knowledge, but rather a healthy longing for the truth, in which lies the power to behold one's faults. If immediately after awakening in the morning one attempts to dip back into the spiritual world from which one has just come by emptying one's soul and immersing oneself in meditation, then in this way one can achieve again the connection and the memory of one's nightly experiences in the spiritual world. The end of Record C. Record D. In this hour we are to be given teachings that we have sometimes already received, that is, concerning the way we are to behave when practicing our meditative exercises. Complete tranquility of soul should rule in our minds before and especially afterward. We must attempt to keep external impressions away from us. In our soul all must be quiet that would surge forward from our inner life of feeling and also all that would storm in upon our thoughts. Only then, only in such a mood of soul, can the veil be torn that allows us to see into the spiritual world, which then spreads out before us in a wealth of images or pictures. But the most important thing that students must know when they see these pictures before them is that what they are seeing does not always express what it appears to express. Although what is revealed to the eye, E-Y-E, is a reality, too often it consists of deceptive and seductive forms that we have awoken and woven out of our own souls. Such forms appear before us especially when as esotericists we still have an inclination toward untruthfulness, toward lies, if we are only dishonest, but especially when we are filled with ambition and arrogance. For then we unconsciously send these feelings into our meditations. These personal feelings are woven into the forms that appear before us. And then the condition of our own souls ray forth back to us in the etheric pictures of the supra-sensory world. However, if students purify their minds and souls, and then approach their meditations with humility, they will recognize soon enough what they are to consider the truth. There is yet another way a human being can get insight into the suprasensory world. It happens when we have achieved the stage where we can step out of the physical body. This comes about by loosening the etheric body from the physical body. When we see someone standing in front of us, we usually think that we see only the physical person, but this is not so. For if we were seeing only the physical body, then something entirely different would appear to us. We know that the human being consists of a physical body, etheric body, astral body, and I, capital. If we were to subtract the physical body away from the etheric or life body, then the physical body would shrink, shrivel up, and finally disappear entirely. 
This is because the physical body has the tendency to shrink together, whereas the etheric body holds the opposite tendency. That is, it strives to expand itself. In the moment of physical death, the etheric body expands itself out into the cosmos. For those who have died, who have gone through the door of death, there is a feeling of the greatest blessedness, of the greatest sense of comfort, as they are expanded into the widths of space. However, because they still carry a desire for the material world from the previous life, they are drawn back into the earthly, and then the Kamaloka time begins. In a way similar to the one just described, those people who have achieved a certain stage of esoteric development can lift the etheric body out of the physical body. However, we should not exaggerate our exercises, especially at the beginning of our development. They should not claim too much time. Above all, we must guard ourselves so that they do not make us sleepy or even fall asleep. For then it could happen that more or less evil beings overpower us. In all that we undertake for our higher development, we must always maintain full consciousness. Today there are many esoteric streams that constantly acquire increasing influence over humanity, especially when they are recommended by a kind of authority. Whatever may approach human beings, in whatever way, they should never blindly believe, even if something is spoken by an authority. Always and in every case we ourselves should test what we hear. We should always use our reason. We should also approach everything that we have learned in the course of the years with our own thinking, with our own logic, and ask whether we can reconcile it with our own understanding or whether we must dismiss it as illogical. The end of Record D. Record E. The same thing happens to a human being in meditation as happens in death. Only gradually can we recognize the enormity and power of what we undertake in meditation. Can we recognize that we breach the deep, powerful mystery of death when we devote ourselves in the right way to meditation? The physical body has in itself the tendency toward contraction. If we were to think away the etheric body, then the physical body would shrink together more and more down to the smallest space and then disappear into itself. The etheric body maintains the physical body, the way we see it. In old age, wrinkles are the result of the diminishing forces of the life body. We were reminded of the importance of being awake and remaining awake. The end of Record E. Record F. The physical body has the tendency to shrink together. The etheric body has the tendency to expand out into the cosmos. In meditation, the physical body is made passive, just as after death. Our higher members are extended into the spiritual world that surrounds us and is filled with good and evil beings. If we take our desires and passions, sympathies and antipathies, vanity, ambition and so forth with us into our meditations, then we attract evil powers. Parenthesis, the moments after meditation are especially important, the quiet time. Close parenthesis. Spiritual mercury is everywhere filled with good and evil spiritual powers, except there where a human being sends his or her forces out. There the spiritual world is pushed back. The empty areas in the drawing above show the form of the outward streaming forces of the human being. The higher hierarchies work into it, the spirits of form, movement and wisdom, the thrones, cherubim and seraphim, and the evil powers work from the periphery as far as the circle. The archai work within the circle as far as the pentagram along the human streams of force. The archangels work within the pentagram as far as the pentagon. 
angels permeate entirely the human being. The human etheric body is capable of being expanded out to the stars without becoming fragmented. The astral body can also be expanded out to spiritual beings, whether good or evil, but it becomes more passive and leaves behind part of itself. The I capital must now achieve the power to hold together these parts by means of lines of force that it can achieve through the study of spiritual and esoteric science. Everything must be grasped with the intellect. There must be no blind faith in authority which undermines the intellect. The present time is filled with the possibility of falling victim to errors. One must use one's common sense and reason against this danger. We must maintain peace with those who are following false paths, but we must also use our good judgment. The end of the esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Munich on August 26, 1911. Record A, notes from Günther Wagner. Record B, notes from Günther Wagner. Record C, notes from the collection of Elisabeth Freda. The following entry was found in Arthur Russell's diary, quote, I must also mention that Dr. Steiner this morning held the second esoteric lesson in the esoteric school. At the conclusion, he appealed to the members not to allow themselves to be influenced by any kind of authority at the upcoming Congress in Genoa, not to accept anything that they could not test themselves. Close quote. Record A. My dear sisters and brothers, it is our duty to call on the spirit of the day, of whom we may hope, must hope, will help us with our esoteric striving. Verse for Saturday, beginning quote, Great all-encompassing spirit, in your life I live with the earth's life. Close quote. Further, quote, Great all-encompassing spirit, my eye is raised from below to above. May it sense you in the all-encompassing. Close quote. In the last esoteric lesson, August 23rd, we saw that when we are meditating, the etheric body is poured out into space. This spiritual space is filled with all possible kinds of beings, good and bad, with which we are connected, with which our etheric body becomes connected. Different spirits work into history at different times. Furthermore, the same beings are not active in all places at the same time. Those in Asia have Europe to the west. In Europe, they have Asia to the east. The realms of other beings limit their individual spiritual space at various places. But in the spiritual space where a human being dwells, there is always an empty spot, so to speak, as if spared from other spiritual beings, that the human being fills out him or herself. Here the streams that work through the human being hold sway. If we wanted to draw how these beings, the good and the bad, work in space and are kept away from the space occupied by the human being, then the following occult sign would result. There's a, a star with a circle around it. In the present time, it is mainly the spirits of form who work here. However, they cannot work into human beings. Into this space, the three lower hierarchies work, angels, archangels, and spirits of personality. Only the angels can work throughout the entire space of this five-pointed star. If we wanted to bring to mind how far the archangels can work, then we must divide up this pentagon, blue, that we already considered in an exoteric public lecture. They do not enter into this pentagon, only as far as the five triangles, yellow. If we want to show how far the spirits of personality can work into this diagram, we must draw a circle around the five-pointed star. If we stretch out our arms and think of a circle going all around from head to fingertips to the tips of the toes, then the spirits of personality can go only into the parts 
that are bounded by the head, stretched out arms, and the particular arc of the circle, and so forth. Green. The spirits of form can no longer get to the human being. They reach the circle described above and are pushed back by the forces that are at work in the fourfold being of the human being. Now when the etheric body is expanded during meditation, it is in all of these beings and facts that are outside the circle, out to the stars. It is, quote, poured out, close quote, without interruption, without a gap over everything. If one followed it with clairvoyant vision, one would not see it ever end. It is simply present everywhere. Now, if the student still has character traits such as mendacity, dishonesty, untruthfulness, ambition, and so forth, such as were discussed last time, then these qualities accompany the etheric body into the spiritual space. And if there is an evil being here or there, then the evil in us feels related and attracted to it. Now the astral body goes with the etheric body into spiritual space. The intellectual, the thinking part of the astral body, expands out of the upper tip of the star. The feeling part expands right and left out through the middle tips. And the willing part downward out of the two lower tips of the star. However, the astral body does not remain as unbroken as the etheric body during this expansion. Individual shreds of it can become separated, which we then can see and follow in space. If we have a connection to an evil being that dwells there in space, then part of the astral body, because of its wish nature, becomes attached to and connects with this being. This part of our astrality is separated from our astral body. The astral body is broken into fragments, in many individual fragments. Thus we have in the most varied places parts of our astral body widely scattered in space, which appear to us as individual beings during meditation. But we do not know that they actually belong to us, so they lead us into error and deception. However, between these individual fragments of our astral body, there are threads. They are connected to each other and to the pentagram. This connection is produced by means of the human eye. Capital. Before the mystery of Golgotha, human beings had to have been extremely evil to have lost mastery over these scattered astral fragments. Other beings worked with them in their souls just for this purpose. Now, after the mystery of Golgotha, human beings are destined to take over this mastery themselves, working out of their own eye. Even quite advanced esotericists can err by not properly recognizing these connections. In order to prevent this, esotericists must dedicate themselves to a study full of devotion. By studying to acquire knowledge of all that is in spiritual space, of the entire evolution of Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth development, and of the beings and hierarchies that have worked in those stages of evolution to create the human being, by such a study the I can control the connections between all the individual parts of its astral body. In this way we can protect against error and deception. Esotericists should not study merely for themselves, out of curiosity or anything like that. Rather, they should make the most devoted study into their duty for the sake of human and earth evolution. And when through intensive study we have come to understand our own being, when we thereby know how and by what means we have come into existence, we acquire a holy feeling for it all. This feeling we then express in the sentence, quote, We are born out of God, ex Deo Nasimur. We should permeate ourselves with this feeling deeply, ardently, and we should make the etheric currents 
which have been already discussed in an exoteric lecture on the etherization of the blood, stream upward from the heart to the brain, surrounding the brain with light and activating the pineal gland. We should make these currents luminous like flames in which all personal concerns fall away. We must entirely lose ourselves in the feeling that we want to sacrifice ourselves completely for world evolution like the spirit beings did, like Christ sacrificed himself. Then we can learn to express this feeling in the sentence, quote, We die in Christ, in Christo morimur. Close quote. Then the certainty lights up in us that we ascend to the Spirit, that we resurrect in the Spirit. Per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. Ex Deo nascimur, in Christo morimur, per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. This is the exoteric verse of the Rosicrucians. When esotericists say this verse, they pause at that which expresses what we characterize as the word Christ. This is sacred to them. They do not even want to go that far with the word. They do not speak the word, but allow the feeling to speak. Then, when genuine Rosicrucians and their deepest meditations speak the verse, it sounds like this. Ex Deo nascimur, in Christo morimur, per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. End of that section, I believe this is still the same esoteric verse. There's an asterisk here and then it says, Then there was a longer discussion concerning the upcoming Congress in Genoa. We should strive to reflect and evaluate for ourselves what we hear in terms of esotericism, what the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings give, what Dr. Steiner himself represents. We may well not be able to discover occult truths ourselves, for example, about the two Jesus children, but we can and should reflect upon them. It would be wrong to present a specific person who is alive today as the incarnation of a specific being, whether or not it is based on truth. It is one of the most important occult laws that such pronouncements concerning living personalities are not to be made in public. It is something different to present such ideas in an esoteric lesson where one can sense and feel how such a statement is working and how it is taken up by individuals. Today is an age in which people easily fall into error. Such a pronouncement would cause the thinking of individuals to suffer inhibitions. Because of this, people would regress in their capacity to think. People must be seriously warned about such pronouncements, which are made for the purpose of propaganda and one must seriously decline any possible involvement in such propagandizing. Of course, however, one should do so with complete personal tolerance and with a feeling of peace toward the personalities who are committing this error. We must succeed with true knowledge, and then we learn, know, and feel that we come forth from the Spirit. Beginning, quote, In the Spirit lay the seed of my body, in my body lies the seed of the Spirit. Close quote. End of record A. Record B. Only the three lower hierarchies work directly upon the human being. The angels work into the human being up to the cross-hatched pentagram, which represents symbolically the human being, specifically the etheric body. See page 176. The archangels work only into the five points of the star that are not cross-hatched, and the spirits of personality only up to the pentagram, that is, in the rest of the parts within the circle, for example, with arms outstretched in the space between the top of the head and the fingertips left and right, and between these fingertips and spread legs, that is, the tips of the toes. Higher hierarchies exert their influence only up to the circle, this is the case with all human beings. Now, esotericists extend their etheric bodies out beyond the pentagram as far as the planets. They remain, however, connected as coherent wholes, 
and meet there good and evil beings. It is different with the astral body that expands with the etheric body. If the astral body finds there is a being or something that is attracted to the astral body's wish nature, then a portion of the person's astrality becomes attached to it and is separated from the main part of the astral body. In this way, the astral body can be separated into many pieces. The tendency arises for the intellectual part, the thinking part of the astral body, to expand out of the top point, the feeling part to expand right and left out of the middle two points, the willing part to expand below out of the two lower points. This partitioning of the astral body gives rise to the danger that we lose the feeling of coherence. The I cannot hold together. Rather, we feel the I in the various separated parts. The esotericist's greatest task is to hold together the threads connecting the various parts. This task is accomplished with healthy common sense, that is, through calm, logical thinking, with a thorough study of the general and specific teachings of theosophy, and through rationally thinking of and testing the teachings. Only in this way do we make the teachings entirely our own and strengthen the I. Not accepting anything on authority. Doing so would take away the I to the point that it would no longer have control over itself. Such an effect would result, for example, from imparting to unprepared people the knowledge of the earlier incarnations of certain individuals now alive, publicly known individuals. This deleterious effect would hold entirely independently of the truth of these assertions. This would happen because the listeners could not feel the truth or comprehend the connections, the probability or the meaning of these reincarnations. Such announcements would have to be accepted on authority. For this reason, people must be warned of the seriousness of participating in such announcements that are undertaken for the purpose of propaganda in the public arena. We must combine the serious rejection of any possible invitation to participate in such propaganda with personal tolerance and friendliness toward those who are making this mistake. End of Record B Record C When we take our esoteric development in hand, we will get a feeling that there are spiritual streams that want to gain influence over us, either in a good or an evil sense. Where does this come from? If we look back at the world's earliest evolution, We know that from this very beginning, spiritual beings have worked on us. Higher beings have worked upon us from the outside. But there are also those who have worked on the inner evolution of our earth. Now, what happens when one begins esoteric development and in meditation is immersed in the first verse? Quote, in pure rays of light shines the divinity of the world, close quote. What happens then to the etheric body? In the previous lesson, we heard that the human physical body has the tendency to shrink when a human being gets old, because the etheric body is gradually drawn out of the physical body. We heard, too, that the etheric body holds the opposite tendency. It wants to expand itself out to the macrocosm, up to the stars. Such a self-expansion occurs to a greater or lesser degree in meditation and even with a mere peripheral study of spiritual science. As long as it is connected with the physical body, the etheric body remains limited by the form of the physical body. Since we know that the entire macrocosm is filled with spiritual beings, with beings of the highest hierarchies, as well as with many other good and evil beings, we can imagine that the human being is completely embedded in them, but the space that the human being takes up is excluded from them. It is not always the same beings that work into human beings. They are different depending upon country, climate, or the characteristics of nature. We can picture what has just been said by means of this drawing, and there's a drawing here, 
In the pentagram, we see the streams of force that are at the foundation of the entire human being and that have created the human being. We must think of the outer surrounding area as filled with beings that penetrate to the human being. The middle pentagon determines the magnitude of the forces of the physical body, and especially into this area the hierarchy of those beings that we call the angels or angeloi work. The etheric body is expressed in the five points of the star, and into this area the archangels work, who exert their influence upon human beings. The area limited by the circle signifies the astral body, and into this area the archai, primal beginnings or spirits of personality work. Other hierarchies impinge from outside, the spirits of form, of movement, of wisdom, and of the will, all the way up to the cherubim and seraphim. We are constantly sending thoughts out of the astral body up to the brain. We know that through the cooperation of the three bodies, a spiritualized stream of our thoughts goes forth and streams into the space around us. This stream is then taken up or attracted by beings that are attracted or repelled according to the kind of thoughts we have. We must think of it this way. A part of our astral body is repelled, so to speak, and then in the space around us it is connected with this or that being that is in our spiritual environment and is sympathetic to it. This can happen in every direction of space toward the most varied beings. If then students do not allow themselves to be guided by their healthy common sense and become connected with such beings that are to be found in astral space, then they will come to a certain inner absent-mindedness This can also happen if students accept on blind faith what they have not researched themselves or if they do not take the time to grasp esoteric studies with their reasoning understanding. They will then easily lose themselves if they do not want to apply their healthy common sense when seeing in the spiritual world. They will constantly observe wrongly and come to wrong conclusions. Let us now look back to a specific point in world evolution, to Old Sun. In the middle of Old Sun, sublime spiritual beings left it because the finer substances of their being could no longer be united with the Sun's constituent particles, which had already become denser. These particles could even be called solid for the conditions of that time, but they were nevertheless still etheric substances. One such sublime being separated from those that left remained behind on Old Sun and permeated the substance of the Sun with a fine spiritual power. In the ancient mysteries this power was already spoken of. It was known as the power of Christ. It is the same power that was sacrificed again in later earthly evolution and remained behind on the earth when our sun withdrew from it to become a fixed star. For a while it remained with the earth, then it went over to the moon and mirrored from there the power of the sun onto the earth. This being of sun power was Yahweh Christ, the same being who revealed himself to Moses and announced to Moses that he would one day dwell with us in the flesh. Since the baptism in the Jordan and the event of Golgotha, this Christ power has united with human beings and with the earth. He enters even today into those human beings who want to take their higher development in hand. Esoteric students who expand their etheric bodies through meditation into the widths of space connect their etheric bodies in their emanation with this fine Christ substance. They no longer feel the I, capital, and the Pauline expression, quote, not I, Christ in me, close quote, becomes a reality. Human beings should develop this spiritual seed within themselves, so that after they have brought the spiritual seed to the highest perfection, 
they can once again return to the spirit from which they once came. Then one will know the kind of reverence with which Rosicrucian students spoke the holy prayer, beginning, quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body. In my body lies the seed of the spirit. Close quote. End of record C. Record D. There are spiritual beings present in the entire cosmos. They fill it, and hence they permeate and surround human beings as well. Nevertheless, we can distinguish between what belongs directly to human beings and what is a part of our spiritual environment. This spiritual environment varies according to where the human being is located. These spiritual surroundings are different in Europe than in Asia. In Asia, Europe is to the west, in Europe, Asia is to the east. That alone determines a difference. The beings of the third or the lowest hierarchy work into human beings more or less directly. The spirits of form, up to the cherubim and seraphim, work in the environment into human beings. This can be presented in a picture, and there's a diagram. If we represent human beings and the forces that work in them as a white surface, then we have a five-pointed star, the pentagram. Angels penetrate into human beings the most, into their physical bodies. That is represented by the innermost pentagon. Archangels cannot penetrate there. Rather, they remain with the five outer triangles that surround the pentagon. The archai work into those parts that are not directly within the pentagram. They work into those parts indicated by what lies between the pentagram and the circumscribing circle. In the lecture cycle titled Wonders of the World, Trials of the Soul, Revelations of the Spirit, we have already seen that the inner pentagram represents the physical body, the five triangles represent the etheric body, the space between these triangles and the circle belongs to the astral body, and the circle itself must be seen as the ego itself. If we imagine a circle drawn from the head to the extended arms, these are the parts that are brought about by the archai. Outside this circle, the higher hierarchies are at work, beginning with the spirits of form. We know that the physical body has the tendency to draw itself together, to shrink, while the etheric body has the tendency to expand itself. In meditation, and even with continuous, serious study of theosophy, such an expansion in space more or less takes place and can be extended out to the stars and the sun without the connection with the physical body being broken. With the astral body, it is the reverse. It can lose the connection and partially be split off from itself. This can be the case if students firmly cling to certain things in space that are sympathetic to them, or when they are attracted by astral beings, whether good or evil. If, for example, an evil being is to be found in our surroundings, then the etheric body, if it feels itself drawn toward this being because of character traits at work in the soul, will expand itself out that far and surround the being. However, with the astral body, such an expansion can cause a part to separate and then surround the being. In this way, the astral body can split up to encompass several beings in its surrounding. In this way, it leaves part of its essence behind, but between the scattered, separated parts, a connection remains. In this way, a splitting of consciousness also takes place, because consciousness is connected with the astral body. We then no longer feel ourselves to be a unified, self-contained personality, but rather as if split into several personalities. This experience is indicated by the passage in the Gospel when the demons who possessed a sick man were asking the question, quote, What is your name? Close quote, and they responded by saying, Legion. Therefore, those who are driven by a strong desire for esoteric development, unless they strengthen their eye at the same time, are in danger of having the astral body fragmented in this way. Then they are no longer capable 
of recognizing which being has taken over a part of the astral body, whether good or evil. Only serious study, above all, of what is given in title and outline of esoteric science, the lecture cycles, and so forth, can make the I, the self, so strong that it can unite the individual parts again, whether among each other or directly with one's own being. Those who have sufficiently devoted themselves through such study are not as easily deceived with respect to the nature of a spiritual being that is directly before them. The possibilities for error are otherwise very great and were never as great as right now. One of the worst things one can do is to point out publicly this or that human being as the reincarnation of a specific personality. But this is something that cannot be proven and it leads to the destruction of the intellect, which precisely now should be in a process of development. And that is the end of section 4, which is pages 132 to 181 in the book. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 266, Volume 2 of three volumes, entitled Esoteric Lessons. This one is from 1910 to 1912, translated by James Hines. This Part 5 goes from pages 182 of the book to 227. Esoteric Lesson, Karlsruhe, October 10, 1911. Record A, Notes from the Collection of Elizabeth Freda. Record B, Manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Barbara Wolf. Record C, Notes from Günther Wagner. Record A, Before we can begin with the esoteric lesson, I am obligated to say something. Because of a brochure handed to me by one of the members of our inner circle, who is motivated by a good impulse, I am moved to say something. As all of you know, every pupil of esotericism receives meditations according to his or her disposition and capacities. These exercises are designed in their structure and sequence of words, out of deeper underlying reasons, to bring about exactly what pupils need for their spiritual development. And it is of the greatest significance how the words are sequenced, indeed even which word is employed and where it stands, so that what is intended can be achieved. Many of you have received as a morning verse the following words. Quote, in pure rays of light shines the divinity of the world. In pure love to all beings rays the divinity of my soul. I rest in the divinity of the world. I will find myself in the divinity of the world. Close quote. Steiner again. Now, I have received here a brochure in which the following is to be found. I see in the pure rays of the light the divinity of the world. In the love to all beings raise the divinity of my soul. I live in the divinity and find myself again in the divinity of the world. Close quote. Steiner again. It is difficult to ascertain how the writer of this brochure came to this formulation for it belongs exclusively to our esoteric school. It could be that one of our pupils had the lack of caution to share it with an outsider. We could also imagine another case, a case that actually happened several years ago, the case in which someone was meditating over these lines in a hotel or pension, and in the next room there was someone who clairvoyantly caught these thoughts. In the first mentioned case, we should, actually we should always, feel the greatest compassion with respect to such things. 
As esotericists we know that such things bring their own punishment, even when nothing malicious is intended. This must happen because every word of the meditation has been placed in its position in the most careful way, and if it is taken out of its context, then the effect that results will be the opposite. By means of this arbitrary change in the sequence of words, indeed through the use of this positive little word I, capital, one has created the opposite effect. In the original verse, everything flows, sustained in an objective way, so that everything should work through the imaginative picture. Our meditations should always proceed from our inner moral impulses. The external world, and especially our personal I, should be entirely excluded. We should take hold of the divinity of the world with complete objectivity in our thoughts, just as it flows through and permeates the world with its divine light. In doing so, our I should not intrude itself, for then the effects would be transformed into the opposite. Entirely different spiritual effects would then have to appear, that is, luciferic effects. The moral impulse that with all humility suppresses the eye and that should be completely devoted to the divine spirit of the world in which one reposes does not emerge in the line, quote, I see in the pure rays of light, close quote. Also in the last lines, quote, I live in the divinity and find myself again in the divinity of the world, close quote, the egotistical principle protrudes markedly. For something entirely different is experienced in the words, quote, I rest, close quote. We see in this how extraordinarily precise and careful we must be, so that we apply the words of our meditations absolutely correctly, also in our thoughts. Now, we will go to some pictures that we can use for our esoteric training, because they have a very powerful effect. We know that the path to higher worlds passes through imagination to begin with, then comes the path of inspiration, then that of intuition. The pictures that are now to be given strengthen the organs that lead to imaginative vision. In our theosophical teachings, we have often heard that the world is maya, that we ourselves are maya, If modern science also now begins to explain the world in this way, then it should certainly not be an empty phrase for us. When we observe a rose, it shows us its upright blossom with the stem pointed downward. Nevertheless, what we think we are perceiving is not a true picture. Modern science teaches us that what we see comes about through a crossing of the rays of light, so that in our eyes, an upside-down picture of the rose arises, while we are perceiving the outer picture of the rose with the blossom above, that is, the reflection of the real light appearance in us. From this we see that what appears to us out there in the external world is maya, and indeed a reversed maya, in which that which is below appears above. Thus it is with everything around us, the whole world, the surface of which we believe we are perceiving, and ourselves with it, in the real view everything is on its head. If we want to perceive the true form of the world, then we must not seek the reflections, but rather the realities behind them, before they are reflected in the outer world. Everything, absolutely everything, is turned around from how we see it, What appears to be above is below. What appears to be behind us is in front of us. What appears to be left is right. In short, we must be able and willing to recognize this so that we can become free of maya. If, for example, we hear sounds and think that they are coming from the right, then in reality they are coming from the left. If we see objects standing in front of us, 
then in reality there are forces that are pressing on us from behind. It is the same with the stars in the sky. We see the sky before us when we look up. In reality, it is reflected back to our eyes by forces that are located behind us. If we want to arrive at the truth of the world, we must ascend from the spirits of form to the spirits of movement so that they can help us to see what is placed before us as a reflection by the spirits of form, as a reversal of reality. As an exercise in doing this, the following drawing can serve as a symbol. When we see a rose with a blossom above, we move it in our thoughts downward and thereby perform a movement that can symbolize for us the forces of the spirits of movement. There is, however, one thing in human beings that is no mere appearance of the senses, that is not maya. This is the word that sounds forth from human beings, the living word, the logos. The word does not come to us from outside of us. It is something living in us. It is our actual true being. It streams forth from our soul life. We are it ourselves with all our feelings that we allow to flow forth between our lips outward into the world. And if we think this through deeply, how the Word is the Logos, how everything that is spoken in the world is spoken out of this source, then we will feel deeply our responsibility for our words. More about this in the next lesson. Only what people have spoken in their words will carry over into the next planetary condition and survive the earth. What we hear coming from the left actually comes as stated from the right. But the sounds that we speak are the only thing that is not otherwise than it appears to be. It sounds forth from our inner life. And it actually comes from our inner life. Divine beings, the Logos, speak to us from these sounds. The end of Record A. Record B. Before we go to the esoteric lesson, it is necessary to stress something. Many of those present here have received a meditation for acquiring certain occult forces and for strengthening the soul. Such meditations can be given only in harmony with the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings. Not everyone has this verse, because such things are not necessarily equally appropriate for everyone. Such verses should, of course, be kept strictly secret. It is not allowed to pass them on, because doing so would bring, as a result, heavy karmic consequences. Now, a brochure has been brought to me by someone whose impulse to bring it to me was correct, in which the formulation, quote, in pure rays of light shines the divinity of the world, and so forth, close quote, can be read in a somewhat altered form. Now, we do not want to judge this in a strict way, but rather practice gentleness and mercy. Already giving someone the verse correctly written would create bad consequences. Now, the verse could have arisen in such a way that the individual involved incurs no guilt. Let us assume that an individual who has a certain clairvoyance lives in a room next to someone who is meditating this verse properly and simply reads the lines from their thoughts. This can certainly happen. The individual meditating would naturally incur no guilt. Now, in a verse like this, every word is essential and meaningfully placed by the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings. In the sentence that begins this verse, it is stressed that the soul should objectively permeate into this spiritual world content and not with that which is permeated by the lower forces of the I, capital. In the altered form, exactly the opposite is stressed. The soul that is filled with the I permeates into the spiritual world. We read there, quote, In pure rays of light, I recognize the divinity of the world. 
close quote. In the correct formulation, it continues so that the soul gives itself passively, while we read in this version, quote, I live in the divinity of the world, close quote, in which the word live points to something active. This difference is found also in the concluding sentence. In the correct formulation, we find, quote, I will find myself in the divinity of the world, close quote, while in this altered version, we read, quote, I find myself in the divinity of the world, close quote. Exactly the opposite is expressed in the altered form. It will still be early enough to speak of this and these consequences when the time comes to read the true verse in its correct formulation. We have already heard exoterically that there are three ways to penetrate into the spiritual world through imagination, inspiration, and intuition. In connection with our meditations, certain imaginations have been given to us that should help us to achieve our goal and to strengthen our souls. Now to these we can add pictures that give us certain powers. Let us return to a saying that we have often heard and have certainly recognized as truth, but which we nevertheless do not always call to mind often enough. That is the saying, quote, the whole world around us is maya, close quote. Strictly speaking, what does this mean? With our senses we perceive the external world. Let us consider a rose standing in front of us. It says to us, quote, I am here. You perceive me with your senses. You must picture me, close quote. But is this process really correct in this form? Do we really see the rose the way it really is? Even modern science can help us here. We know that the visual nerves cross behind the eye. There they call forth an inverted picture of the object, which then projected outward shows the object as we see it outside us. The real image of the rose arises in us upside down, the blossom below, the root above. If the external world is maya, then it is a mirror image of its true form. It is as if we imagined a mirrored reflection of a landscape in still water. We see everything around us in a mirror image. We must think of everything around us as inverted, human beings and their entire surroundings. Thus, the rose that stands before me I must think of as behind me, with the roots above and the blossom below. When we think we are hearing with the right ear, it is maya. The force is coming to us from the left, and we become aware of it in the right ear. What appears to lie in front of us is only maya, only a mirror reflection of what lies behind us, and is revealed through us, and thus conjures the things in front of us. Just as the true image of things arises from within outward, so it must be the case with true morals. For true morality must have its source in inner conviction, not in external prompting. We must think of everything as reversed. The starry sky that spreads before my view, I must think of as behind me. We must go further. Where darkness rules, there is mighty spiritual light. Where physical light does not appear to the eye, there is spiritual light. Connected with this is what was said earlier, that when we begin to see clairvoyantly, it easily happens that we first see the light of our own etheric bodies in our own shadows. Thus, when we observe the world, not in its mirror images of external maya, but rather attempt to see it in its true form, we are doing something very specific. We are setting everything in motion and we set ourselves in relation to the spiritual hierarchies that stand above the spirits of form, which are the spirits of movement. Everything that we see around us is, as we see it, maya. Everything that we see, hear, feel, and so forth. There is only one thing that is given to us by the wisdom of the world that is really real, the Word the Logos. 
air is also not real. We have one thing that does not penetrate to us from outside and appear to us as maya. Rather, it streams forth from within us, revealing our inner being, speech, the word. And so this gift from the God should be sacred to us and we should not misuse it. Nothing should sound forth from us other than the content of our souls in all uprightness. For we find the fact in the Akashic Chronicle that everything will dissolve and pass away and only what people have spoken remains as something eternal, giving form to the next planetary formation of the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the power of the Word is divine. We must gradually acquire the power to observe the world the way it is without losing the self in doing so. End of Record B Record C Esoteric exercises must be practiced exactly and with the words as they were given. These exercises have been taken out of the spiritual world and must be carried out exactly as they are prescribed. As soon as one brings an I capital into these exercises, which are intended to create a very specific mood, great cosmic karmic effects are thereby called forth for the one involved. This is connected to both. That is, the first four lines of the verse, quote, In pure rays of light, shines the divinity of the world. In pure love to all beings, raise the divinity of my soul. Close quote. This verse was published in a brochure, but not entirely correctly, with I in the sentences. Dr. Steiner referred to these verses. The same holds true for passing meditations on to others, especially so when they are reproduced in printer's ink and become the general property of the masses. There are three steps to knowledge of higher worlds. Number one, imaginative knowledge. Number two, inspired knowledge. Number three, intuitive knowledge. When we start at the first step, it is very valuable for the soul if we awaken in our souls imaginative pictures that must come forth from inner morality. Several such pictures would be the following. Imagine light. Spiritualize the image in your mind until you can imagine colorful, flowing light as the substance of the world. Feel warmth that can be intensively felt as love that shines through the world and can be felt as the love of God. Also, something that can be especially valuable. Think of the essence of things and in so doing, feel that everything that we can see with our senses is illusion is Maya. For example, that which is above, imagine below, and vice versa. For example, flowers, people, and the starry sky. Whatever happens on the left, feel on the right. See in front of us that which takes place behind us, as an intersection of forces, and as a mirroring of what is behind us. Also, think of light as darkness, reversed in the same way. For example, a clairvoyant can see the spirit, which a human being has as inner power of illumination, in his or her shadow. The spirits of form have ensouled and permeated with their being everything that lives and weaves, that has taken on a form, and everything that we perceive with our senses. However, because everything that exists in the world of the senses is a reflection of the spirit, we must turn to the spirits of movement and with them carry out a turning around to the actual beings and origin of things. In this way a deep inner reverence will also be wakened in us. The only real thing in our sense world is the Word. The Logos stands behind the Word, the archetypal sounds. The Word of the original language is the archetype of God's creative speech. Every word spoken sends forth the soul substance from which it originates. What lives in our souls is impressed upon the word 
just as we speak it. The word of the original language is the sole content that creates worlds. The languages of the world, these many various differences and divisions, are caused by Luciferic spirits. Quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body, in my body lies the seed of the spirit. End of Esoteric Lesson Esoteric Lesson given in Karlsruhe, October 14, 1911 Record A, Notes from the Collection of Elizabeth Freda Record B, Manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Barbara Wolfe Record C, Notes from Günther Wagner Record D, Anonymous Notes Record E, Manuscript from Louis Classon Record F, Notes from the Collection of Fred Pepic Record G, Manuscript from Alice Kinkle Record A Last time we discussed how everything that is in the outer world is Maya and that everything must be imagined in reverse and we stressed that esotericists should learn to live in such a consciousness that they observe everything around them in this way. If they look at a flower, then they imagine it inverted. If they hear a sound coming from the right, they think that the sound is coming from the left. They can go further and, in many other cases, think the same. There, where it is dark, they should say to themselves that it is actually bright. Where there is light, there is actually darkness. If we anchor these feelings of reversal of the maya that surrounds us, if all our thinking is oriented in this way, then we will observe a great transformation within us which leads us to truth. However, if we want to understand all of this with mere reflection, then we are led to great dangers. Esotericists know, of course, that all symbols and all esoteric teachings can harbor a certain danger if they are wrongly understood and applied. But then, too, as esotericists, we are not small children. Those who have attempted what was described here the last time will have gotten a feeling as if the ground had been pulled out from under them. And if one attempts to understand these things with reason, then it is as if two mirrors were set up facing each other so that an endlessly repeating reflection appears. The danger consists in this, that human reason begins to dance with this endless repetition as in a whirling vortex. Healthy common sense says then, here my reason must remain stationary. Only an unhealthy soul life allows itself to be pulled into the whirling dance. We can go even further with this inverting and involve the human being. Imagine a human face with a lighter or darker coloring, with lighter or darker hair. Now, we imagine the light face to be dark, the dark hair to be light, and so forth. Furthermore, we should think of the places where the face has hollows as pushing outward, and where it is puffed out as having hollows. At the same time, transform the skin color. Where it is colored rosy, think of it as dark green, There, where it is pale, is bright green. If we could feel this, we would be in a position to know this person according to his inner being. The dark green color, for example, would show us that we are dealing with a man who stands firmly in a life that works in the three lower kingdoms of nature. If the color appears bright green, then he would be more inclined toward the spiritual. And where we see blue, the highest spiritual traits would be displayed. However, if we were first to imagine the color and then carry it over in thought onto the face as it stands before us, then we would come to the worst false paths. We must also imagine that something that looks ugly is in reality beautiful. That is the reason why Christ on the cross, especially in the old paintings, was not presented as beautiful but often as ugly and distorted. Those who are always busy talking about their difficulties, about their physical pain, and who daily give an account of all the sufferings, 
both the large and the small, that they must endure, would be weak esotericists. Those who would advance must develop the strength within not to always want to cure their suffering through all kinds of medications and cures. Rather, they must understand that all of this belongs to an esoteric development in which the entire being of a person is subject to a transformation. For example, it would be an instance of a thoroughly ill soul life if a man were to walk through a meadow, see an autumn crocus, and then think that it wanted to swallow him. However, it can happen to esotericists, even if they are not sick, that one may feel that one is about to be grabbed from behind by a higher being and be, in quotes, absorbed. Among ordinary people there are those who are afraid of open windows when they are on an upper floor of a tall building, because the desire arises to throw themselves out the window. Or there is also the fear of open spaces, agoraphobia, when someone is afraid to cross an open space. This fear ceases if the person feels someone next to him. Official medicine provides causes for all these phenomena, but the true reason is that such people have a deficit of justified solitude. Solitude is something that everyone needs to a certain extent. It is not mere egotism. Those who always want to help others will one day feel that they cannot help any longer until they have obtained the strength from solitude. Those who always want to speak will one day sense that they are speaking only empty words unless they allow spiritual forces to come to them in solitude. We need solitude for prayer and meditation. Communal prayer can only bring us to a certain experience out of a group soul. Those who think that it is egotistical to go into solitude simply have the need to be with other people, not in order to help them, but only because they do not want to be alone. Even the selfless, quote, desire to help, close quote, can in reality arise out of egotism, if someone simply wants to socialize with others. Thus, for example, mesmerizing, which is ostensibly used to ameliorate the suffering of others, can come from the need to feel pleasure oneself through stroking someone else's body. Although love and egotism are opposite poles, it is nevertheless true that in certain borderline cases these two come very close, and it is difficult to distinguish one from another. We are surrounded by the three lower kingdoms of nature, although it would be evidence of an unhealthy soul life for someone to fear being devoured by the beings of the mineral kingdom or the plant kingdom, it can certainly happen to esotericists that through their meditations they feel they are being swallowed up by higher beings. Just as we have the three kingdoms of nature below us, so do we have above us the three spiritual hierarchies. And it is these beings, and also those that have more to do with the inner evolution of humanity, that influence us and cause the feeling described above. However, at the same time, we are given strength through our eye consciousness so that we are not entirely absorbed by higher beings, so that we do not become a willless tool. It is rather the case that a higher development leads precisely to our being able to make our feeling and sensing independent. Otherwise, we would lose our self-consciousness entirely. We should develop ourselves up to the higher hierarchies consciously. Those who have grasped the great truths concerning the world and the human being through the study of theosophy in such a way that they are permeated and ensouled by these truths, such people learn to feel themselves among spiritual beings in such a way that their independent existence cannot be endangered. Then, no matter what may happen to us, we learn to say from out of our inner life, this comes from God. We learn to say in suffering, God is sending us this suffering as a loving reminder of our past mistakes. And when happy, we will say, this is grace 
that God is sending us. And it leads us to gratitude, not to arrogance. Then we learn to see the work of divine powers in all that happens. Then we will gradually feel that we have found the proper relationship to the cosmos. The end of record A. Record B. We heard the last time how effective it is for our soul to allow the imagination to work on us that the outer world is Maya, that only the inverse picture brings us the truth. We can go even further with this imagination. If we look at a person's face, then we could imagine its inverse. Everywhere there is a raised surface, imagine a depression. Think dark hair to be light, light hair to be dark, and so forth. Also the color of the face we would think in reverse, but not just imagining a dark color instead of a light color. Rather, we could imagine the individual spots of color in their complementary colors. For example, a red spot is green. If we live into this process properly, then the colors will announce to us something of the traits of the person. A bright green, thought of as a complementary color, would signify that the person cannot get free of all that is connected with their bodily nature. A dark green signifies a striving toward the spirit, Blue signifies an especially strong striving for the spirit. These colors then become as if transparent for us. These are the colors of the etheric body. This all works only if we inwardly feel it. By observing in this way, we will gradually come to recognize the true qualities and traits of people much more than in any other way. Our intellect can at most reach the point of saying the external world is a maya. In its inverse image, I see it in its true form. Here, at this point, the intellect must remain stationary. Otherwise it lands in confusion and loses the ground beneath its feet. Our thoughts are mirror images of the outer world. Think of a mirror and of an object reflected in it. If we place another mirror across from the first mirror, we get reflections of reflections on into the blurry distance. This would happen to us if instead of simply contemplating occult facts, we wanted to brood over them and draw conclusions in order to find new facts. That would have to lead us to a certain kind of confusion. We must rather experience these things with our feeling. Just the way a human being stands between the etheric image and his or her physical maya image gives us a proper image of the human being. If a person in the physical body appears ugly, the middle image already reveals this, and vice versa. There was a certain stream in art that pointed to this. There are pictures of Christ that show the figure of Christ as not at all beautiful. It is good for the soul to have the possibility, the necessity to experience solitude. The soul needs solitude from time to time, and it is good for it to stand alone. Those who devote themselves to prayer and meditation feel the need for solitude for this purpose. The need to be with other people often arises from egotistical feelings. We think we would like to help There are certain borderline areas where egotism and love can hardly be separated from one another. We would like to do something for other people and fundamentally we are doing it only because it gives us satisfaction. A mesmerizer may think he or she is especially able to help someone with a stroke of the head and in reality it happens only because the stroke causes a certain pleasant feeling. Now, someone might wrongly object that it is still egotism when we enjoy solitude. That is not correctly thought through and would not be selflessly thought in the proper sense of the word. For I acquire strength from solitude. From this egotism, in quotes, I get the strength for deeds of love. The need for solitude is a blessing for the soul. It can be a feeling that brings happiness to the soul. 
but a feeling can also arise that says I stand here alone and can depend upon myself alone. All other people are distant from me and are alien to me, and none of them can understand me. Such a feeling can fill the soul with pain, but it must be able to lift itself above and out of that feeling. It would certainly be a very sick soul indeed, who would walk through a meadow, see an autumn crocus in blossom, and say, quote, I am afraid of this crocus, it could devour me. Close quote. As stated, a soul that could speak in that way would definitely be disposed toward illness. And yet similar feelings could arise in an esotericist, and we must certainly be prepared for something like this. An esotericist can reach the point of saying, quote, I feel myself devoted to spiritual worlds. They are taking possession of me. It is as if I am beginning to be absorbed by higher beings. Close quote. And in such a soul, resentment can arise with respect to the gods. Just as there are three kingdoms below us, the animal, plant, and mineral kingdoms, so too we have above us the three lowest kingdoms of the higher hierarchies, angels, archangels, and archai. And at a certain moment a soul can feel as if angels were taking possession of it, and it resists. What are we really doing when we devote ourselves to the facts of esoteric research that are brought to us in theosophy? What is it that we are taking into ourselves? It is nothing more than the thoughts of the Godhead that existed from the beginning and according to which all things have come about. The archetypes of all that has come into existence. Now, if we could do nothing other than take up the thoughts of the Godhead with our minds, we would have nothing more than mere afterthoughts. In quotes. With our minds, we would think the truths, but they would leave us cold. That would be like the feeling that we would have if we stood atop a high icy mountain which no warmth from the world could reach. Thus it would happen to our souls if we would take up the esoteric facts, which are the thoughts of God, in a way that is merely intellectual. In the past, in the Mauryan times, when people took up these things, they thereby devoted themselves entirely to the gods, and the warmth of the spiritual world permeated them. They left themselves intimately connected to the spiritual world. In the course of ages, the intellectual grasping of these truths became increasingly unemotional and feeling always colder and colder. At the time of the mystery of Golgotha, the soul was already dripping with ice. But in the instant the Christ left the Christ-bearer on the cross and gave himself to the world, then with his holy fire, he radiated glowing warmth into the coldness of the Spirit and transformed thereby the Spirit into the Holy Spirit. And now we confront the esoteric facts differently again. We take them up not only with our minds, we also enliven them with our feeling. We permeate and, in quotes, soak our most intimate feelings with esoteric facts. We allow what we have experienced to flow into all that we do. To the extent to which we do this, we have something of the Holy Spirit within us. Then, if we have a bodily sense of well-being, we say, quote, For this I thank the Divine Spirit in me. Close quote. And if a thought again arises within me, a thought that I have had in the past, then I say to myself, quote, Not I, rather it is the Divine Spirit within me, who causes this thought to light up again within my soul. I no longer feel that the spiritual world simply takes possession of me, but rather that I have united myself with the Divine Spirit. And then we will feel the warmth of the Divine Spirit that permeates us. Close quote. End of Record B. Record C. In the previous hour we discussed a mighty meditation that was placed before our souls, some of you may even have attempted to see what presents itself to you in the sense world as maya. We can carry this meditation even further by attempting to perceive and feel the face and hair color 
also the color of the eyes and any redness in the cheeks of any person who stands in front of us in their complementary color. And the surfaces that appear as raised or as depressions would be seen as inverted. For example, if a person has cheeks that appeared more red, then they would have to be felt as bright green. And it is a sign that this person still stands very much in external life. If with a lighter reddish coloring in the face we feel a dark green coloring and if a bluish color shimmers over it, then a clairvoyant would be able to determine the degree of spirituality on this more or less intensive coloring. This is the beginning of being able to see a person's aura. All these things can only be sensed and felt. The connecting link between the etheric and the physical bodies is constantly the opposite of the outer visible human being. If someone appears ugly, then the connecting link appears beautiful. In many art movements today, we can see that this spiritual aspect, unconscious to the artist, is expressed in words of art. For example, in the many paintings of the crucifixion with ugly features distorted by pain. If we understand maya and illusion with our intellect and want to think through these exercises involving inverting or reversing, then the mind, if it has developed healthy thinking, can accompany the exercise only to the fact of the reversal or inversion. Otherwise, it would only become a constantly repeated and frustrating reflection of one's own thoughts which could then degenerate into pathology. We must attempt to stand firmly with esoteric development. We must patiently bear all pain, suffering, states of fear, and so forth. It is not a good sign for esotericists when they complain and take all possible cures. We must be clear that a change in the body takes place and can call forth just such conditions. We can also be sought out by every possible nervous condition, such as we observe in neurasthenics, agoraphobia, wanting to jump down from heights. Then one must bear in mind that this is all maya, and above all that this kind of mental state signifies a strengthening of difficulties that appear later. We should be ruled by the thought that the more we have to suffer and overcome, the more we are favorites of the gods. Loneliness of the soul, not being understood by others, these come to meet us as the first difficulties of soul. Loneliness or solitude brings us the highest fruits of the soul. Praying and meditating in solitude brings us the strongest spiritual streams and strengthens our own individuality. Praying in a mass of people is only group blessedness. Solitude affects people differently, according to their degree of development. It brings despair to one person, joy to another person. The drive for social interaction is sometimes excused with the claim that one wants to help other people and likes to be able to do so. Love and egotism go hand in hand. Talking too much leads to banality. As an esotericist, one must even fight for justified solitude. Before us we have the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms. Behind us stand the lower hierarchies, angels, archangels, and spirits of personality. The feeling often fills us that an angel is entering into us and taking possession of us. All that we experience in terms of suffering and joy is a gift from the gods, that is, the Holy Spirit who works in us. If people had within them all the thoughts of theosophy that have now been given to the world, then they would have the thoughts of the gods. However, these thoughts would only release pure thinking within us and produce the frosty, icy coldness of wisdom. However, just as the first feelings of life stir in an egg, so too we should produce warmth within us. Love that streams through us and ensouls these thoughts of the gods is possible only through the Christ event. From the age of Lemuria 
until the Christ. There was even an ebbing, but now through Christ there should be a rising up again. Now it is possible to connect wisdom and love. We should meditate these feelings and thoughts of the gods as proceeding from the Father. We should then warm these feelings and offer them to Christ and then be born anew. The Spirit that is in us, through the Holy Spirit, meditated in the right Rosicrucian way, gives us certainty and independence that we should also have faced with the higher hierarchies. Addendum We should not merely believe in karma theoretically. It is very difficult to feel it really as a consequence of the past in the case of difficult life experiences. However, the esoteric exercises help us with this. For example, dispassionateness or poise. We should not only stand above joy or sorrow, but also in every fiber of our hearts we should be entirely devoted to the great justice of the world. Parenthesis, quote, Lord, your will be done. Close quote, close parenthesis. During the retrospective review of the day, it is very good if points occur to us that escaped our notice entirely during the day. Another good imagination is to picture a plant as it appears green, but actually knowing that is maya or illusion. One should imagine it with leaves having a violet-red coloring, the stem blue, and so forth. Also, one should imagine the placement as reversed. Then if one is feeling properly, one will feel oneself to be the plant, will grow into it and grow with it into the spiritual heights. The same thing is given in the book How to Know Higher Worlds. All imaginations will appear to us in the right way if we imagine the world within ourselves as maya. It is very good to carry out this exercise with animals. We must be thankful to the beings that hinder our progress, that work against our karma. For if we were to remain as impure as we are, as disposed to be in our karma, then we would be tossed into the abyss. The end of Record C. Record D. We can go even further with these efforts if we stand in front of human beings and attempt to view even their external appearance as illusion and maya. So, for example, we would attempt to sense and feel their face coloring, their hair, eyes, and cheek coloring in the complementary colors. So also we would imagine all the elevated portions of their faces, that is, nose, or the depressions as reversed. In this way we come to the negative form. What as hollow space is left out of the physical body and constitutes the spiritual part. Parenthesis, compare this with the chapter in Theosophy titled Spirit Land. Close parenthesis. This is also the beginning of living into the aura of the human being. All of these experiences can only be felt and sensed. If we approach this with the intellect, we can carry out this kind of exercise only up to the reversal, the, quote, turning inside out, close quote, or we experience only a constant reflection of our own thoughts thrown back at us without penetrating into the spiritual world. If someone has, for example, very red cheeks, then these will have to be experienced in their complementary color, bright green, a sign that that person still stands very strongly in a vegetative life. For clairvoyant perception, a lighter shade of red presents a bluish shimmer over a somewhat darker green tone. Thus clairvoyants can recognize the degree of spirituality of the person standing in front of them. The connecting link between the etheric and physical bodies is constantly the counter-image of the externally visible human being. Externally, if a human being appears to us as beautiful, then the connecting link is ugly, and vice versa. We can see this often in many art movements of the present time, even if it is expressed unconsciously. For example, this is seen in some crucifixion paintings with the unattractive, pain-distorted features. If we want to place ourselves in the right way with our consciousness in the sense world, 
without being delivered over to its purely external maya and getting stuck there. Then we must be clear about the following. Before us stand the kingdoms of the minerals, the plants and the animals. Behind us stand the kingdoms of the hierarchies that border on humanity, the angels, archangels and the spirits of personality. We can often have the feeling, especially when we are doing the above-mentioned exercises, that we are being absorbed by the hierarchies standing behind us. Also, the feeling will often appear as if an angel were entering us. In order, properly, to encounter this feeling of being absorbed, we must learn to regard everything that we experience as joy or sorrow as a gift from the gods, as brought to us by the Spirit of the Father as brought about within us by the Spirit of the Father. In this way we develop the inner serenity and poise that we need as inner strength and solidity in contrast to the higher hierarchies. One can say that if we were to take up into ourselves all those thoughts that are given today in theosophy, these would be the thoughts of the higher hierarchies, the gods, Nevertheless, thinking in us, these would produce an icy coldness. For this reason, we must connect these thoughts of the gods with warmth that awakens love in us. Even if this is possible only in a very weak way within us, nevertheless, it is the same as with the first feelings of life in a plant seed. Only since the Christ event has it become possible to connect wisdom with love. In this way we can feel and meditate the thoughts of the gods as proceeding from the Father, and we can warm this feeling in view of the sacrifice of Christ, through whom the spiritual substance was taken up within us. We can be born again in the world thoughts of the Holy Spirit, who is permeated by love. This lies in the threefold Rosicrucian verse, Ex Deo Nasimur, in Christo Morimur, Per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. This, practiced in the proper way, gives us the certainty and the independence that we need facing the higher hierarchies. Quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body. In my body lies the seed of the spirit. Close quote. End of record D. Record E. The last time a mighty imagination was placed before the soul. If this imagination works correctly, we will say that we should take up such esoteric facts with feeling, with a feeling sensation, not with the intellect, which leads reflections on into infinity and makes the soul, the spirit, confused. But we are to imagine not only that in front and behind, above and below are light and darkness, but also the human being who stands facing us. And imagine this in such a way that the parts of the face that spring forward recede and the coloring appears in its complementary color. For example, red appears as green. In this way we are to push forward toward the spiritual world, bright green still stuck on the bodily nature, where green becomes darker into blue, there a tendency toward the spiritual. Thus, we are to slowly penetrate forward to vision of the etheric body. That which lies between the etheric body and the imagined opposite image, beauty is ugliness, ugliness is beauty, just as many painters have presented the spiritual as distortion in portrayals of Jesus on the cross. With esotericists, the external sheath will not immediately find the change that goes on in the inner human being. Physical complaints, but don't pay attention to them. Fight against them in order to strengthen the soul. Agoraphobia and dizziness are caused when we do not get enough justified solitude. Solitude is necessary for an esotericist. Common meditations and prayers create a group soul quality. The soul should become strong in itself. On the path of esotericism, there will be feelings of aloneness and of others not being present. This can cause either pain or joy. 
If we have all theosophical knowledge within us, then the thoughts of the gods are at work within us. How the fourfold human being evolved, or the evolution of the planets, existed in the thoughts of the gods before the human being was created. During the time of Lemuria, these thoughts were living in human beings with the fire of the gods. But the thoughts became ever colder up to the event of Golgotha. Then Christ came, and now the thoughts of the gods should be ensouled again through divine fire. Just as there are three kingdoms of nature behind us, so also behind us we have the three hierarchies of angels, archangels, and archai. Just as a person with a sick inner life has fear of being devoured by a flower, there is a moment of fear in esoteric development when one feels that one is as if lifted up from behind, as if absorbed. Against this, we can say with every pain, with every joy, quote, the Holy Spirit is causing this in me, close quote. In this way you acquire solidity and self-preservation when ascending into the spiritual world. We proceed out of the kingdom of the ideas of the spirits, of the gods of the Father, through the fire of Christ, of the Son, into the kingdom of the Holy Spirit. End of record E. Record F. Overcoming inner states of fear. What is above all important in esoteric development is that we try to endure patiently all pain, suffering, and fearful states through inwardly standing firm. This is the first big condition. It is not a good sign for esotericists if they complain and apply every different kind of cure for their suffering. Rather, we should be clear that a change is taking place in ourselves which simply causes such conditions of fear and pain. Also, all kinds of nervous conditions can be observed, for example, agoraphobia. All of these things can happen to us. To oppose this, it is necessary to arrive at a clear consciousness that everything is maya, illusion, and that these conditions and similar phenomena in reality signify a strengthening for later difficulties in inner development that will have to be overcome. In all of this, the thought should guide us that we are favorites of the gods, the more we have to overcome and to suffer. This gives us the proper strengthening and solidity that we need on our path. One of the first soul difficulties that comes to meet us is above all loneliness or the solitude of the soul, a not being present for others. But it is precisely solitude that brings us the highest and strongest spiritual streams and solidifies our individuality. On the other hand, prayer in a Mass always brings a group soul quality. Solitude has different effects depending on the degree of development of the individual person. One person is brought to despair, another is brought to inner joy. The drive toward social contact to escape solitude is often excused by saying that one wants to help others. Nevertheless, excessive talking does not have a beneficial effect on us. It causes brutality. In this connection, love and egotism go hand in hand when we lose ourselves too much in sociability, quote, in order to help others, close quote. Nevertheless, one must learn to fight for justified solitude. This is often seen as egotism today. Still, an esotericist must be egotistical in certain cases. Otherwise, one would never achieve the level where one can be used as an instrument for humanity. Only a path through the trials just as characterized leads us to the heights where we can find the spirit and then later serve it as a selfless servant. The end of record F. Record G. All that we see is Maya. In truth, we must say to ourselves, everything is the opposite of that which we see. 
That which is in front of us is in truth behind us, and what is behind is in front. Right is left, left is right, above is below, below is above, high is deep, and deepening is raising, and so forth. It is necessary for an esotericist to say this about all that is experienced. The end of record G and the end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric lesson given in Berlin on October 27, 1911. Record A, manuscript from Camilla Vandry. Record B, anonymous manuscript from Freda Collection. Record C, notes from Günther Wagner. Record D, manuscript from Louise Classon. Record E, anonymous notes. Record A. Great seriousness should hold sway in the esoteric life. An esoteric lesson should be something sacred, something that is entrusted to us, and we should never receive it as something familiar. We were certainly not all conscious of the necessary earnestness when we asked to be accepted into the circle of the esoteric school. Now we should increasingly recall this earnestness and strive for the connection with the spiritual worlds that we can reach through an esoteric training and not fall back into everyday life. All the exercises that have been given to us are to be considered as proceeding from the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings. In the esoteric life one must be alert to egotism. We often convince ourselves that we are doing something selfless, or we feel hate or envy against someone, which does not even come to consciousness. We think that as an esotericist we must tell a person the truth or that we just cannot bear this or that from him or her. As soon as such feelings appear, we should remember that we are subject to great delusions and that their origin always lies in egotism. Feelings of this sort are always expressed in a feeling of warmth that permeates the etheric body, indeed the part of the etheric body that we call the warmth ether. This warmth reaches the physical body and works through the blood. We must be clear about the fact that these kinds of feelings always have a destructive effect on world evolution. The hierarchies whose task is to guide karmic connections then work in such a way that they employ beings of a luciferic sort who destroy these effects in us by working in a destructive way within the physical body. When we acquire proper self-knowledge, genuine insight into our own base nature, then a thoroughly ice-cold feeling passes through us, while that which lives in us in terms of impulses toward gratification is expressed in a feeling of warmth, just the opposite of self-knowledge. Samael is the chief instigator of the Luciferic beings that work in this cold, bringing self-knowledge to people. They are perceptible in the most varied forms, usually similar to human beings, perceptible to the clairvoyant. People are often much more untruthful and dishonorable than they themselves know. Many say, quote, I really no longer have untruthfulness in me. I have set that entirely aside, close quote. But this untruthfulness is often so subtle that it usually does not come to our consciousness at all. For example, imagine the following. We read an announcement in the newspaper about a theosophical lecture in another city and decide to go there. We are convinced that we are traveling only for this purpose. It does not rise up into our consciousness that precisely in this city a good friend of ours lives, whom we would be very happy to see again, or that a pleasurable event is taking place that we would gladly participate in. We believe that we want to travel there only on account of the lecture, whereas in reality there are other reasons for us to take this trip. We have, of course, been brought up not to tell any crass untruths. However, we have perhaps not yet overcome the tendency to appear better than we are or, in the light of strict self-examination, if it is a matter of life and death, to admit the truth and yet nevertheless to be silent about it, to veil it, and put a cloak over it. 
All of this has a deleterious effect on the evolution of the world. The effect of such lies goes first to the astral body, then to the etheric body, indeed to the part of the etheric body that we call the light ether. Then these effects go further into the physical body and work upon our nervous system. All these dishonesties bring us to the attention of Azazel. He and his beings, whose leader he is, are revealed to a clairvoyant as similar to a human being, usually as a head with the wings of a raven. With egotism, jealousy and hate, when we awaken we have a feeling of disgust, of loathing, that can be accounted for as the working of our double. Those who are still inclined to dishonesty feel a choking, scratching feeling in their throats when awakening. They feel as though they were being pinched by claws, tortured by a thousand arms. Azazel is doing this with his swarm. And when we feel his effects in the way indicated, we should be stimulated to reflect upon how deeply we are still entangled in lies and deception. Another stumbling block is indifference and obtuseness with respect to the spiritual world. Many students listen to an esoteric lesson, but what has been given them finds no echo. They are unable to free themselves from everyday life. They are unable to raise themselves to the spirit or surrender themselves to spiritual thoughts. Others are merely curious to see or hear something from the spiritual world. They simply throw themselves into meditation without dedicating themselves to a regular study of the subject because that would not be easy for them. This works directly upon the eye, capital, and from there upon the astral body and then upon the etheric body and to be sure upon that part we call the chemical ether. From there it works into the physical body and all its glands and fluid secretions. This is the effect of Azazel. With people who are not esotericists, Azazel and his swarm constantly foster only beneficial effects because they work into such people not in a way deleterious for one's health but rather in a supplementary way, so to speak. With esotericists the effects go deeper and they are required to be constantly be aware of their complete responsibility for themselves and for the world. When awakening a lackluster esotericist will have a feeling of drowning as in a flood it will be all the stronger the more the esotericist surrenders to the life of the senses. Esotericists should constantly watch themselves. It is all right for them to sometimes brood on themselves. Only in this way will they realize what is brought to us at the conclusion of every esoteric lesson by the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings. Quote, in the spirit lay the seat of my body. In my body lies the seat of the spirit. End of record A. Record B. Only with great earnestness should an esoteric life be taken up. All too often it is curiosity that drives people to esotericism. They would indeed like to develop themselves, but are unwilling to study beforehand the esoteric material that has been given to them. For example, we often speak of, quote, conscious falling asleep and waking, close quote. What happens when we consciously awaken? Then we are submerged into what we really are, what our karma has made out of our various sheaths. In order for us to be able to submerge consciously, we must pra constantly practice self-knowledge. We can deceive ourselves all too easily concerning our motives for this or that deed. As soon as our reasoning leads us to conclude that we have selfless motives for a deed, we should be on the watch and consider well that it is most probable that in reality the reverse is true. We could be filled with envy for another person, or we might think that we must do something to oppose another person, and the motives for doing so are entirely different than we imagine. 
Indeed, in by far the most cases, the motives lie somewhere other than where we supposed. If we feel anger or envy, this feeling can grant us a certain satisfaction, but thereby we injure not only ourselves, but also the entire world. Such a feeling immediately influences the etheric body, indeed the part of the etheric body that belongs to the warmth ether. Also the satisfaction that follows a truly, not imagined, selfless deed affects the warmth ether of the etheric body, but then works back upon the entire world in a beneficial fashion. When a human being surrenders to selfishness in general, those beings of the higher hierarchies who are responsible for seeing to it that nothing improper enters into world evolution send certain other beings that belong to the Luciferic swarms into the etheric body, so that the consequences of selfishness are destroyed. Thus these beings must constantly be at work in the evolution of humanity to work against these deleterious effects of egotism upon the warmth ether, and from there upon the physical body and upon the blood. Their leader is known by the Kabbalistic name of Samael, If as esotericists we want to escape these effects, we must hold clearly before our eyes this exercise. If we are ever confronted by someone who makes us very angry, then we should take the feeling of warmth that otherwise fills us with the satisfaction of anger, set it aside, and cause it to pass over into a feeling of freezing cold. Another tendency that adheres to human beings is the inclination toward falsehood. Even if this tendency is held in check by education, nevertheless we are dealing with the fact that people have the possibility of being untruthful in certain circumstances, even if one does not often speak a lie. A lie has an immediate effect upon the astral body and from there upon the etheric body specifically upon the light ether, and then finally upon the physical body and the nervous system. These consequences, too, are destroyed by divine spiritual beings who are under the leadership of Azazel. These have the following effect upon human beings, in particular upon esotericists. Upon awakening we have the feeling as if a horrible monster had crawled into our throats and wanted to strangle us. This experience does not need to come to all esotericists, but some must go through it. Not all are spared it. The external form of these beings, as a clairvoyant sees them, is not what is especially important. They can show themselves in the most varied forms, but they have especially developed the human form, although Samael, for example, is a being that belongs to the salamanders. Especially Azazel has developed the human form well, with wings instead of arms. However, for an esotericist it is important to know that Azazel shows himself as a being who wants to penetrate into his throat and strangle him. Human beings can also be so constituted that they are actually insensitive with respect to the spiritual world of the mind. This can even occur with esoteric who would like quickly to penetrate into the spiritual world but do not study what has been prescribed for them to understand. This also has deleterious consequences that would appear in the world unless they are destroyed by spiritual beings under the leadership of higher hierarchies. For example, in Austria all teachers, young and old, once had to be tested anew because of new requirements that were established by law for the acquisition of a teacher's license. An instructional inspector, who did not want to make things too difficult for the old teachers, decided to test them only on the contents of the books they had been using for instruction all those years. And behold, it became evident that the majority of these teachers did not even know what was contained in the textbooks they themselves used. That is how insensitive they had become with respect to the spiritual mental world. Those spirits that are under the leadership of Azazel are actually a blessing for esotericists who have this tendency, 
because Azazel does not need to destroy anything for them. Rather, he must bring something to them. Azazel is unbelievably busy with his swarm in the world. They work upon the chemical ether in the etheric body and thus upon the fluids in the blood that are transformed by mental apathy. Azazel has the effect upon esotericists such that they feel they are drowning upon awakening. One does not feel properly adjusted to the physical world and one would preferably immediately fall back asleep. One often imagines luciferic beings as exclusively evil but they do bring about much good in the world. The end of record B. Record C. We must take the esoteric life seriously. An esoteric lesson must be something holy to us. We should never experience it as the usual. None of us were conscious of the necessary seriousness when we asked to join the esoteric school. Now we should place this before our souls again and again and strive for a connection to the spiritual world in order not to fall back again into everyday life. The exercises that are given to us are to be seen as proceeding from the masters. Esotericists should pay attention to themselves and their feelings, especially to everything having to do with self-knowledge. Most people, and we certainly also belong to this group, deceive themselves greatly with respect to matters that concern them. Number one, one must especially attend to egotism. We often tell ourselves that we are doing something selflessly, or perhaps we feel hate or envy towards someone, of which we have not yet become conscious. And we believe that as esotericists we must tell that person the truth, or perhaps there is something that we cannot stand about the person. As soon as such feelings appear, we should remember that we are subject to great delusions whose causes always lie in egotism. Feelings such as this always express themselves with a feeling of warmth that permeates the etheric body. Indeed, the part of the etheric body we call the warmth ether. And it works all the way down into the physical body through the blood. Feelings such as this always have a destructive effect upon the evolution of the world. The hierarchies, whose job it is to guide karmic connections, then work in such a way that they engage luciferic beings to destroy these effects in us, and then work destructively on the etheric body and indirectly work destructively upon the physical body. Correct self-knowledge insight into our own baseness induces a cold-as-ice feeling to flow through us. Everything in us that lives as emotion, driving us to gratification, is expressed in the feeling of warmth indicated above, which is just the opposite of the effects of self-knowledge. These beings whose leader is called Samael, with his large swarm, are revealed to a clairvoyant in various forms, usually appearing similar to human beings. They are almost always perceptible frequently for clairvoyance. When awakening, a feeling of disgust and loathing can always be traced back to egotism. Those who incline to dishonesty experience a choking, scratching feeling in the throat as if they were being tortured by a thousand arms. All those who observe themselves will then notice how entangled they are in lies and dissimulation. Number two, untruthfulness. Through our education, we are raised not to speak any gross untruths, but we have the inclination to appear perhaps better than we are. When push comes to shove, instead of admitting the truth, we say nothing or obscure it. All this has a deleterious effect upon the world's unfolding. Such untruths have an effect upon our astral body, then upon the etheric body, indeed upon the part we call the light ether, then further upon the physical body and our nervous system. The beings whose leader is Azazel are also revealed to a clairvoyant as appearing similar to human beings, usually as a head with the wings of a raven. Number three. Third, 
is indifference and insensitivity toward the spiritual worlds. Many of us listen to an esoteric lesson, but then there is no response to what has been given. They are unable to raise themselves in spirit in ordinary daily life and to think spiritual thoughts. Others are merely curious to see and hear something from the spiritual world and throw themselves into meditation without devoting themselves to systematic study because that is too inconvenient for them. With esotericists, this works upon the eye, from there upon the astral body, then further upon the etheric body, indeed upon that part we call the chemical ether, and from there upon the physical body in all its fluids and glands. Azazel, with his swarm, wants only to further good effects in non-esotericists, since those effects are not destructive to a non-esotericist, but work in a supplementary way, so to speak. Esotericists are required to be fully conscious at all times of their responsibility for themselves and for the world. When awakening, insensitive Esotericists will have a feeling of drowning, flood. The stronger, the more they surrender themselves to ordinary, everyday sense impressions. Esotericists should constantly watch themselves. There is no harm in esotericists occasionally brooding over themselves. Only in this way will esotericists realize what is brought to us at the end of every esoteric lesson from the Masters of Wisdom. Quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body. Close quote, the end of record C. Record D. We cannot take the esoteric life seriously enough. Exercises are given to us for our advancement, but the enemies that are opposed to this advancement are our old everyday habits of life. The gratification of egotistical wishes works destructively for the entire further evolution of humanity while the satisfaction of selfless deeds helps to foster this evolution. So too all impulsive emotions, passions, the propensity for untruthfulness, for lies and spiritual insensitivity, these all work destructively, hindering evolution. The gratifications of egotism, of emotional impulses and passions, sit directly in the etheric body, in the warmth ether, and work from there into the blood, warming it. Only proper self-knowledge that leads to disgust at oneself can work to cool it down. Self-knowledge is always a battle. In order to eliminate this damage, swarms are sent out by the good spiritual powers to destroy these effects. Swarms under Samael, who belongs to the fire salamanders but appears to a clairvoyant in human form, with wings instead of arms. Habits of untruthfulness sit in the light ether, also a part of the etheric body, and they work by means of the astral body into the nervous system. Azazel is placed against these effects. We must fight with him when we have a feeling of being strangled upon awakening, as if one had to swallow an ugly animal. This is a certain sign that this propensity for lying is present in one. The third enemy is spiritual indifference. No interest in spiritual facts. This one sits in the chemical ether, works from the eye out into the astral body, even into fluids. Azazel is present to eliminate these destructive effects. The presence of this spiritual insensitivity brings about a feeling of drowning, a feeling of not being able to find oneself upon awakening. An esotericist should fight with these three powers. The worst for an esotericist is being satisfied with oneself. Then there is no further advancement on the esoteric path. The end of Record D. Record E. We have already seen how esotericists, through proper meditations and concentration exercises, must manage to develop themselves consciously through the world of illusions to spiritual reality. On this path, those beings that are allowed 
by the wise powers as luciferic swarms are helpful, so that esotericists can achieve their goal through trials. From this point of view, these are good luciferic beings, whose leader is Samael. Now there are still more such beings, and here we have to begin with to observe Azazel with this swarm. Human beings usually possess more dishonesty and untruthfulness than they themselves know. I see that there are many who say, quote, I really don't have any more dishonesty in me. I have set that aside. But this dishonesty is so subtle that we are usually not even conscious of it, since we often ascribe entirely false motives to our actions, although in reality we are actually motivated by entirely different grounds. All of this dishonesty brings us to Azazel's attention with his swarm. When we feel as if we were being pinched by pliers and tortured by a thousand arms, then we should reflect upon how deeply we are still entangled in dishonesty and lies. A third being that approaches an esotericist is Azazel. This one, too, can call forth a feeling of being pinched, and also a strangling, scratching feeling in the throat. And again, we need to be clear about the bad character traits that we still must set aside. For example, all our insensitive indifference toward world events. An esotericist should not feel indifference toward what happens in the world. Most people are so indifferent because they are entangled in egotism, so that they are entirely indifferent toward everything that happens around them. This is where the apathy of the masses with respect to spiritual beings comes from. That is the end of Record E and the end of that esoteric lesson. Esoteric Lesson Given Berlin on October 30th, 1911 Record A notes from Rudolf Meyer Record B, anonymous manuscript from Freda Collection Record C, manuscript from Camilla Vandry. Record D, manuscript from Louis Classon. Record A. When we immerse ourselves in our own inner nature, we find many beings there. This may at first seem strange, but the farther we come, the more we learn to see into the spiritual world, the more we will see that a number of spiritual beings are at work in us, often to compensate for the destruction we human beings in our foolishness perpetrate. Let us ask ourselves, where does illness come from? We know that every illness has a spiritual cause in addition to the physical cause. This spiritual cause can be found in immorality, passions, or other misdeeds in this life though usually in in the previous incarnation. The victory over every illness sets forces free. However, this does not mean that we should draw out an illness for as long as possible in order to advance as quickly as possible. Rather, everyone should do as much as possible to become healthy as soon as possible. However, if we have been ill for three weeks or for three months, We should regard this as karma and bear it with patience and equanimity. But there is a second reason why an illness is something beneficial. Ever since Lemurian times, through Atlantis up till the mystery of Golgotha, humanity has sunk deeper and deeper into matter. And because we follow our instincts and passions, we have had to sink deeper and deeper, constantly brought further away from the aims that God has set for us. It is illness that diverts this impulse downward, so to speak, and gives us again an upward direction. Contemporary academic scholarship condemns theosophical teachings as daydreams. But one need only to take a book in hand, such as John's Gospel or any theosophical book, and one will see how enlivening, how refreshing its effects are, while a materialistic or monistic book dries up and withers the soul. And because this purely materialistic thinking 
only consumes forces. The consequences will appear in the next existence. Such people will be afflicted by a kind of feeble-mindedness. Their brains will be an entirely spongy, watery mass. They will want to think, but won't be able to think. This feeble-mindedness is a blessing that protects these people from sinking down into, into matter irredeemably. This is so because the existence of feeble-mindedness protects the brain from materialistic thinking. Then the eternal self can work on the essential core of a person's being, two times consecutively in Devakan, and influence it so that it again strives upward. And there's a diagram uh, to see there. All of you have already experienced, or still will experience, that in meditation one feels detached or uncoupled. The etheric body is expanded, and one feels oneself carried out into distant borders of the world. And then, suddenly, one feels oneself again firmly bound to this world. One cannot detach from it. One sits as if in a vice. This is actually quite good. It is our karma from earlier incarnations that holds us so firmly. If, as a consequence of our meditations, we would immediately ascend into the spiritual world without having carried out our karma, the consequence would be a steep fall. The leader of the swarms that tie us firmly to the earth is Mehazael, we come to know him when we ascend within ourselves. So too with Samael, Azazel, and Azael. We will then realize that our inner being really is a field of action for demons, quote, and their number is legion, close quote, as we read in the Bible. On our esoteric path, we should learn these names so that we come to understand and gradually outgrow them. Through his work, Azael compensates for what arises in us through insensitivity to the spiritual world. When we acquire complete dispassionateness and serenity, then we take over the work of Azael. But this is what dispassionate means, not jubilating in joy, not complaining in pain but rather recognizing the reality of karma working in everything. We should not believe in the idea of karma only theoretically. Rather, we should feel that karma is at work in everything that we meet. In the stages of Christian initiation, this is called the scourging. That is, self-composed, we calmly confront all the pain and suffering of life, which hits us like the lashes of a whip knowing that they are karmically determined. This is genuine serenity, composure. We know that the physical world is only a mirror image of the astral world in such a way that everything appears inverted or turned around. An infinitely important meditation, useful for making the saying, quote, the world is only maya, close quote, effective, is the following. Everything that we have around us is actually inverted. What we see from above to below is actually from below to above. Plants have their roots above and blossoms below. The starry world above us and in front of us is actually the result of spiritual beings that in reality are at work behind us. The sound that the left ear receives actually comes from the right. We must live into these facts, also with the complementary colors. We should imagine that the red spots on someone's face are actually green, or what protrudes we should imagine as inverted inward. With a plant we should imagine green as reddish lilac, the brown root as dark blue. We should permeate these exercises with reverence and devotion. Altogether this is the feeling in which we may hope to approach the divinity of the world. God remains only an abstraction through mere thinking. 
we must permeate our thinking with devotion, reverence and humility. Then we can hope to penetrate into the spiritual world. The end of record A. Record B. It can, of course, happen to anyone that they become ill sometime. Although we should look for the appropriate medicine, an esotericist should ask where the cause of the illness lies. It will be found that there is always a spiritual soul reason for the illness, either a moral or some other kind of wrong from this incarnation, but usually from a previous earth life. But why do human beings become ill anyway? Because in every human being there are instincts that draw one down and that can be transformed through illness into ascending instincts. If we represent by means of this curve, there's a picture, the evolution of the human being, then X represents an impulse downward, brought about by a wrong action at a certain moment. A human being would follow this impulse and be completely lost to those worlds that are the goal of human existence if the creator of humanity had not at a certain moment allowed illness to appear, which can transform this impulse into an upward striving impulse. There are many such impulses leading the human being upward, but this is not otherwise possible if we consider that our entire evolution from Lemurian time until the event of Golgotha was nothing other than descending, and that only since that time has the possibility come to lead human beings upward again. And the time that has passed since Golgotha is, of course, very short compared to the long period of time that lies before it. Also, there are downward leading impulses in humanity that are still to be revealed in the future. A striking example of this is the entire field of materialistic academic scholarship. This makes human beings insensitive to spiritual worlds, and the materialists that are now seen as authorities will be born in the next incarnation with brains that will be like mush, so that they cannot serve as instruments for thinking. But this will happen only so that the downward direction can be turned around into an upward direction. Such human beings will then experience two successive periods in the spiritual world, Devakan, without undergoing an earthly life between them that could transform the ascending impulses acquired during the first Devakan into descending impulses. It is clear to esotericists that our feelings, thoughts, and all that we find when we descend into our own inner being is not we ourselves, but other beings that are present within our being. Parenthesis concerning those, the Gospel says, quote, Our name is Legion, close quote, close parenthesis. In the moment when we descend into our inner realm, we find these beings on all sides, striving outward. Beings such as those we heard about the last time, Samael, Azazel, Azael. But it can also happen that esotericists say to themselves, quote, As I am able to strive, I am too weak even in order to properly carry out my meditations. Other thoughts always intervene. Close quote. This originates in those downward leading impulses that constitute our karma. Even if they do not lead to illness, they are what create a wall around us like a mountain burdening us that prevents us from soon entering the spiritual world. People could, for example, according to the energy invested in their meditations, enter into the spiritual world in a few days, but their karma prevents it for many years, indeed for good reason. Otherwise, they would bring along all their faults and weaknesses. However, those who constantly meditate with diligence and devotion, ideally on one and the same object, constant change in meditations is a sign of weakness, will assuredly, eventually, have a certain experience. Those who have not yet had it 
will definitely one day later have it. That is, a certain feeling of blessedness, of detachment from the body, as if carried through space on wings. And when one returns, it feels like one is in a prison, like being chained to a single spot when one is again enclosed within the limits of the body. This feeling also originates in a swarm of spirits whose leader's name in the same nomenclature used previously is Mehazael. These four classes of beings are what we find within us. Their outer appearance, the way they appear to clairvoyant vision, is not very important. It is more important how we feel them. These are the beings that saints and ascetics are referring to when they speak of their temptations and visions. And when they describe the feeling of being attacked with glowing pincers, then they are referring to Mahazael. In esotericism, we are working in a certain sense against these beings. Those who, for example, are really permeated by the idea of karma and do not think merely it theoretically, arrive at a certain equanimity with respect to joy and suffering and all that can occur to them. In this way, we work against Azael, who is to remove the consequences of human insensitivity toward the spiritual world. Those who have attained such equanimity are very observant of their surroundings. Apathy, such as that demonstrated by the teacher already described, cannot occur with such an imperturbable person. This apathy is extraordinarily widespread in the present time. For example, students who diligently take notes at a lecture usually do so only because they can do so mechanically and are not required to think at the same time. For this reason, immediately afterward, they have no idea what they have written down. Those who have passed through Christian initiation and have gotten as far as the appearance of the scourging are also working against Azael. The world is Maya. These words should acquire content and significance for us. Even those in science have discovered this, here and there. In the coming years they will discover still more esoteric principles, but they don't realize it. Johannes Müller, who lived at the beginning of the 19th century, has already discovered that the world actually shows itself to us in its reflection. If we see the sun in front of us, then we know there is a spiritual sun behind us that calls forth the illusory picture of the physical sun before us. If we see the stars above us, then below us are the beings that project through us the image of the starry heavens. The red color of a face is in reality bright green. Where there is light, there is darkness, and so forth. If we see a flower, then we should think of it inverted. The dark roots above are colored blue, question mark in the German. The green leaves reddish-violet. The retina is not in the eye, as the materialist thinks. The outstanding physiologist, Johannes Müller, who is highly respected by materialists and yet far surpasses them, taught that the retina is outside. The entire world around us is the retina, and the one in the human eye is only a reflection of the same. The entire human being is out there, spread out in space. These are effective imaginations if we carry them out properly and do not attempt to capture them with the intellect. The end of record B. Record C. When human beings descend into their inner being, they find not only themselves, but also entire swarms of beings that are enclosed within them, beings whom human beings should overcome and liberate. If we have a serious illness or otherwise a difficult destiny through life, we should be clear that this is a karmic consequence, usually from previous incarnations. These arise from immorality or other human weaknesses, which then in this incarnation serve to give us new impulses for advancement by overcoming them. Human beings have the tendency to fall into the abyss, 
because of the various mistakes they have made in previous incarnations. Through illness, they get a new impulse that protects them from sliding down into the abyss, that gives them an impetus to lift themselves up toward the spiritual powers. Nevertheless, we must do all that is possible for a reasonable person to do in order to get rid of the illness. People who are materialists in this life will in their next life be feeble-minded. They will have a brain that is too soft because in this life they have given too little nourishment to their souls. Were the feeble-mindedness not to occur, these people would be irredeemably lost because a healthy brain would simply lead them further in the earlier direction. Esotericists often experience moments of great blessedness because their etheric bodies are completely spread out in the spiritual world. Afterward, when they return, they feel enslaved, shackled. They feel themselves as if chained to the physical body. Countless swarms of beings bring this about, swarms that are named after their leader, Mahazael. Esotericists will always know when they are experiencing this depressing feeling of being enchained that Mahazael's swarms are working against them and want to pull them down. Often they will feel as if they were being pinched and tortured by glowing hot pinchers. In Christian initiation, this is called the scourging. We must not think of the human being as if the human being were a bundle of instincts, passions, and strong emotions. Rather, it is the case that we have within us entire swarms of beings. This is mentioned in the Gospel. For human beings who encounter these four swarms, the swarms of Samael, Azazel, Azael, and Mehazael, it doesn't matter whether they see them clairvoyantly or not. The only thing that is important is how the human beings feel when encountering them. We can learn from this that our entire personality is maya, illusion, and that we can find our sustaining support only in what belongs to the spiritual world, in our individuality, in our higher self. The end of Record C. Record D. The last time we heard that when we descend into ourselves, we encounter beings that are not character traits in us, but are real bundles of beings that are enclosed by our sheaths. Those were Samael, Azazel, Azael, and additionally, now Mahazael. We encounter these after blessed moments in meditation, after we have been carried out into other worlds and we return to our own being, within which an enormous sum of mistakes, lies, and immorality have piled up through many incarnations. For these, karmic compensation must be provided. With these karmic consequences, we bring an impulse downward. Through illness and the blows of destiny, this impulse is blunted and turned upward. Mahazael works on this karmic balancing. When we return from meditation, we feel him as if we were being squeezed in a vice. On the Christian path, this corresponds to the scourging. Whether we advance along the esoteric path more quickly or slowly depends upon our karma. We feel resistance within us that prevents us from meditating in the correct way. Here it is good for us to be lenient with ourselves. We must be so egotistical and unbelievably arrogant to think that we are such highly developed beings that we can enter into the spiritual world in three weeks or three months. We should not merely have abstract thoughts about the external world, but rather develop living forces. The world is maya, a mirrored image of spiritual actions that work through us from behind. And that is the end of... This uh, section, section 5 of the book, goes up to page 227.